Chapter One of Memories of My Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memories of My Life by Sarah Bernard. Chapter One My Aunts. My mother was fond of traveling. She would go from Spain to England, from London to Paris, from Paris to Berlin, and from there to Christiania. Then she would come back, embrace me, and set out again for Holland, her native country. She used to send my nurse clothing for herself and cakes for me. To one of my aunts she would write, Look after little Sarah, I shall return in a month's time. A month later she would write to another of her sisters, Go and see the child at her nurse's. I shall be back in a couple of weeks. My mother's age was nineteen. I was three years old. And my two aunts were seventeen and twenty years of age. Another aunt was fifteen, and the eldest was twenty-eight. But the latter lived at Martinique, and was the mother of six children. My grandmother was blind, my grandfather dead, and my father had been in China for the last two years, I have no idea why he had gone there. My youthful aunts were always promising to come to see me, but rarely kept their word. My nurse hailed from Brittany and lived near Camperle in a little white house with a low thatched roof, on which wild, gilly flowers grew. That was the first flower which charmed my eyes as a child, and I have loved it ever since. Its leaves are heavy and sad-looking, and its petals are made of the setting sun. Britain is a long way off, even in our present epoch of velocity of travel. In those days it was the end of the world. Fortunately, my nurse was, it appears, a good, kind woman, and as her own child had died, she had only me to love. But she loved me after the manner of poor people, when she had time. One day, as her husband was ill, she went into the field to help gather in potatoes. The overdamped soil was rotting them, and there was no time to be lost. She left me in charge of her husband, who was lying on his bread on bed, suffering from a bad attack of lumbago. The good woman had placed me in my high chair, and had been careful to put in the wooden peg which supported the narrow tray for my toys. She threw a fagot in the grate and said to me in Breton language, until the age of four I only understood Breton, Be a good girl, Miss Blossom. That was my only name at the time. When she had gone, I tried to withdraw the wooden peg, which she had taken so much trouble to put in place. Finally, I succeeded in pushing aside the little rampart. I wanted to reach the ground, but poor little me, I fell into the fire which was burning joyfully. The screams of my foster father, who could not move, brought in some neighbors. I was thrown, all smoking, into a large pail of fresh milk. My aunts were informed of what had happened. They communicated the news to my mother, and for the next four days that quiet part of the country was ploughed by stagecoaches that arrived in rapid succession. My aunts came from all parts of the world, and my mother, in the greatest alarm, Hastened from Brussels with Baron Larré, one of her friends, who was a young doctor just beginning to acquire celebrity, and the house surgeon whom Baron Larré had brought with him. I have been told since that nothing was more painful to witness and yet so charming as my mother's despair. The doctor approved of the mask of butter, which was changed every two hours. Dear Baron Larré, I often saw him afterwards, and now and again we shall meet him in the pages of my memoirs. He used to tell me in such charming fashion how those kind folk loved milk blossom, and he could never refrain from laughing at the thought of that butter. There was butter everywhere, he used to say, on the bedsteads, on the cupboards, on the chairs, on the tables, hanging on nails in bladders. All the neighbors used to bring butter to make masks for milk blossom. Mother, admirer be beautiful, looked like a Madonna with her golden hair and her eyes fringed with such long lashes that they made a shadow on her cheeks when she lowered her eyes. 
she distributed money on all sides. She would have given her golden hair, her slender white fingers, her tiny feet, her life itself, in order to save her child. And she was as sincere in her despair and her love as in her unconscious forgetfulness. Baron Laré returned to Paris, leaving my mother and Rosine and the surgeon with me. Forty-two days later, mother took the nurse, the foster father, and me back in triumph to Paris, and this told us in a little house at Neuilly, on the banks of the Seine. I had not even a scar, it appears. My skin was rather too bright a pink, but that was all. My mother, happy and trustful once more, began to travel again, leaving me in care of my aunts. Two years were spent in the little garden at Neuilly, which was full of horrible dahlias growing close together and coloured like wooden balls. My aunts never came there. My mother used to send money, bonbons and toys. The foster father died and my nurse married a concierge who used to open the door at 65 Rue de Provence. Not knowing where to find my mother and not being able to write, my nurse, without telling any of my friends, took me with her to her new abode. The change delighted me. I was five years old at the time, and I remember the day as if it were yesterday. My nurse's abode was just over the doorway of the house, and the window was framed in the heavy and monumental door. From outside I thought it was beautiful, and I began to clap my hands on reaching the house. It was toward five o'clock in the evening, in the month of November, when everything looks grey. I was put to bed, and no doubt I went to sleep at once, for there end my recollections of that day. The next morning there was terrible grief in store for me. There was no window in the little room in which I slept, and I began to cry and escaped from the arms of my nurse, who was dressing me, so that I could go into the adjoining room. I ran to the round window, which was an immense bull's eye above the doorway. I pressed my stubborn brow against the glass and began to scream with rage on seeing no trees, no boxwood, no leaves falling, nothing, nothing but stone, cold, grey, ugly stone, and panes of glass opposite me. I want to go away, I screamed. I don't want to stay here. It's all black, black. It is ugly. I want to see the ceiling of the street. And I burst into tears. My poor nurse took me up in her arms and, folding me in a rug, took me down into the courtyard. Lift your head, Milk Blossom, and look. See, there is the ceiling of the street. It comforted me somewhat to see that there was some sky in this ugly place. But my little soul was very sad. I could not eat, and I grew pale and became anemic, and I should certainly have died of consumption if it had not been for a mere chance, a most unexpected incident. One day I was playing in the courtyard with a little girl named Titine, who lived on the second floor and whose face or real name I cannot recall, when I saw my nurse's husband walking across the courtyard with two ladies, one of whom was most fashionably attired. I could only see their backs, but the voice of the fashionably attired lady caused my heart to stop beating. My poor little body trembled with nervous excitement. Do any of the windows look on to the courtyard? she asked. Yes, madame, those four, he replied, pointing to four open ones on the first floor. The lady turned to look at them, and I uttered a cry of joy. Aunt Rosine, Aunt Rosine, I exclaimed, clinging to the skirts of the pretty visitor. I buried my face in her first, stamping, sobbing, laughing, and tearing her wide lace sleeves in my frenzy of delight. She took me in her arms and tried to calm me, and questioning the concierge, she stammered out to her friend, I can't understand what it all means. This is little Sarah, my sister Yu's child. The noise I made had attracted attention, and people opened their windows. My aunt decided to take refuge in the concierge's lodge in order to come to an explanation. My poor nurse told her about all that had taken place, and her husband's death, and their second marriage. I do not remember what she said to excuse herself. 
I clung to my aunt, who was deliciously perfumed, and I would not let her go. She promised to come the following day to fetch me, but I did not want to stay any longer in that dark place. I asked to start at once with my nurse. My aunt stroked my hair gently and spoke to her friend in a language I did not understand. She tried in vain to explain something to me. I do not know what it was, but I insisted that I wanted to go away with her at once. In a gentle, tender, caressing voice, but without any real affection, she said all kinds of pretty things, stroked me with her gloved hands, patted my frock, which was turned up, made any amount of charming, frivolous little gestures, but all without any real feeling. She then went away at her friend's entreaty, after emptying her purse in my nurse's hands. I rushed toward the door, but the husband of my nurse, who had opened it for her, now closed it again. My nurse was crying, and taking me in her arms, she opened the window, saying to me, don't cry, Mir Blossom. Look at your pretty aunt. She will come back again, and then you can go away with her. Great tears rolled down her calm, round, handsome face. I could see nothing but the dark, black hole, which remained there immutable behind me, and in a fit of despair I rushed out to my aunt, who was just getting into a carriage. After that I knew nothing more. Everything seemed dark. There was a noise in the distance. I could hear voices far, far away. I had managed to escape from my poor nurse and had fallen down on the pavement in front of my aunt. I had broken my arm in two places and injured my left kneecap. I only came to myself again a few hours later to find that I was in a beautiful white bed which smelled very nice. It stood in the middle of a large room with two lovely windows which made me very joyful for I could see the ceiling of the street through them. My mother, who had been sent for immediately, came to take care of me, and I saw the rest of my family, my aunts and my cousins. My poor little brain could not understand why all these people should suddenly be so fond of me, when I had passed so many days and nights only cared for by one single person. As I was weakly and my bones small and friable, I was two years recovering from this terrible fall, and during that time was nearly always carried about. I will pass over these two years of my life, which have left me only with a vague memory of being patted and of a chronic state of torpor. One day, my mother took me on her knees and said to me, You are a big girl now, and you must learn to read and write. I was seven years old and could neither read, write, nor count, as I had been five years with the old nurse and two years ill. You must go to school, continued my mother, playing with my curly hair like a big girl. I did not know what all this meant, and I asked what a school was. It's a place where there are many little girls, replied my mother. Are they ill? I asked. Oh, no, they are quite well, as you are now, and they play together and are very gay and happy. I jumped about in delight and gave free vent to my joy, but on seeing tears in my mother's eyes, I flung myself in her arms. But what about you, Mamma? I asked. You will be all alone, and you won't have any little girl. She bent down to me and said, God has told me that he will send me some flowers and a little baby. My delight was more and more boisterous. Then I shall have a little brother, I exclaimed, or else a little sister. Oh no, I don't want that. I don't like little sisters. Mama kissed me very affectionately, and then I was dressed, I remember, in a blue corded velvet frock, of which I was very proud. Arrayed thus in all my splendor, I waited impatiently for Aunt Rosine's carriage, which was to take us to Otei. It was about three when she arrived. The housemaid had gone on about an hour before, and I had watched with delight my little trunk and my toys being packed into the carriage. The maid climbed up and took the seat by the driver, in spite of my mother protesting at first against this. When my aunt's magnificent equipage arrived, Mama was the first to get in, slowly and calmly. I got in slowly, too, giving myself airs, because the concierge and some of the shopkeepers were watching. My aunt then sprang in lightly, but by no means calmly, 
after giving her orders in English to the stiff, ridiculous-looking coachman, and handing him a paper on which the address was written. Another carriage followed ours, in which three men were seated, Régie L., a friend of my father's, General de Peu, and an artist named Fleury, I think, whose pictures of horses and sporting subjects were very much in vogue just then. I heard on the way that these gentlemen were going to arrange about a little dinner near Auteuil to console Mama for her great trouble in being separated from me. Some other guests were to be there to meet them. I did not pay very much attention to what my mother and my aunt said to each other. Sometimes when they spoke of me, they talked either English or German, and smiled at me affectionately. The long drive was greatly appreciated by me, for with my face pressed against the window and my eyes wide open, I gazed out eagerly at the grey, muddy road, with its ugly houses on each side and its bare trees. I thought it was all very beautiful, because it kept changing. The carriage stopped at 18 Rue Boileau, Auteuil. On the iron gate was a long, dark signboard with gold letters. I looked up at it, and Mamma said, You will be able to read that soon, I hope. My aunt whispered to me, Boarding school, Madame Fressard. And very promptly, I said to Mamma, It says boarding school, Madame Fressard. Mamma, my aunt, and the three gentlemen laughed heartily at my assurance, and we entered the house. Madame Fressard came forward to meet us, and I liked her at once. She was of medium height, rather stout, with a small waist, and her hair turning grey en Sauvigné. She had beautiful large eyes, rather like George Sand's, very white teeth, which showed up all the more as her complexion was rather tawny. She looked healthy, spoke kindly, her hands were plump, and her fingers long. She took my hand gently in hers, and half kneeling so that her face was level with mine, she said in a musical voice, You won't be afraid of me, will you, little girl? I did not answer, but my face flushed as red as a coxcomb. She asked me several questions, but I refused to reply. They all gathered round me. Speak, child. Come, Sarah, be a good girl. Oh, the naughty little child. It was all in vain. I remained perfectly mute. The customary round was then made, to the bedrooms, the dining hall, the classrooms, and the usual exaggerated compliments were paid. How beautifully it is all kept! How spotlessly clean everything is! And a hundred stupidities of this kind about the comfort of these prisons for children. My mother went aside with Madame Fressard, and I clung to her knees so that she could not walk. This is the doctor's prescription, she said, and then followed a long list of things that were to be done to me. Madame Fressard smiled rather ironically. You know, madame, she said to my mother, we shall not be able to curl her hair like that. And you certainly will not be able to uncurl it, replied my mother, stroking my head with her gloved hands. It's a regular wig, and they must never attempt to comb it until it had been well brushed. They could not possibly get the knots out otherwise, and it would hurt her too much. What do you give children at four o'clock? she asked, changing the subject. Oh, a slice of bread and just what the parents leave for them. There are twelve pots of different kinds of jam, said my mother, but she must have jam one day and chocolate another, as she has not a good appetite and requires change of food. I have brought six pounds of chocolate. Madame Fressard smiled in a good-natured but rather ironical way. She picked up a packet of the chocolate and looked at Mark. Ah, for Marquis, what a spoiled little girl it is. She patted my cheek with her wide fingers, and then, as her eyes fell on a large jar, she looked surprised. That's cold cream, said my mother. I make it myself, and I should like my little girl's face and hands to be rubbed with it every night when she goes to bed. But, began Madame Fressard, oh, I'll pay double laundry expenses for the sheets, interrupted my mother impatiently. Ah, my poor mother, I remember quite well that my sheets were changed once a month, like those of the other pupils. 
The farewell moment came at last, and everyone gathered round Mamma, and finally carried her off after a great deal of kissing, and with all kinds of consoling words. It will be good, it will be so good for her, it is just what she needs, you'll find her quite changed when you see her again, etc. The general, who was very fond of me, picked me up in his arms and tossed me in the air. You little chit, he said. They are putting you to the barracks, and you will have to mind your pace. I pulled his long moustache, and he said, winking and looking in the direction of Madame Fressard, who had a slight moustache, You mustn't do that to a lady, you know. My aunt laughed heartily, and my mother gave a little stifled laugh, and the whole troop went off in a regular whirlwind of rustling skirts and farewells, while I was taken away to the cage where I was to be imprisoned. I spent two years at the pension. I was taught reading, writing, and reckoning. I also learned a hundred new games. I learned to sing rondos and to embroider handkerchiefs for my mother. I was relatively happy there, as we always went out somewhere on Thursdays and Sundays, and this gave me the sensation of liberty. The very ground in the street seemed to me quite different from the ground of the large garden belonging to the pension. Besides, there were little festivities at Madame Fressard's, which used to send me into raptures. Mademoiselle Stella Collat, who had just made her debut at the Théâtre Français, came sometimes on Thursdays and recited poetry to us. I could never sleep a wink the night before, and in the morning I used to comb my hair carefully and get ready, my heart beating fast with excitement, in order to listen to something I did not understand at all, but which nevertheless left me spellbound. Then, too, there was quite a legend attached to this pretty girl. She had flung herself almost under the horse's feet as the emperor was driving along, in order to attract his attention and obtain the pardon of her brother, who had conspired against his sovereign. Mademoiselle Stella Collat had a sister at Madame Fressard's, and this sister, Clotilde, is now the wife of Mr. Pierre Merlon and the secretary of state in the treasury department. Stella was slight and fair, with blue eyes that were rather hard but expressive. She had a deep voice, and when this pale, fragile girl began to recite Athalie's dream, it thrilled me through and through. How many times, seated on my child's bed, did I practice saying in a low voice, Tremble, fille digne de moi. I used to twist my head in my shoulders, swell out my cheeks, and commence, Tremble, tremble, tremble. But it always ended badly, and I would begin again very quietly in a stifled voice, and then unconsciously speak louder, and my companions, roused by the noise, were amused at my attempts and roared with laughter. I would then rush about to the right and left, giving them kicks and blows, which they returned with interest. Madame Fressard's adopted daughter, Mademoiselle Caroline, whom I chanced to meet a long time after, married to the celebrated artist Yvon, would then appear on the scene angry and implacable and would give us all kinds of punishments for the following day. As for me, I used to get locked up for three days. That was followed by my being detained on the first day we were allowed out. And in addition, I would receive five strokes with a ruler on my fingers. Ah, those ruler blows of Mademoiselle Caroline's. I reproached her about them when I met her again twenty-five years later. She used to make us put all our fingers round the thumb and hold our hands out straight into her, and then bang came her wide ebony ruler. She used to give us a cruelly hard, dry blow which made the tears spurt to our eyes. I took a dislike to Mademoiselle Caroline. She was beautiful, but with a kind of beauty I did not care for. She had a very white complexion and very black hair which she wore in waved bandeaux. When I saw her a long time afterwards, one of my relatives brought her to my house and said, I am sure you will not recognize this lady, and yet you know her very well. I was leaning against the large mantelpiece in the hall, and I saw this tall woman, still beautiful but rather provincial-looking, coming through the first drawing-room. As she descended the three steps into the hall, the light fell on her protruding forehead, 
framed on each side with a hard waved bandeau. Mademoiselle Caroline, I exclaimed, and with a furtive childish movement, I hid my two hands behind my back. I never saw her again, for the grudge I had owed her from my childhood must have been apparent under my politeness as hostess. As I said before, I was not unhappy at Madame Fressart, and it seemed quite natural to me that I should stay there until I was quite grown up. My uncle, Félix Faure, who at present has entered the Carthusian monastery, had stipulated that his wife, my mother's sister, should often take me out. He had a very fine country place at Neuilly, with a stream running through the grounds, and I used to fish there for hours together with my two cousins, a boy and a girl. These two years of my life passed peacefully, without any other events than my terrible fits of temper, which upset the whole pension, and always left me in the sick room for two or three days. These outbursts of temper were like attacks of madness. One day, Aunt Rosine arrived suddenly to take me away altogether. My father had written, given orders as to where I was to be placed, and these orders were imperative. My mother was travelling, so she had sent word to my aunt, who had hurried off at once between two dances, to carry out the instructions she had received. The idea that I was to be ordered about, without any regard to my own wishes or inclinations, put me into an indescribable rage. I rolled about on the ground, uttering the most heart-rending cries. I yelled out all kinds of reproaches, blaming my mother, my aunts, and Madame Fressard for not finding some way to keep me with her. The struggle lasted two hours, and while I was being dressed, I escaped twice into the garden and attempted to climb the trees and to throw myself into the pond in which there was more mud than water. Finally, when I was completely exhausted and subdued, I was taken off, sobbing, into my aunt's carriage. I stayed three days at her house, as I was so feverish that my life was said to be in danger. My father used to come to the house of my aunt Rosine, who was then living at 6 rue de la Chaussée d'Antin. He was on friendly terms with Rosini, who lived at number 4 in the same street. He often brought him in, and Rosini made me laugh with his clever stories and comic grimaces. My father was as handsome as a god, and I used to look at him with pride. I did not know him well, as I saw him so rarely, but I loved him for his seductive voice and his slow, gentle gestures. He commanded a certain respect, and I noticed that even my exuberant aunt come down in his presence. I recovered, and Dr. Monod, who was attending me, said that I could now be moved without any fear of ill effects. We had been waiting for my mother, but she was ill at Harlem. My aunt offered to accompany us if my father would take me to the convent, but he refused, and I can hear him now with his gentle voice saying, No, her mother will take her to the convent. I have written to the followers, and the child is to stay there a fortnight. My aunt was about to protest, but my father replied, It's quieter there, my dear Rosine, and the child needs tranquillity more than anything else. I went that very evening to my aunt Fours. I did not care much for her, as she was cold and affected, but I adored my uncle. He was so gentle and so calm, and there was an infinite charm in his smile. His son was as turbulent as I was myself, adventurous and rather hair-brained, so that we always liked being together. His sister, an adorable, gross-like girl, was reserved and, and always afraid of soiling her frocks and even her pinafores. The poor child married Baron Cerise and died during her confinement, in the very flower of youth and beauty, because her timidity, her reserve and narrow education had made her refuse to see a doctor when the intervention of a medical man was absolutely necessary. I was very fond of her, and her death was a great grief to me. At present, I never see the faintest ray of moonlight without its evoking a pale vision of her. I stayed three weeks at my uncle's, roaming about with my cousin and spending hours lying down flat, fishing for crayfish in the little stream that ran through the park. This park was immense and surrounded by a wide ditch. 
How many times I used to have bets with my cousins that I would jump that ditch. The bet was sometimes three sheets of paper, or five pins, or perhaps my two pancakes, for we used to have pancakes every Tuesday. And after the bet, I jumped, more often than not, falling into the ditch and splashing about in the green water, screaming because I was afraid of the frogs, and yelling with terror when my cousins pretended to rush away. When I returned to the house, my aunt was always watching anxiously at the top of the stone steps for our arrival. What a lecture I had and what a cold look. Go upstairs and change your clothes, my mademoiselle, she would say. And thou stay in your room. Your dinner will be sent to you there without any dessert. As I passed the big glass in the hall, I would catch sight of myself, looking like a rotten tree stump, and see my cousin making signs that he would bring me some dessert by putting his hands to his mouth. His sister used to go to his mother, who fondled the hair, and seemed to say, Thank heaven you are not like that little bohemian. This was my aunt's stinging epithet for me in moments of anger. I used to go up to my room with a heavy heart, thoroughly ashamed and vexed, vowing to myself that I would never again jump the ditch. But on reaching my room, I would find the gardener's daughter there, a big awkward merry girl who used to wait on me. Oh, how comic mademoiselle looks like that, she would say laughing so heartily that I was proud of looking comic and decided that when I jumped the ditch again, I would get weeds and mud all over me. When I had undressed and washed, I used to put on a flannel gown and wait in my room until my dinner came. Soup was sent up and then meat, bread and water. I detested meat then, just as I do now and threw it out of the window after cutting off the fat which I put on the rim of my plate as my aunt used to come up unexpectedly. Have you eaten your dinner, mademoiselle? she would ask. Yes, aunt, I replied. Are you still hungry? No, aunt. Write out our father and the creed three times, you little heathen. This was because I had not been baptized. A quarter of an hour later, my uncle would come upstairs. Have you had enough dinner? he would ask. Yes, uncle, I replied. Did you eat your meat? No, I threw it out of the window. I don't like meat. You told your aunt an untruth then. No, she asked me if I had eaten my dinner, and I answered that I had, but I did not say that I had eaten my meat. What punishment has she given you? I am to write out Our Father and the Creed three times before going to bed. Do you know them by heart? No, not very well. I make mistakes always. And the adorable man would then dictate to me Our Father and the Creed, and I would copy it in the most devout way, as he used to dictate with deep feeling and emotion. He was religious, very religious indeed, this uncle of mine and after the death of my aunt, he became a Carthusian monk. At the present moment, ill and aged as he is, and bent with pain, I know he is digging his own grave, weak with the weight of the spade, imploring God to take him, and thinking sometimes of me, his little bohemian. Ah, the dear good man, it is to him that I owe all that is best in me. I love him devotedly, and have the greatest respect for him. How many times in the difficult phases of my life I have thought of him and consulted his ideas, for I never saw him again, as my aunt quarrelled purposely with my mother and me. He was always fond of me, though, and has told his friends to assure me of this. Occasionally, too, he has sent me his advice, which has always been very straightforward and full of intelligence and common sense. Recently I went to the country where the Carthusians have taken refuge. A friend of mine went to see my uncle, and I wept on hearing the words he had dictated to be repeated to me. To return to my story, after my uncle's visit, Marie, the gardener's daughter, came to my room, looking quite indifferent, but with her pockets stuffed with apples, biscuits, raisins and nuts. My cousin had sent me some dessert, but she, the good-hearted girl, had cleared all the dessert dishes. I told her to sit down and crack the nuts, and I would eat them when I had finished my lord's prayer and creed. 
She sat down on the floor so that she could hide everything quickly under the table in case my aunt returned. But my aunt seldom came again, as she and her daughter used to spend their evenings at the piano while my uncle taught his son mathematics. Finally, my mother wrote to say that she was coming. There was great excitement in my uncle's house, and my little trunk was packed in readiness. The Grand Champs convent, which I was about to enter, had a prescribed uniform, and my cousin, who loved sewing, marked all my things with initials S.B. in red cotton. My uncle gave me a silver spoon, fork, and goblet, and these were all marked 32, which was the number under which I was registered there. Marie gave me a thick woolen muffler in different shades of violet, which she had been knitting for me in secret the last few days. My aunt put round my neck a little scapulary which had been blessed, and when my mother and father arrived, everything was ready. A farewell dinner was given, to which two of my mother's friends, Aunt Rosine, and four other members of the family were invited. I felt very important. I was neither sad nor gay, but had just this feeling of importance, which was quite enough for me. Everyone at table talked about me. My uncle kept stroking my hair and my cousin from her end of the table threw me kisses. Suddenly my father's musical voice made me turn toward him. Listen to me, Sarah, he said. If you are very good at the convent, I will come in four years and fetch you away, and you shall travel with me and see some beautiful countries. Oh, I will be good, I exclaimed. I'll be as good as Aunt Henriette. This was my Aunt Four. Everybody smiled. After dinner, the weather being very fine, we all went out to stroll in the park. My father took me with him and talked to me very seriously. He told me things that were sad, which I had never heard before. I understood, although I was so young, and my eyes filled with tears. He was sitting on an old bench, and I was on his knee with my head resting on his shoulder. I listened to all he said and cried silently my childish mind disturbed by his words. Poor father, I was never, never to see him again. Chapter 2 of Memories of My Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memories of My Life by Sarah Bernard Chapter 2 I Begin My Convent Life I did not sleep well that night, and the following morning at eight o'clock we started by diligence for Versailles. I can see Marie now in tears, great big girl as she was. All the members of the family were assembled at the top of the stone steps. There was my little trunk, and then a wooden case of games which my mother had brought, and a kite that my cousin had made, which he gave me at the last moment, just as the carriage was starting. I can still see the large white house, which seemed to get smaller and smaller the farther we drove away from it. I stood up, with my father holding me, and waved his blue silk muffler, which I had taken from his neck. After this, I sat down in the carriage and fell asleep, only rousing up again when we were at the heavy-looking door of the Grand Champ convent. I rubbed my eyes and tried to collect my thoughts. I then jumped down from the diligence and looked at everything around me. The paving stones of the street were round and small, with grass growing everywhere. There was a wall and then a great gateway surmounted by a cross, and nothing behind it, nothing whatever to be seen. To the left there was a house, and to the right a sartory barracks. Not a sound to be heard, not a footfall, not even an echo. Oh, Mamma! I exclaimed, is it inside there I am to go? Oh, no, I would rather go back to Madame Frassard's. My mother shrugged her shoulders and pointed to my father thus explaining that she was not responsible for this step. I rushed to him, and while ringing the bell, he took me by the hand. The door opened, and he led me gently in, followed by my mother and Aunt Rosine. The courtyard was large and dreary-looking, 
but there were buildings to be seen and windows from which children's faces were gazing curiously at us. My father said something to the nun who came forward, and she took us into the parlour. This was large, with a polished floor, and was divided by an enormous black grating which ran the whole length of the room. There were benches covered with red velvet by the wall, and a few chairs and armchairs near the grating. On the walls were the portraits of Pius IX, a full-length one of St. Augustine, and one of Henry V. My teeth chattered, for it seemed to me that I remembered reading in some book the description of a prison, and that it was just like this. I looked at my father and at my mother, and began to distrust them. I had so often heard that I was ungovernable, that I needed an iron hand to rule me, and that I was the devil incarnate in a child. My aunt Fore had so often repeated, that child will come to a bad end, she has such mad ideas, etc., etc. Papa, Papa, I suddenly cried out, seized with terror. I won't go to prison. This is a prison, I'm sure. I'm frightened. Oh, I'm so frightened. On the other side of the grating, a door had just opened, and I stopped to see who was coming. A little round, short woman made her appearance and came up to the grating. Her black veil was lowered as far as her mouth, so I could see scarcely anything of her face. She recognized my father, whom she had probably seen before when matters were being arranged. She opened the door in the grating, and we all went through to the other side of the room. On seeing me pale and my terrified eyes full of tears, she gently took my hand in hers, and turning her back to my father, raised her veil. I then saw the sweetest and merriest face imaginable, with large, childlike blue eyes, a turn-up nose, a laughing mouth with full lips and beautiful, strong, white teeth. She looked so kind, so energetic, and so gay, that I flung myself at once into her arms. It was Mother Saint-Sophie, the superior of the Grand Champ convent. Ah, we are friends now, you see, she said to my father, lowering her veil again. What secret instinct could have told this woman, who was not coquettish, who had no looking-glass, and never troubled about beauty, that her face was fascinating, and that her bright smile would enliven the gloom of the convent? We will now go and visit the house, she said. We at once started, she and my father each holding one of my hands. Two other nuns accompanied us, one of whom was the mother prefect, a tall, cold woman with thin lips, and Sister Seraphine, who was as white and supple as a spray of lily of the valley. We started by entering the building and came first to the large classroom in which all the pupils met on Thursdays at the lectures, which were nearly always given by Mother Saint Sophie. Most of them did needlework all day long, tapestry, embroidery, etc., and others the calcomania. The room was very large, and on St. Catherine's Day and the other holidays, we used to dance there. It was in this room, too, that once a year the Mother Superior gave to each of the sisters the sou which represented her annual income. The walls were adorned with religious engravings, and with a few old paintings done by the pupils. The place of honour, though, belonged to St. Augustine. A magnificent large engraving depicted the conversion of this saint, and oh, how often I have looked at that engraving. St. Augustine has certainly caused me very much emotion and greatly disturbed my childish heart. Mama admired the cleanliness of the refectory. She asked to see which would be my seat at table, and when this was shown to her, she objected strongly to my having that place. No, she said, the child has not a strong chest, and she would always be in a draught. I will not let her sit there. My father agreed with my mother and insisted on a change being made. It was therefore decided that I should sit at the end of the room, and the promise given was faithfully kept. When Mama saw the wide staircase leading to the dormitories, she was aghast. It was very, very wide, and the steps were low and easy to mount. But there were so many of them before one reached the first floor. For a few seconds, Mama hesitated and stood there gazing at them, her arms hanging down in despair. Stay down here, Yule, said my aunt. I will go up. 
No, no, replied my mother in a sorrowful voice. I must see where the child is to sleep. She's so delicate. My father helped her, and indeed almost carried her up, and we then went into one of the immense dormitories. It was very much like the dormitory at Madame Fressard's, but a great deal larger, and there was a tiled floor without any carpet. Oh, this is quite impossible, exclaimed Mamma. The child cannot sleep here. It is too cold. It would kill her. The mother superior, Saint Sophie, gave my mother a chair and tried to soothe her. She was pain, for her heart was already very much affected. We will put your little girl in this dormitory, madame, she said, opening a door that led into a room with eight beds. The floor was of polished wood, and this room, adjoining the infirmary, was the one in which delicate or convalescent children slept. Mama was reassured on seeing this, and we then went down and inspected the ground. There were three woods, the little wood, the middle wood, and the big wood, and then there was an orchard that stretched along as far as the eye could see. In this orchard was the building where the poor children lived. They were taught gratis by the nuns, and every week they helped with laundry for the convent. The sight of these immense woods with swings, hammocks, and a gymnasium delighted me, for I thought I should be able to roam about at pleasure there. Mother St. Sophie explained to us that the little wood was reserved for the older pupils, and the middle wood for the little ones, while the big wood was for the whole convent on holidays. Then, after telling us about the collecting of the chestnuts and the gathering of the acacia, Mother St. Sophie informed us that every child could have a small garden and that sometimes two or three of them had a larger one between them. Oh, can I have a garden of my own? I explained. A garden all to myself. Yes, replied my mother, one of your own. The mother superior called the gardener Père Larcet, the only man with the exception of the almoner, who was on the convent staff. Père Larcet, said the kind woman, here is a little girl who wants a beautiful garden. Find a nice place for it. Very good, Reverend Mother, answered the honest fellow, and I saw my father slip a coin into his hand, for which the man thanked him in an embarrassed way. It was getting late, and we had to separate. I remember quite well that I did not feel any grief, as I was thinking of nothing but my garden. The convent no longer seemed to me like a prison, but like paradise. I kissed my mother and my aunt. Papa drew me to him and held me a moment in a close embrace. When I looked at him, I saw that his eyes were full of tears. I did not feel at all inclined to cry, and I gave him a hearty kiss and whispered, I'm going to be very, very good and work well, so that I can go with you at the end of four years. I then went toward my mother, who was giving Mother Saint Sophie the same instructions she had given to Madame Fressard about cold cream, chocolate, jam, etc., Mother Saint Sophie wrote down all these instructions, and it is only fair to say that she carried them out afterwards most scrupulously. When my parents had gone, I felt inclined to cry, but the Mother Superior took me by the hand, and leading me to the second wood, showed me where my garden would be. That was quite enough to distract my thoughts, for we found Père Larcher there marking out my piece of ground in a corner of the wood. There was a young birch tree against the wall. The corner was formed by the joining of two walls, one of which bounded the railway line of the left bank of the river, which cuts the Sartre woods in two. The other wall was that of the cemetery. All the woods of the convent were part of the beautiful Sartre forest. They had all given me money, my father, my mother, and my aunt. I had altogether about forty or fifty francs, and I wanted to give it all to Père Larcher for buying seed, the Mother Superior smiled and sent for the Mother Treasurer and Mother Saint Apolline. I had to hand all my money over to the former, with the exception of twenty sous, which she left me, saying, When that is all gone, little girl, come and get some more from me. Mère Saint Apolline, who taught botany, then asked me what kind of flowers I wanted. What kind of flowers? Why I wanted every sort that grew. She at once proceeded to give me a botany lesson, by explaining that all flowers did not grow at the same season. She then asked the mother treasurer for some of my money, which she gave to Père Lachet, 
telling him to buy me a spade, a rake, a hoe, and a watering can, some seeds and a few plants, the names of which he wrote down for him. And I then went with Mother St. Sophie to the refectory to have dinner. On entering the immense room, I stood still for a second, amazed and confused. More than a hundred girls were assembled there, standing up for the benediction to be pronounced. When the Mother Superior appeared, every one bowed respectfully, and then all eyes were turned on me. Mother St. Sophie took me to the seat which had been chosen for me at the end of the room, and then returned to the middle of the refectory. She stood still, made the sign of the cross, and in an audible voice pronounced the benediction. As she left the room, everyone bowed again, and I then found myself alone, quite alone in this cage of little white animals. I was seated between two little girls of from ten to twelve years old, both as dusky as two young moles. They were twins from Jamaica, and their names were Dolores and Pepa Cardanos. They had been in the convent only two months, and appeared to be as timid as I was. The dinner was composed of soup, made of everything, and of veal with haricot beans. I detested soup, and I have always had the horror of veal. I turned my plate over when the soup was handed round, but the nun who waited on us turned it up again and poured the hot soup in, regardless of scolding me. You must drink your soup, whispered my right-hand neighbor, whose name was Peppa. I don't like that sort, and I don't want any, I said aloud. The inspector was passing by just at that moment. You must drink your soup, mademoiselle, she said. No, I don't like that sort of soup, I answered. She smiled and said in a gentle voice, We must like everything. I shall be coming round again soon. Be a good girl and take your soup. I was getting into a rage, but Dolores gave me her empty plate and drank the soup for me. When the inspectress came round again, she expressed her satisfaction. I was furious and put my tongue out, and this made all the table laugh. She turned round, and the pupil who sat at the end of the table and was appointed to watch over us, because she was the eldest, said to her in a low voice, It's the new girl making grimaces. The inspectress moved away again, and when the veal was served, my portion found its way to the plate of my neighbor Dolores. I wanted to keep the haricot beans, though, and we almost came to a quarrel over them. She gave way finally, but with a veal she dragged away a few beans which I tried to keep on my plate. An hour later we had evening prayers, and afterwards all went up to bed. My bed was placed against the wall, in which there was a niche for the statue of the Virgin Mary. A lamp was always kept burning in this niche, and the oil for it was provided by the children who had been ill and were grateful for their recovery. Two tiny flower pots were placed at the foot of the little statue. The pots were of terracotta and the flowers of paper. I made pepper flowers very well, and I at once decided that I would make all the flowers for the Virgin Mary. I fell asleep to dream of garlands of flowers, of haricot beans, and of distant countries, for the twins from Jamaica had made an impression on my mind. The awakening was cruel. I was not accustomed to get up so early. Daylight was scarcely visible through the opaque window panes. I grumbled as I dressed, for we were allowed only a quarter of an hour, and it always took me a good half hour to comb my hair. Sister Marie, seeing that I was not ready, came toward me, and before I knew what she was going to do, snatched the comb violently out of my hand. Come, come, she said, you must not dawdle like this. She then planted the comb in my mop of hair and tore out a handful of it. Pain and anger at seeing myself treated in this way threw me immediately into one of my fits of rage, which always terrified those who witnessed them. I flung myself upon the unfortunate sister, and with feet, teeth, hands, elbows, head, and indeed all my poor little body, I hit, thumped, and at the same time yelled. All the pupils, all the sisters, and indeed everyone came running to see what was the matter. The sisters made a sign of the cross, but did not venture to approach me. The mother prefect threw some holy water over me to exorcise the evil spirit. Finally, the mother superior arrived on the scene. 
my father had told her of my fits of wild fury which were my only serious fault and my state of health was quite as much responsible for them as the violence of my disposition she approached me as i was clutching sister marie but was exhausted by this struggle with a poor woman who although tall and strong only tried to ward off my blows without retaliating endeavouring to hold first my feet and then my hands i looked up on hearing mother saint sophie's voice my eyes were bathed in tears but nevertheless i saw such an expression of pity on her sweet face that without altogether letting go i ceased fighting for a second and trembling and ashamed said very quickly she commenced it she snatched the comb out of my hand like a wicked woman and tore out my hair she was rough and hurt me she is a wicked wicked woman i then burst into sobs and my hands loosed their hold the next thing i knew was that i found myself lying on my little bed with mother saint sophie's hand on my forehead and her kind deep voice lecturing me gently the next thing i knew was that i found myself lying on my little bed with mother saint sophie's hand on my forehead and her kind deep voice lecturing me gently all the others had gone and i was quite alone with her and the holy virgin in the niche from that day forth mother saint sophie had an immense influence over me every morning i went to her and sister marie whose forgiveness i had been obliged to ask before the whole convent combed my hair out in her presence seated on a little stool i listened to the book that the mother superior read to me or to the instructive story she told me ah what an adorable woman she was and how i loved to recall her to my memory i adored her as a little child adores the being who has entirely won its heart without knowing without reasoning without even being aware that it was so but i was simply under the spell of an infinite fascination since then though i have understood and admired her realizing how unique and radiant a soul was imprisoned under the thick-set exterior and happy face of that holy woman i have loved her for all that she awakened within me of nobleness i love her for the letters which she wrote me letters that i often read over and over again i love her also because imperfect as i am it seems to me that i should have been one hundred times more so had i not known and loved that pure creature once only did i see her severe and feel that she was suddenly angry in the little room used as a parlour leading into her cell there was a portrait of a young man whose handsome face was stamped with a certain nobility is that the emperor asked no she answered turning quickly toward me it is the king it is henry v it was only later on that i understood the meaning of her emotion all the convent was royalist and henry v was their recognized sovereign they all had the most utter contempt for napoleon the third and on the day when the prince imperial was baptized there was no distribution of bonbons for us and we were not allowed the holiday that was accorded to all the colleges boarding schools and convents politics were a dead letter to me and i was happy at the convent thanks to mother saint sophie then too i was a favorite with my schoolfellows who frequently did my compositions for me i did not care for any studies except geography and drawing arithmetic drove me wild spelling played my life out and i thoroughly despised the piano i was very timid and quite lost my head when questioned unexpectedly i had a passion for animals of all kinds i used to carry about with me in small cardboard boxes or cages that i manufactured myself others with which the woods were full crickets that i found on the leaves of the tiger lilies and lizards the latter nearly always had their tails broken as in order to see if they were eating i used to lift the lid of the box a little on seeing this the lizards rushed to the opening i would shut the box very quickly red with surprise at such assurance when cracking and twinkling either at the right or the left there was nearly always a tail caught this used to greet me for hours and while one of the sisters was explaining to us by figures on the blackboard the magic system i was wondering with my lizard's tail in my hand how i could fasten it on again i had some death watches in a little box and five spiders in a cage that perlachet had made for me with some wire netting 
I used, very cruelly, to give flies to my spiders, and they, fat and well-fed, would spin their webs. Very often, during recreation, a whole group of us, ten or twelve little girls, would stand round, with a cage on a bench or tree stump, and watch the wonderful work of these little creatures. If one of my schoolfellows cut herself, I used to go quickly to her, feeling very proud and important. Come at once, I would say. I have some fresh spider web, and I will wrap your finger in it. Provided with a little thin stick, I would take the web and wrap it round the wounded finger. And now, my little spiders, I would say, you must begin your work again. And active and minute, madame, the spiders began their spinning once more. I was looked upon as a little authority, and was made umpire in questions that had to be decided. I used to receive orders for fashionable trousseaus made of paper for dolls. It was quite an easy thing for me in those days to make long carmine cloaks with fur tippets and muff, and this filled my little playfellows with admiration. I charged for my trousseaus according to their importance, two pencils, five tete de mort nibs, or a couple of sheets of white paper. In short, I became a personality, and that sufficed for my childish pride. I did not learn anything, and I received no distinctions. My name was only once on the honor list, and that was not as a studious pupil, but for a courageous deed. I had fished a little girl out of the big pool. She had fallen in while trying to catch frogs. The pool was in the large orchard on the poor children's side of the grounds. As a punishment for some misdeed, which I do not remember, I had been sent away for two days among the poor children. This was supposed to be a punishment, and I delighted in it. In the first place, I was looked upon by them as a young lady. Then I used to give the day pupils a few sous to bring me, on the sly, a little moist sugar. During recreation, I heard some heart-rending shrieks, and rushing to the pool from whence they came, I saw a little girl immersed in it. I jumped into the water without reflecting. There was so much mud that we both sank in it. The little girl was only four years old and so small that she kept disappearing. I was over ten at the time. I do not know how I managed to rescue her, but I dragged her out of the water with her mouth, nose, ears and eyes all filled with mud. I was told afterwards that it was a long time before she was restored to consciousness. As for me, I was carried away with my teeth chattering, nervous and half fainting. I was very feverish afterwards, and Mother Saint Sophie herself sat up with me. I overheard her words to the doctor. This child, she said, is one of the best we have. She will be perfect when once she has received the holy chrism. This speech made such an impression on me that from that day forth, mysticism had a great hold on me. I had a very vivid imagination, and it was extremely sensitive, and the Christian legend took possession of me, heart and soul. The Son of God became the object of my worship, and the mother of the seven sorrows my ideal. An event very simple in itself was destined to disturb the silence of our secluded life and to attach me more than ever to my convent, where I wanted to remain forever. The Archbishop of Paris, Monseigneur Sibour, was paying a round of visits to some of the communities, and ours was among the chosen ones. The news was told us by Mother Saint Alexis the Senior, who was so tall, so thin, and so old, that I never looked upon her as a human being, or as a living being. It always seemed to me as though she were stuffed, and as though she moved by machinery. She frightened me, and I never consented to go near to her until after her death. We were all assembled in the large room which he used on Thursdays. Mother St. Alexis, supported by two lay sisters, stood on the little platform, and, in a voice that sounded far, far off, announced to us the approaching visit of Monseigneur. He was to come on St. Catherine's Day, just a fortnight after the speech of the Reverend Mother. Our peaceful convent was thenceforth like a beehive in which a hornet had entered. Our lesson hours were curtailed so that we might have time to make festoons of roses and lilies. The wide, tall armchair of carved wood was uncushioned so that it might be varnished and polished. We made lampshades covered with crystalline, 
The grass was pulled up in the courtyard, and I cannot tell what was not done in honor of this visitor. Two days after the announcement made by Mother Saint Alexis, the program of the fete was read to us by Mother Saint Sophie. The youngest of the nuns was to read a few words of welcome to Monseigneur. This was the delightful sister Seraphine. After that, Marie Buguet was to play a pianoforte solo by Henri Hertz. Marie de la Cour was to sing a song by Louise Puget, and then a little play in three scenes was to be given, entitled Toby Recovering His Eyesight. It had been written by Mother Therese. I have now before me the little manuscript, oil yellow with age and torn, and I can only just make out the sense of it and a few of the phrases. The little play was read to us by Mother St. Therese one Thursday, in the large assembly room. We were all in tears at the end, and Mother St. Therese was obliged to make a great effort in order to avoid committing, if only for a second, the sin of pride. Scene 1. Toby's farewell to his blind father. He vows to bring back to him the ten talents lent to Gabilius, one of his relatives. Scene 2. Toby, asleep on the banks of the Tiber, is being watched over by the angel Raphael. Struggle with a monster fish which had attacked Toby while he slept. When the fish is killed, the angel advises Toby to take its heart, its liver and its gall, and to preserve this religiously. Scene 3. Toby's return to his blind father. The angel tells him to rub the old man's eyes with the entrails of the fish. The father's eyesight is restored. And when Toby begs the angel Raphael to accept some reward, the latter makes himself known and in a song to the glory of God, vanishes to heaven. I wondered anxiously what part I should take in this religious comedy, for considering that I was now treated as a little personage, I had no doubt but some role would be distributed to me. The very thought of it made me tremble beforehand, and I kept saying to myself, oh no, I could never say anything aloud. I began to get quite nervous, my hands became quite cold, my heart beat furiously, and my temples throbbed. I did not approach, but remained sulkily seated on my stool when Mother St. Therese said in her calm voice, Young ladies, please pay attention and listen for your names for the different parts. Old Toby, Eugenie Charmel, young Toby, Amélie Pluche, Gabrius René Darby, the angel Raphael Louise Puyet, Toby's mother, Eulalie Lacroix, Toby's sister, Virginie de Paul. I had been listening, although pretending not to, and I was stupefied, amazed, and furious. Mother St. Therese then added, Here are your manuscripts, young ladies, and a manuscript of the little play was handed to each pupil chosen to take part in it. Louise Puguet was my favorite playmate and I went up to her and asked her to let me see the manuscript, which I read again enthusiastically. You'll hear me rehearse when I have learned it, won't you? she asked, and I answered, yes, certainly. Oh, how frightened I shall be, she said. She had been chosen for the angel, I suppose, because she was as pale and sweet as a moonbeam. She had a soft, timid voice, and sometimes we used to make her cry, as she was so pretty then. The tears used to flow limpid and pearl-like from her grey, questioning eyes. She began at once to learn her part, and I was like a shepherd's dog going from one to another among the chosen ones. I had really nothing to do with it, but I wanted to be in it. The mother superior passed by, and as we all courtesied to her, she patted my cheek. We thought of you, little girl, she said, but you are so timid when you are asked anything. Oh, that's when it is history or arithmetic, I said. This is not the same thing, and I should not have been afraid. She smiled distrustfully and moved on. There were rehearsals during the next week. I asked to be allowed to take the part of the monster, as I wanted to have some role in the play at any cost. It was decided, though, that César, the convent dog, should be the fish monster. A competition was opened for the fish costume, I went to an endless amount of trouble, cutting out scales from cardboard that I had painted, and sewing them together afterward. I made some enormous gills, which were to be glued on to Cesar. My costume was not chosen. It was passed over for that of a stupid big girl whose name I cannot remember. 
She had made a huge tail of kid, and a mask with big eyes and gills, but there were no scales, and we should have to see César's shaggy coat. I nevertheless turned my attention to Louise Buquet's costume, and worked at it with two of the lay sisters, Sister Saint Cécile and Sister Saint Jeanne, who had charge of the linen room. At the rehearsals, not a word could be extorted from the angel Raphael. She stood there stupefied on the little platform, tears dimming her beautiful eyes. She brought the whole play to a standstill and kept appealing to me in a weeping voice. I prompted her and, getting up, rushed to her, kissed her, and whispered her whole speech to her. I was beginning to be in it myself at last. Finally, two days before the great solemnity, there was a dress rehearsal. The angel looked lovely, but immediately on entering, he sank down on a bench, sobbing out in an imploring voice, Oh no, I shall never be able to do it, never. Quite true, she never will be able to, sighed Mother Saint Sophie. Forgetting for the moment my little friend's grief, and wild with joy, pride and assurance, I ran up to the platform and bounded on to the form on which the angel Raphael had sunk down weeping. Oh, mother, I know her part. Shall I take her place for the rehearsal? Yes, yes, exclaimed voices from all sides. Oh, yes, you know it so well, said Louise Bouguet, and she wanted to put her band on my head. No, let me rehearse as I am first, I answered. They began the second scene again, and I came in carrying a long branch of willow. Fear nothing, Toby, I commenced. I will be your guide. I will remove from your path all thorns and stones. You are overwhelmed with fatigue. Lie down and rest, for I will watch over you. Thereupon, Toby, worn out, lay down by the side of a strip of blue muslin, about five yards of which, stretched out and winding about, represented the Tiber. I then continued by a prayer to God while Toby fell asleep. Cesar next appeared as the monster fish, and the audience trembled with fear. Cesar had been well taught by the gardener Père Larchet, and he advanced slowly from under the blue muslin. He was wearing his mask, representing the head of a fish. Two enormous nutshells for his eyes had been painted white, and a hole pierced through them so that the dog could see. The mask was fastened with wire to his collar, which also supported two gills as large as palm leaves. Cesar, sniffing the ground, snorted and growled, and then leaped wildly on to Toby, who with his cudgels slew the monster at one blow. The dog fell on his back with his four paws in the air, and then rolled over on his side, pretending to be dead. There was wild delight in the house, and the audience clapped and stamped, the younger pupils stood up on their stools and shouted, Good César, clever César, oh good dog, good dog. The sisters, touched by the efforts of the guardian of the convent, shook their heads with emotion. As for me, I quite forgot that I was the injured Raphael, and I stooped down and stroked César affectionately. Ah, oh, how well he has acted his part, I said, kissing him and taking one paw and then the other in my hand, while the dog, motionless, continued to be dead. The little bell was rung to call us to order. I stood up again, and accompanied by the piano, we burst into a hymn of praise. I do it to the glory of God, who had just saved Toby from the fearful monster. After this, the little green serge curtain was drawn, and I was surrounded, petted, and praised. Mother Saint Sophie came up onto the platform and kissed me affectionately. As to Louise Bouguet, she was now joyful again, and her angelic face beamed. Oh, how well you knew the part, she said. And then, too, everyone can hear what you say. Oh, thank you so much. She kissed me, and I hugged her with all my might. At last I was in it. The third scene began. The action took place in Father Toby's house. Gabrius, the angel, and young Toby were holding the entrails of the fish in their hands and looking at them. The angel explained how they must be used for rubbing the blind father's eyes. I felt rather sick, for I was holding in my hand a skate's lever, and the heart and gizzard of a fowl. I had never touched such things before, and every now and then the sick feeling made me heave, and the tears came into my eyes. Finally, the blind father came in, led by Toby's sister. 
Gabelus knelt down before the old man and gave him the ten silver talents, telling him in a long recital of Toby's exploits in Media. After this, Toby advanced, embraced his father, and then rubbed his eyes with his skate sliver. Eugenie Charmel made a grimace, but after wiping her eyes, she exclaimed, I can't see, I can't see. Oh, God of goodness, God of mercy, I can't see, I can't see. She came forward with outstretched arms, her eyes open in an ecstatic attitude, and the whole little assemble, so simple-minded and loving, wept. All the actors, except old Toby and the angel, sank on their knees and gave praise to God, and at the close of this thanksgiving, the public, moved by religious sentiment and discipline, repeated Amen. Toby's mother then approached the angel and said, Oh, noble stranger, take up your abode from henceforth with us. You shall be our guest, our son, our brother. I then advanced, and in a long speech of at least thirty lines, made known that I was the messenger of God, that I was the angel Raphael. I then gathered up quickly the pale blue tarlatan, which was being concealed for final effect, and bathed myself in cloudy tissue, which was intended to simulate my flight heavenward. The little green serge curtain was then closed on this apotheosis. Finally, the solemn day arrived. I was so furious with expectation that I could not sleep the last three nights. The dressing bell was rung for us earlier than usual, but I was already up and trying to smooth my rebellious hair, which I brushed with a wet brush by way of making it behave better. Monseigneur was to arrive at eleven o'clock in the morning, we therefore lunch at ten, and were then drawn up in the principal courtyard. Only Mother St. Alexis, the eldest of the nuns, was in the front, and Mother St. Sophie was just behind her. The almoner was a little distance away from the two superiors, then came the other nuns, and behind them the girls, and then all the little children. The lay sisters and the servants were also there. We were all dressed in white, with the respective colours of our various classes. The bell rang out a peal. The large carriage entered the first courtyard. The gate of the principal courtyard was then opened, and Monseigneur appeared on the carriage steps, which the footman lowered for him. Mother St. Alexis advanced, and bending down, kissed the episcopal ring. Mother St. Sophie, the superior, who was younger, knelt down to kiss the ring. The signal was then given to us, and we all knelt to receive the benediction of Monseigneur. When we looked up again, the big gate was closed, and Monseigneur had disappeared, conducted by the Mother Superior. Mother St. Alexis was exhausted and went back to her cell. In obedience to the signal given, we all rose from our knees. We then went to the chapel where a short mass was celebrated, after which we had an hour's recreation. The concert was to commence at half past one. The recreation hour was devoted to preparing the large room and to getting ready to appear before Monseigneur. I wore the angel's long robe with a blue sash round my waist and two paper wings fastened on with narrow blue straps that crossed over each other in front. Round my head was a band of gold braid fastening behind. I kept mumbling my part, for in those days we did not know the word roll, we are most used to the theatre at present, but at the convent we always said part, and years afterwards I was surprised, the first time I played in England, to hear a young English girl say, Oh, what a fine part you had in Hernani. The room looked beautiful, oh, so beautiful. There were festoons of green leaves, with paper flowers at intervals everywhere. Then there were little lusters hung about with gold cord. A white piece of red velvet carpet was laid down from the door to Monseigneur's armchair, upon which were two cushions of red velvet with gold fringe. I thought all these horrors very fine, very beautiful. The concert began, and it seemed to me that everything went very well. Monseigneur, however, could not help smiling at the sight of César, and it was he who led the applause when the dog died. It was César, in fact, who had the greatest success, but we were nevertheless sent forth to appear before Monseigneur Cibourg. He was certainly the kindest and most charming of prelates, and on this occasion he gave to each of us a consecrated medal. 
When my turn came, he took my hand in his and said, Is it you, my child, who are not baptized, is it not? Yes, Reverend Father, yes, Monseigneur, I replied in confusion. She is to be baptized this spring, said the Mother Superior. Her father is coming back specially from a very distant country. She and Monseigneur then said a few words to each other in a very low voice. Very well, if I can, I will come again for the ceremony, said the Archbishop aloud. I was trembling with emotion and pride as I kissed the old man's ring and then ran away to the dormitory and cried for a long time. I was found there later on, fast asleep from exhaustion. From that day forth, I was a better child, more studious and less violent. In my fits of anger, I was calmed by the mention of Monseigneur Sibourg's name and reminded of his promise to come for my baptism. Alas, I was not destined to have that great joy. One morning in January, when we were all assembled in the chapel for Mass, I was surprised and had a foreboding of coming evil when I saw the Abbé Liturgy go up into the pulpit before commencing the Mass. He was very pale, and I turned instinctively to look at the Mother Superior. She was seated in her regular place. The almoner then began, in a voice broken with emotion, to tell us of the murder of Monseigneur Sibourg. Murdered! A thrill of horror went through us, and a hundred stifled cries, forming one great sob, drowned for an instant the priest's voice. Murdered! The words seemed to sting me personally even more than the others. Had I not been for one instant the favourite of the kind old man? It was as though the murderer, Verger, had struck at me, too, in my grateful love for the prelate, in my little fame of which he had now robbed me. I burst into sobs, and the organ accompanying the prayer for the dead increased my grief, which became so intense that I fainted. It was from this moment that I was taken with an ardent love for mysticism. It was fortified by the religious exercises, the dramatic effort of our worship, and the gentle encouragement, both fervent and sincere, of those who were educating me. They were very fond of me, and I adored them, so that even now the very memory of them, fascinating and restful as it is, thrills me with affection. The time appointed for my baptism drew near, and I grew more and more excitable. My nervous attacks were more and more frequent, fits of tears for no reason at all, and fits of terror without any cause. Everything seemed to take strange proportions as far as I was concerned. One day, one of my little friends dropped a doll that I had lent her, for I played with dolls until I was over thirteen. I began to tremble all over as I adored that doll which had been given to me by my father, "'You have broken my doll's head, you naughty girl!' I exclaimed. "'You have hurt my father!' I would not eat anything afterwards, and in the night I woke up in a great perspiration, with haggard eyes sobbing, "'Papa is dead! Papa is dead!' Three days later my mother came. She asked to see me in the parlour, and making me stand in front of her, she said, "'My poor little girl, I have something to tell you that will cause you great sorrow. Papa is dead!' I know, I said, I know, and the expression in my eyes, my mother frequently told me afterwards, was such that she trembled a long time for my reason. I was very sad and not at all well. I refused to learn anything except the catechism and scripture, and I wanted to be a nun. My mother begged to have my two sisters baptized with me, Jeanne, who was then six years old, and Regina, who was not three, but who had been taken as a boarder at the convent, with the idea that her presence might cheer me a little. I was isolated for a week before my baptism, and for a week afterwards, as I was to be confirmed the week after my baptism. My mother, Aunt Rosine Berent, and Aunt Henriette Faure, my godfather, Régis Lavallée, Monsieur Leprin, Jeanne's godfather, and General Paulet, Regina's godfather, the godmothers of my two sisters and my various cousins all came and revolutionized the convent. My mother and my aunts were in fashionable morning attire. Aunt Rosine had put a spray of lilac in her bonnet to enliven her mourning, as she said. It was a strange expression, but I have certainly heard it since used by other people besides her. 
I had never before felt so far away from all these people who had come there on my account. I adored my mother, but with a touching and fervent desire to leave her, never to see her again, to sacrifice her to God. As to the others, I did not see them. I was very grave and rather moody. A short time previously, a nun had taken the veil at the convent, and I could think of nothing else. This baptismal ceremony was the prelude to my dream. I could see myself like the novice who had just been admitted as a nun. I pictured myself lying down on the ground, covered over with a heavy black cloth with its white cross and four massive candlesticks placed at the four corners of the cloth. And I planned to die under this cloth. How I was to do this I did not know. I did not think of killing myself as I knew that would be a crime. But I made up my mind to die like this, and my ideas galloped along so that I saw in my imagination the horror of the sisters and heard the cries of the pupils and was delighted at the emotion which I had caused. After the baptismal ceremony, my mother wished to take me away with her. She had rented a small house with a garden in the Boulevard de la Reine at Versailles for my holidays, and she had decorated it with flowers for this fête day, as she wanted to celebrate the baptism of her three children. She was very gently told that, as I was to be confirmed in a week's time, I was not to be isolated until then. My mother cried, and I can remember now to my sorrow that it did not make it sad to see her tears, but quite the contrary. When everyone had gone and I went into the little cell in which I had been living for the last week and was to live for another week, I fell on my knees in a state of exaltation and offered up to God my mother's sorrow. You saw, Lord God, that Mama cried. It did not affect me. Poor child that I was, I imagined in my wild exaggeration of everything that what was expected from me was the renunciation of all affection, devotion and pity. The following day, Mother St. Sophie lectured me gently about my wrong comprehension of religious duties, and she told me that when once I was confirmed, she should give me a fortnight's holiday to go and make my mother forget her sorrow and disappointment. My confirmation took place with the same pompous ceremonial. All the pupils, dressed in white, carried wax tapers. For the whole week I had refused to eat, I was pale and had grown thinner, and my eyes looked larger from my perpetual transport, for I went to extremes in everything. Baron Larré, who came with my mother to my confirmation, begged for me to have a month's holiday to recruit, and this was accorded. Accordingly we started, my mother, Madame Gérard, her son Ernest, my sister Jeanne and I, for Coteret in the Pyrenees. The movement, the packing of the trunks, parcels and packages, the railway, the diligence, the scenery, the crowds, and the general disturbance cured me and my nerves and my mysticism. I clapped my hands, laughed aloud, flung myself on Mama, and nearly stifled her with kisses. I sang hymns at the top of my voice. I was hungry and thirsty, so I ate, drank, and in a word, lived. End of chapter 2 Read by Claudia Caldi Section 3 of Memories of My Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Jessica Hendra Memories of My Life by Sarah Bernhardt. Section 3. A Prank and Its Results. Coutry, at that time, was not what it is now. It was an abominable but charming little hole of a place, with plenty of verdure, very few houses, and a great many huts belonging to the mountain people. There were plenty of donkeys to be hired that took us up the mountains by extraordinary paths. I adore the sea and the plain, but I care neither for mountains nor for forests. Mountains seem to crush me, and forests to stifle me. I must, at any cost, have the horizon stretching out as far as the eye can see, and skies to dream about. I wanted to go up the mountains, so that they should lose their crushing effect, 
and consequently we went up always higher and higher. Mamma used to stay at home with her sweet friend, Madame Girard. She used to read novels while Madame Girard embroidered. They would sit there together without speaking, each dreaming her own dream, seeing it fade away and beginning it over again. The old servant, Marguerite, was the only domestic Mamma had brought with her, and she used to accompany us, and was always gay and daring. She always knew how to make the men laugh with speeches, the sense and crudeness of which I did not understand until much later. She was the life of the party always. As she had been with us from the time we were born, she was very familiar, and sometimes objectionably so. I would not let her have her own way with me, though, and I used to answer her back in the most cutting manner. She would take her revenge in the evening by giving us a dish of sweets for dinner that I did not like. I began to look better for the change, and although still very religious, my mysticism was growing calmer. As I could not exist, however, without a passion of some kind, I began to get very fond of the goats, and I asked Mamma quite seriously whether I might become a goat herd. I would rather you were that than a nun, she replied, and then she added, we will talk about it later on. Every day I brought down with me from the mountain another little kid, and we already had seven when my mother interfered and put a stop to my zeal. Finally it was time to return to the convent. My holiday was over, and I was quite well again. I was to go back to work once more. I accepted the situation willingly, to the great surprise of Mamma, who loved travelling, but detested the actual moving from one place to another. I was delighted at the idea of the repacking of the parcels and trunks, of being seated in things that moved along, of seeing again all the villages, towns, people, and trees that changed all the time. I wanted to take my goats with me, but my mother very positively refused. You are mad, she exclaimed. Seven goats in a train and in a carriage? Where could you put them? No, a hundred times no. She finally consented to my taking two of them, and a blackbird that one of the mountaineers had given me, and so we returned to the convent. I was received there with such sincere joy that I felt very happy again immediately. I was allowed to keep my two goats there, and to have them out at playtime. We had great fun with them. They used to bunt us, and we used to bunt them, and we laughed, frolicked, and were very foolish. And yet I was nearly fourteen at this time but very puny and childish. I stayed at the convent another ten months without learning anything more. The idea of becoming a nun always haunted me, but I was no longer a mystic. My godfather looked upon me as the greatest dunce. I worked, though, during the holidays, and I used to have lessons with Sophie Croisette, who lived near to our country house. This gave a slight impetus to me in my studies, but it was only slight. Sophie was very gay, and what we liked best was to go to the museum where her sister Pauline, who was later on to become Madame Carlos Dorin, was copying pictures by the great masters. Pauline was as cold and calm as Sophie was charming, talkative, and noisy. Pauline Croisette was beautiful, but I liked Sophie better. She was more gracious and pretty. Madame Croisette, their mother, always seemed sad and resigned. She had given up her career very early. She had been a dancer at the opera in St. Petersburg, and had been very much adored and flattered and spoiled. I fancy it was the birth of Sophie that had compelled her to leave the stage. Her money, then, had been injudiciously invested, and she had been ruined. She was very distinguished-looking. Her face had a kind expression. There was an infinite melancholy about her, and people were instinctively drawn toward her. Mamma had made her acquaintance while listening to the music in the park at Versailles, and for some time we saw a great deal of her. Sophie and I had some fine games in that magnificent park. Our greatest joy, though, was to go to Madame Masson's in the Rue de la Guerre. Madame Masson had a curiosity shop. Her daughter, Cécile, was a perfect little beauty. We three used to delight in changing the tickets on the vases, snuff-boxes, fans, and jewels. And then, when poor Monsieur Masson came back with a rich customer, for Masson, the antiquary, enjoyed a world-wide reputation, Sophie and I used to hide so that we should see his fury. Cécile, with an innocent air, 
would be helping her mother and glancing slyly at us from time to time. The whirl of life separated me brusquely from all these people whom I loved, and an incident, trivial in itself, caused me to leave the convent earlier than my mother wished. It was a fete day, and we had two hours for recreation. We were marching in procession along the wall which skirts the railway on the left bank of the Seine, and as we were burying my pet lizard, we were chanting the De Profundis. About twenty of my little playfellows were following me, when suddenly a soldier's cap fell at my feet. "'What's that?' called out one of the girls. "'A soldier's cap! Did it come from over the wall? Yes, yes, listen, there's a quarrel going on.' We were suddenly silent, listening with all our ears. "'Don't be stupid. It's idiotic. It's the Grand Champ's convent. How am I going to get my cap back?' These were the words we overheard. And then, as a soldier suddenly appeared astride our wall, there were shrieks from the terrified children and angry exclamations from the nuns. In a second, we were all about twenty yards away from the wall, like a group of frightened sparrows, flying off to land a little farther away, inquisitive and very much on the alert. "'Have you seen my cap, young ladies?' called out the unfortunate soldier in a beseeching tone. "'No, no!' I cried, hiding it behind my back. "'Oh, no!' echoed the other girls with peals of laughter, and in the most tormenting, insolent, jeering way we continued shouting, "'No, no!' running backward all the time in reply to the sisters who, veiled and hidden behind the trees, were in despair. We were only a few yards from the huge gymnasium. I climbed up, breathless at full speed, and reached the wide plank at the top. When there, I unfastened the rope ladder." but as I could not get the wooden ladder up to me by which I had mounted, I unfastened the rings and banged it down so that it broke, making a great noise. I then stood up wickedly triumphant on the plank, calling out, Here it is, your cap, but you won't get it now. I put it on my head and walked up and down as no one could get to me there. I suppose my first idea had been to have a little fun, but the girls had laughed and clapped, and my strength had held out better than I had hoped, so that my head was turned, and nothing could stop me then. The young soldier was furious. He jumped down from the wall and rushed in my direction, pushing the girls out of his way. The sisters, beside themselves, ran to the house calling for help. The chaplain, the mother superior, Père Lachère, and everyone else came running out. I believe this soldier swore like a trooper, and it was really quite excusable. Mother Superior Sophie from below besought me to come down and give up the cap. The soldier tried to get up to me by means of the trapeze, but on seeing this I quickly drew up the knotted rope. His useless efforts delighted all the pupils, whom the sisters had in vain tried to send away. Finally the sister who was doorkeeper sounded the alarm bell, and five minutes later the soldiers from the Sartori barracks arrived, thinking that a fire had broken out. When the officer in command was told what was the matter, he sent back his men and asked to see the Mother Superior. He was brought to Mother Superior Sophie, whom he found at the foot of the gymnasium, crying with shame and impotence. He ordered the soldier to return immediately to the barracks. He obeyed after clenching his fist at me, but on looking up he could not help laughing. His cap came down to my eyes, and was only kept back by my ears, which were bent, to prevent it from covering my face. I was furious, and wildly excited with the turn my joke had taken. "'There it is! Your cap!' I called out, and flung it violently over the wall, which skirted the gymnasium and formed the boundary to the cemetery. "'Oh, the young plague!' muttered the officer, and then, apologizing to the nuns, he saluted them and went away, accompanied by Père Lachère. As for me, I felt like a fox after having its tail cut. I refused to come down immediately. I shall come down when everyone has gone away, I announced. All the girls received punishments, and I was left alone. The sun set, and the silence then terrified me, looking, as I did, out on the cemetery. The dark trees took mournful or threatening shapes. The moisture from the wood fell like a mantle over my shoulders, and seemed to get heavier every moment. I felt abandoned by everyone, and I began to cry. I was angry with myself, with the soldier, with Mother Superior Sophie, with the pupils who had excited me by their laughter. 
with the officer who had humiliated me, and with the sister who had sounded the alarm bell. Then I began to think about getting down the rope ladder, which I had pulled up on the plank. Very clumsily, trembling with fear at the least sound, listening eagerly all the time, and with eyes looking to the right and left, I was a long time unhooking it, being very much afraid. Finally I managed to unroll it, and I was just about to put my foot on the first rung when the barking of Caesar alarmed me. He was tearing along from the wood. The sight of the dark figure on the gymnasium appeared to the faithful dog to bode no good. He was furious and began to scratch the thick wooden uprights. "'Why, Caesar, don't you know your friend?' I said very gently. He growled in reply, and in a louder voice I said, "'Fie, Caesar, bad Caesar, you ought to be ashamed. Fancy barking at your friend.' He now began to howl, and I was seized with terror. I pulled the ladder up again and sat down at the top, Caesar lay down at the bottom of the gymnasium, his tail straight out, his ears pricked up, his coat bristling, growling in a sullen way. I appealed to the Holy Virgin to help me. I prayed fervently, vowed to say three aves, three credos, and three paters as well every day. When I was a little calmer, I called out in a subdued voice, Caesar, my dear Caesar, my beautiful Caesar, you know I am the angel Raphael. Ah, uh, much Caesar cared for him. He considered my presence quite alone at so late an hour in the garden and on the gymnasium quite incomprehensible. Why was I not in the refectory? Poor Caesar. He went on growling, and I was getting very hungry, and began to think things were most unjust. It was true that I had been to blame for taking the soldier's cap, but after all he had begun it all. Why had he thrown his cap over the wall? My imagination now came to my aid, and in the end I began to look upon myself as a martyr. I had been left to the dog, and he would eat me. I was terrified at the dead people behind me, and everyone knew I was very nervous. My chest, too, was delicate, and there I was, exposed to the biting cold, with no protection whatever. I began to think about Mother Superior Sophie, who evidently no longer cared for me as she was deserting me so cruelly. I lay with my face downward on the plank, and gave myself up to the wildest despair, calling my mother, my father, and Mother Superior Sophie, sobbing, wishing I could die there and then. Between my sobs I suddenly heard my name pronounced by a gentle voice. I got up, and peering through the gloom, caught a glimpse of my beloved Mother Superior Sophie. She was there, the dear saint, and had never left her rebellious child. Concealed behind the statue of St. Augustine, she had been praying while awaiting the end of this crisis, which in her simplicity she had believed might prove fatal to my reason, and perhaps to my salvation. She had sent everyone away, and remained there alone, and she too had not dined. I came down and threw myself repentant and wretched into her motherly arms. She did not say a word to me about the horrible incident, but took me quickly back to the convent. I was all damp, with the icy evening dew, my cheeks were feverish, and my hands and feet frozen. I had an attack of pleurisy after this, and was twenty-three days between life and death. Mother Superior Sophie never left me an instant. The sweet mother blamed herself for my illness declaring as she beat her breast that she had left me outside too long. "'It's my fault! It's my fault!' she kept exclaiming. My Aunt Fowler came to see me nearly every day. My mother was in Scotland and came back by short stages. My Aunt Rosine was at Baden-Baden and was ruining the whole family. "'I am coming back!' she kept writing from time to time, when she wrote to ask how I was. Dr. de Espang and Dr. Monod who had been called in for a consultation, did not think there was any hope. Baron Larray, who was very fond of me, came often. He had a certain influence over me, and I willingly obeyed him. My mother arrived a short time before my convalescence, and did not leave me again. As soon as I could be moved, she took me to Paris, promising to send me back to the convent as soon as I was quite well. It was forever, though, that I had left my dear convent. But it was not forever that I left Mother Superior Sophie. I seemed to take something of her away with me. For a long time she made part of my life, and even today, when she has been dead for years, the recollection of her brings back to me the simple thoughts of former days, 
and makes the flowers of youth to bloom again. Life for me now began in earnest. Cloister existence is one of unbroken sameness for all. There may be a hundred or a thousand individuals there, but everyone lives a life which is the same and the only one for all. The rumor of the outside world dies away at the heavy cloister gate. The sole ambition is to sing more loudly than the others at Vespers, to take a little more of the form, to be at the end of the table, to be on the list of honor. When I was told that I was not to go back to the convent, it was to me as though I was to be thrown into the sea when I could not swim. I besought my godfather to let me go back. The dowry left to me by my father was ample enough for the dowry of a nun. I wanted to take the veil. Very well, replied my godfather. You can take the veil in two years' time, but not before. In the meantime, learn all that you do not yet know, and that means everything, from the governess your mother has chosen for you. That very day, an elderly, unmarried lady with soft, gray, gentle eyes came and took possession of my life my mind and my conscience for eight hours every day. Her name was Mademoiselle de Brabender, and she had educated a grand duchess in Russia. She had a sweet voice, an enormous sandy mustache, a grotesque nose, but a way of walking, of expressing herself, and of bowing, which simply commanded all deference. She lived at the convent in Rue Notre-Dame-des-Champs, and this was why, in spite of my mother's entreaties, she refused to come and live with us. She soon won my affection, and I learned quite easily with her everything that she wanted me to learn. I worked eagerly, for my dream was to return to the convent, not as a pupil, but as a teaching sister. End of Chapter 4 of Memories of My Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memories of My Life by Sarah Bernard Chapter 4 In Family Council Assembled I arose one September morning, my heart leaping with some remote joy. It was eight o'clock. I pressed my forehead against the window panes and gazed out looking at I know not what. I had been roused with a start in the midst of some fine dream, and I had rushed toward the light in the hope of finding in the infinite space of the grey sky the luminous point that would explain my anxious and blissful expectation. Expectation of what? I could not have answered that question then any more than I can now after much reflection. I was on the eve of my fifteenth birthday, and I was in a state of expectation as to the future of my life. That particular morning seemed to me to be the precursor of a new era. I was not mistaken, for on that September day my fate was settled for me. Hypnotized by what was taking place in my mind, I remained with my forehead pressed against the window pane, gazing through the halo of vapour formed by my breath at houses, palaces, carriages, jewels and pearls passing along in front of me. Oh, what a number of pearls there were! There were princes and kings too. Yes, I could even see kings. Oh, how fast one's imagination travels, and its enemy, reason, always allows it to roam on alone. In my fancy, I proudly rejected the princes, I rejected the kings, refused the pearls and the palaces, and declared that I was going to be a nun, for in the infinite grey sky I had caught a glimpse of the convent of Grand Champ, of my wide bedroom, and of the small lamp that swung to and fro above the little virgin all decorated with flowers. The king offered me a throne, but I preferred the throne of our mother superior, and I entertained a vague ambition to occupy it some far-off day in the distant future. The king was heartbroken and dying of despair. Yes, mon dieu, I preferred to the pearls that were offered me by princes, the pearls of the rosary I was telling with my fingers, and no costume could compete in my mind with a black barrage veil that fell like a soft shadow over the snowy white cambric that encircled the beloved faces of the nuns of Grand Champ. 
I do not know how long I had been dreaming thus when I heard my mother's voice asking our old servant, Marguerite, if I were awake. With one bound I was back in bed, and I buried my face under the sheet. Mamma half opened the door very gently, and I pretended to wake up. How lazy you are today, she said. I kissed her and answered in a coaxing tone. It is Thursday and I have no music lesson. And are you glad? she asked. Oh, yes, I replied promptly. My mother frowned. She adored music and I hated the piano. She was so fond of music that although she was then about thirty, she took lessons herself in order to encourage me to practice. What horrible torture it was! I used, very wickedly, to do my utmost to set my mother and my music mistress at variance. They were both of them as short-sighted as possible. When my mother had practiced a new piece three or four days, she knew it by heart, and played it fairly well, to the astonishment of Mademoiselle Clarisse, my insufferable old teacher, who held the music in her hand and read every note with her nose nearly touching the page. One day I heard with joy a quarrel beginning between Mamma and this disagreeable Mademoiselle Clarisse. There, that's a quaver. No, there's no quaver. This is flat. No, you forget the sharp. How absurd you are, Mademoiselle, added my mother, perfectly furious. A few minutes later my mother went to her room and Mademoiselle Clarisse departed, muttering as she left. As for me, I was choking with laughter in my bedroom, for one of my cousins, who was a good musician, had helped me to add sharps, flats and quavers, and we had done it with such care that even a trained eye would have had difficulty in discerning the fraud immediately. As Mademoiselle Clarisse had been sent off, I had no lesson that day. Mamma gazed at me a long time with her mysterious eyes, the most beautiful eyes I have ever seen in my life, and then she said, speaking very slowly, After luncheon there is to be a family council. I felt myself turning pale. All right, I answered. What frock am I to put on, Mamma? I said this merely for the sake of saying something and to keep myself from crying. Put your blue silk on. You look more staid in that. Just at this moment, my sister Jeanne opened the door boisterously and with a burst of laughter jumped on my bed and slipping under the sheets called out, I'm there. Marguerite had followed her into the room, panting and scolding. The child had escaped from her just as she was about to bathe her and had announced that she was going into my bed. Jeanne's mirth at this moment, which I felt was a very serious one for me, made me burst out crying and sobbing. My mother, not understanding the reason of this grief, shrugged her shoulders, told Marguerite to fetch Jeanne's slippers, and taking the little bare feet in her hands, kissed them tenderly. I sobbed more bitterly than ever. It was very evident that Mamma loved my sister more than me, and this preference, which did not trouble me ordinarily, hurt me sorely now. Mamma went away quite out of patience with me. I fell asleep in order to forget, and was roused by Marguerite, who helped me to dress, as otherwise I should have been late for luncheon. The guests that day were Aunt Rosine, Mademoiselle de Brabander, my governess, a charming creature whom I have always regretted, my godfather, and the Duc de Morny, a great friend of my godfather and of my mother. The luncheon was a mournful meal for me, as I was thinking all the time about the family council. Mademoiselle de Brabander, in her gentle way, and with her affectionate words, insisted on my eating. My sister burst out laughing when she looked at me. Your eyes are as little as that, she said, putting her small thumb on the tip of her forefinger, and it serves you right because you've been crying, and Mamma doesn't like anyone to cry, do you, Mamma? What have you been crying about? asked the Duc de Morny. I did not answer, in spite of the friendly nudge Mademoiselle de Brabander gave me with her sharp elbow. The Duc de Morny always awed me a little. He was gentle and kind, but he was a great quiz. 
I knew, too, that he occupied a high place at court, and that my family considered his friendship a great honour, because I told her that after luncheon there was to be a family council on her behalf, said my mother, speaking slowly. At times it seems to me that she's quite idiotic. She quite disheartens me. Come, come, exclaimed my godfather, and Aunt Rosine said something in English to the Duc de Montmy, which made him smile shrewdly under his fine moustache. Mademoiselle de Brabander scolded me in a low voice, and her scoldings were like words from heaven. When at last luncheon was over, Mamma told me, as she passed, to pour the coffee. Marguerite helped me to arrange the cups, and I went into the drawing-room. Maître Gilles, the notary from Havre, whom I detested, was already there. He represented the family of my father, who had died at Pisa in a way which had never been explained, but which seemed mysterious. My childish hatred was instinctive, and I learned later on that this man had been my father's bitter enemy. He was very, very ugly, this notary. His whole face seemed to have moved up higher. It was as though he had been hanging by his hair for a long time, and his eyes, his mouth, his cheeks, and his nose had got into the habit of trying to reach the back of his head. He ought to have had a joyful expression, as so many of his features turned up, but instead of this, his face was smooth and sinister-looking. He had red hair planted on his head like couch grass, and on his nose he wore a pair of gold-rimmed spectacles. Oh, the horrible man! What a torturing nightmare the very memory of him is! For he was the evil genius of my father, and his hatred now pursued me. My poor grandmother, since the death of my father, she never went out, but spent her time mourning the loss of her beloved son, who had died so young. She had absolute faith in this man, who, besides, was the executor of my father's will. He had the control of the money that my dear father had left me. I was not to touch it until the day of my marriage, but my mother was to use the interest for my education. My uncle Felix Faure was also there, seated near the fireplace, buried in an armchair. Monsieur Medieu pulled out his watch in a querulous way. He was an old friend of the family, and he always called me ma fille, which annoyed me greatly, as did his familiarity. He considered me stupid, and when I handed him his coffee, he said in a jeering tone, "'And it is for you, Mafia, that so many honest people have been hindered in their work. We have plenty of other things to attend to, I can assure you, than to discuss the fate of a little brat like you. Ah, oh, if it had been her sister, there would have been no difficulty.' and with his benumbed fingers he patted Jeanne's head, as she remained on the floor plating the fringe of the sofa upon which he was seated. When the coffee was taken, the cups carried away, and my sister also, there was a short silence. The Duc de Morny rose to take his leave, but my mother begged him to stay. He will be able to advise us, she urged, and the Duke took his seat again near my aunt, with whom it seemed to me he was carrying on a slight flirtation. Mama had moved nearer to the window, her embroidery frame in front of her, and her beautiful clear-cut profile showing to advantage against the light. She looked as though she had nothing to do with what was about to be discussed. The hideous notary was standing up by the chimney-piece, and my uncle had drawn me near to him. My godfather Regis seemed to be the exact counterpart of Mr. Medieu. They both of them had the same bourgeois mind, and were equally stubborn and obstinate. They were both devoted to whist and good wine, and they both agreed that I was thin enough for a scarecrow. The door opened, and a pale, dark-haired woman entered, a most poetical-looking and charming creature. It was Madame Gerard, the lady of the upstairs flat, as Marguerite always called her. My mother had made friends with her in a rather patronizing way, certainly, but Madame Gerard was devoted to me and endured the little slights to which she was treated very patiently for my sake. She was tall and slender as a lath, very compliant and demure. 
She had come down without a hat. She was wearing an indoor gown of Antienne, with a design of little brown leaves. Monsieur Madieu muttered something, I did not catch what. The abominable notary made a very curt bow to Madame Gerard. The Duc de Montny was very gracious, for the newcomer was so pretty. My godfather merely bent his head, as Madame Gerard was nothing to him. Aunt Rosine glanced at her from head to foot. Mademoiselle de Brabander shook hands cordially with her, for Madame Gerard was fond of me. My uncle, Felix Faure, gave her a chair and asked her to sit down, and then inquired in a kindly way about her husband, a servant, with whom my uncle collaborated sometimes for his book, The Life of Saint Louis. Mama had merely glanced across the room without raising her head, for Madame Gerard did not prefer my sister to me. "'Well, as we have come here on account of this child,' said my godfather, "'we must begin and discuss what is to be done with her.' I began to tremble and drew closer to Mademoiselle de Brabander and to ma petite dame, as I had always called Madame Gerard from my infancy. They each took my hand by way of encouraging me. "'Yes,' continued Monsieur Medier with a laugh, "'it appears you want to be a nun.' Oh, "'Indeed,' said the Duc de Morny to Aunt Rosine. "'Shh!' She retorted with a laugh. Mama sighed and held her wools up close to her eyes to match them. You have to be rich, though, to enter a convent, grunted the Havre notary, and you have not a sou. I leaned toward Mademoiselle de Brabander and whispered, I have the money that Papa left. The horrid man overheard. Your father left some money to get you married, he said. Well, then I'll marry the bon Dieu. I answered, and my voice was quite resolute now. I turned very red, and for the second time in my life I felt a desire and a strong inclination to fight for myself. I had no more fear, as everyone had gone too far and provoked me too much. I slipped away from my two kind friends and advanced toward the other group. I will be a nun, I will, I exclaimed. I know that Papa left me some money so that I should be married, and I know that the nuns marry the Saviour. Mamma says she does not care. It is all the same to her, so that it won't be vexing her at all, and they love me better at the convent than you do here. My dear child, said my uncle, drawing me toward him, your religious vocation appears to me to be more a wish to love. And to be loved, murmured Madame Gerard in a very low voice. Everyone glanced at Mama, who shrugged her shoulders slightly. It seemed to me as though the glance they all gave her was a reproachful one. I went across to her, and throwing my arms round her neck, said, You don't mind my being a nun, do you? It won't make you unhappy, will it? Mama stroked my hair, of which she was very proud. Yes, it would make me unhappy. You know very well that after your sister, I love you better than anyone else in the world. She said this very slowly in a gentle voice. It was like the sound of a little waterfall, as it flows down, babbling and clear from the mountain, dragging with it the gravel, and gradually increasing in volume with the thawed snow, until it sweeps along rocks and trees in its course. This was the effect my mother's clear, drawling voice had upon me at that moment. I rushed back impulsively to the others, who were all speechless at this unexpected and spontaneous burst of confidence. I went from one to the other, explaining my decision, and giving reasons which were certainly no reasons at all. I did my utmost to get someone to support me in the matter. Finally, the Duc de Monny was bored and rose to go. Do you know what you ought to do with this child? he said. You ought to send her to the conservatoire. He then patted my cheek, kissed my aunt's hand, and bowed to all the others. As he bent over my mother's hand, I heard him say to her, You would have made a bad diplomatist, but take my advice and send her to the conservatoire. He then took his departure and gazed at everyone in perfect anguish. I went up to my governess, Mademoiselle de Plabander. Her lips were firmly pressed together, and she looked shocked, just as she did sometimes when my godfather told some story that she did not approve of at table. My uncle, Felix Faure, was looking at the floor in an absent-minded way. The notary had a spiteful look in his eyes. My aunt was holding forth in a very excited manner. Monsieur Meudieu kept shaking his head and muttering, 
Perhaps. Yes. Who knows? Mm. Mm. Madame Gerard was very pale and sad, as she looked at me with infinite tenderness. What could be this conservatoire? The word uttered so carelessly seemed to have entirely disturbed the equanimity of all present. Each one of them seemed to me to have a different impression about it, but none looked pleased. Suddenly, in the midst of the general embarrassment, my godfather exclaimed brutally, She is too thin to make an actress. I won't be an actress, I exclaimed. Don't know what an actress is, said my aunt. Oh, yes, I do. Rochelle is an actress. You know Rochelle? asked Mama, getting up. Oh, yes. She came to the convent once to see little Adèle Sarboni. She went all over the convent and into the garden, and she had to sit down because she could not get her breath. They fetched her something to bring her round, and she was so pale, oh, so pale. I was very sorry for her, and Sister Apolline told me that what she did was killing her, for she was an actress. And so I won't be an actress, I won't. I had said all this in a breath, with my cheeks on fire and my voice hard. I remembered all that Sister Apolline had told me, and Mother Saint Sophie too. I remembered also that when Rachel had gone out of the garden, looking very pale and holding a lady's arm for support, a little girl had put her tongue out at her. I did not want people to put out their tongues at me when I was grown up. Conservatoire? That word alarmed me. The Duke had wanted me to be an actress, and he had now gone away so that I could not talk things over with him. He went away smiling and tranquil after caressing me in the usual friendly way. He had gone, caring little about the scraggy child whose future had been discussed. Send her to the conservatoire. That sentence uttered so carelessly had come like a bomb into my life. I, the dreamy child, who that morning was ready to repulse princes and kings. I, whose trembling fingers had that morning told over chaplets of dreams who only a few hours ago had felt my heart beating with emotion hitherto unknown to me. I, who had got expecting some great event to take place, was to see everything disappear, thanks to that phrase as heavy as lead and as deadly as a bullet, send her to the conservatoire. And I divined that this phrase was to be the signpost of my life. All those people had gathered together at the turning of the crossroads, send her to the conservatoire, I wanted to be a nun, and this was considered absurd, idiotic, unreasonable. Send her to the conservatoire had opened out a field for discussion, the horizon of the future. My uncle, Felix Faure, and Mademoiselle Bramander were the only ones against this idea. They tried in vain to make my mother understand that with the hundred thousand francs that my father had left me, I might marry. But my mother had replied that I had declared I had a horror of marriage, and that I should wait until I was of age to go into a convent. Under these conditions, she said, Sarah will never have her father's money. No, certainly not, put in the notary. Then, continued my mother, she would enter the convent as a servant, and I will not have that. My money is an annuity, so that I cannot leave anything to my children. I therefore want them to have a career of their own. My mother was now exhausted with so much talking, and lay back in an armchair. I got very much excited, and my mother asked me to go away. Mademoiselle Brabander and Madame Gerard were arguing in a low voice, and I thought of the aristocratic man who had just left us. I was very angry with him, for this idea of the conservatoire was his. Mademoiselle Brabander tried to console me. Madame Gerard said that this career had its advantages, Mademoiselle Brabander considered that the convent would have a great fascination for so dream a nature as mine. The latter was very religious and a great church-goer. Ma petite dame was a pagan in the purest acceptation of that word, and yet the two women got home very well together, thanks to their affectionate devotion to me. Madame Gerard adored the proud rebelliousness of my nature, my pretty face, and the slenderness of my figure. Mademoiselle de Brabander was touched by my delicate health. She endeavoured to comfort me when I was jealous for not being loved as much as my sister. But what she liked the best about me was my voice. She always declared that my voice was modulated for prayers, and my delight in the convent appeared to her quite natural. She loved me with a gentle, pious affection, and Madame Gerard loved me with bursts of paganism. These two women, whose memory is still dear to me, 
shared me between them and made the best of my good qualities and my faults. I certainly owed to both of them this study of myself and the vision I have of myself. The day was destined to end in the strangest of fashions. Madame Gerard had gone back to her apartment upstairs, and I was lying on a little straw armchair which was the most ornamental piece of furniture in my room. I felt very drowsy and was holding Mademoiselle de Brabandère's hand in mine, when the door opened and my aunt entered, followed by my mother. I can see them now, my aunt in her dress of pure silk trimmed with fur, her brown velvet hat tied under her chin with long white strings, and Mama, who had taken off her dress and put on a white woolen dressing gown. She always detested keeping on her dress in the house and I understood by her change of costume that everyone else had gone, and that my aunt was ready to leave. I got up from my armchair, but Mamma made me sit down again. Rest yourself thoroughly, she said, for we are going to take you to the theatre this evening, to the Francais. I felt sure that this was just a bait, and that it would not show any sign of pleasure, although in my heart I was delighted at the idea of going to the Francais. The only theatre I knew anything of was the Robert Houdin, to which I was taken sometimes with my sister, and I fancied that it was for her benefit we went, as I was really too old to care for that kind of performance. Will you come with us? Mamma said, turning to Mademoiselle de Brabandère. Willingly, madame, replied this dear creature. I will go home and change my dress. My aunt laughed at my sullen looks. A little fraud she said as she went away you are hiding your delight ah well you will see some actress to-night is rachel going to act i asked oh no she is ill my aunt kissed me and went away saying she would see me again later on and my mother followed her out of the room mademoiselle de brabandère then hurriedly prepared to leave me she had to go home to dress and to tell them that she would not be in until quite late, for in her convent special permission had to be obtained when one wished to be out later than ten at night. When I was alone, I swung myself backward and forward in my armchair, which by the way was anything but a rocking chair. I began to think, and for the first time in my life my critical comprehension came to my aid. And so all these serious people had been inconvenienced. The notary fetched from Havre. My uncle dragged away from working at his book. The old bachelor, Monsieur Medieu, disturbed in his habits and customs. My godfather kept away from the stock exchange. And that aristocratic and sceptical Duc de Mouny ramped up for two hours in the midst of our bourgeois surroundings. And all to end in this decision, she shall be taken to the theatre, I do not know what part my uncle had taken in this burlesque plan, but I doubt whether it was to his taste. All the same, I was glad to go to the theatre. It made me feel more important. That morning on waking up, I was quite a child, and now events had taken place which had transformed me into a young girl. I had been discussed by everyone, and I had expressed my wishes, without any result, certainly, but all the same I had expressed them, and now it was deemed necessary to humour indulge me in order to win me over. They could not force me into agreeing to what they wanted me to do. My consent was necessary, and I felt so joyful and so proud about it that I was quite touched and almost ready to yield. However, I said to myself that it would be better to hold my own and let them ask me again. After dinner, we all squeezed into a cab, Mama, my godfather, Mademoiselle de Brabander and I. My godfather made me a present of some white gloves. On mounting the steps at the Théâtre Français, I trod on a lady's dress. She turned round and called me a stupid child. I moved back hastily and came into collision with a very stout old gentleman, who gave me a rough push forward. When once we were all installed in a box facing the stage, Mum and I in the first row with Mademoiselle de Bravander behind me, I felt more reassured. I was close against the partition of the box, and I could feel Mademoiselle de Brabandère's sharp knees through the velvet of my chair. This gave me confidence, and I leaned against the back of the chair purposely to feel the support of those two knees. When the curtain slowly rose, I thought I should have fainted. 
It was as though the curtain of my future life were being raised. Those columns, Britannicus was being played, were to be my palaces. The friezes above were to be my skies, and those boards were to bend under my frail weight. I heard nothing of Britannicus, for I was far, far away, at Grand Champ in my dormitory there. Well, what do you think of it? asked my godfather when the curtain fell. I did not answer, and he laid his hand on my head and turned my face round toward him. I was crying, big tears rolling slowly down my cheeks, those tears that come without any sobs and without any hope of ever ceasing. My godfather shrugged his shoulders, and getting up, left the box, banging the door after him. Mama, losing all patience with me, proceeded to review the house through the opera glass, Mademoiselle de Brabandel passed me her handkerchief. My own had fallen down, and I had not the courage to pick it up. The curtain had been raised for the second piece, Amphitryon, and I made an effort to listen, for the sake of pleasing my governess, who was so gentle and conciliating. I can only remember one thing, and that is that Alcinène seemed to me to be so unhappy that I burst into loud sobs, and that the whole house, very much amused, looked at our box, my mother, deeply annoyed, took me out, and Mademoiselle de Brabander went with us. My godfather was furious, and muttered, She ought to be shut up in a convent and left there. Good heavens, what a little idiot the child is! This was the debut of my artistic life. End of chapter 4 Section 5 of Memories of My Life this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memories of My Life by Sarah Bernard. I recite The Two Pigeons. I was beginning to think, though, of my new career. Books were sent to me from everywhere. Racine, Corneille, Molière, Casimir de la Vigne. I opened them, but as I did not understand them at all, I quickly closed them again and read my little La Fontaine, which I loved passionately. I knew all his fables, and one of my delights was to make a bet with my godfather or with Monsieur Medieu, our learned and tiresome friend. I used to bet that they would not recognize all the fables if I began with the last verse and went backward to the first one, and I often won the bet. A line from my aunt arrived one day, telling my mother that Monsieur Aubert, who was then director of the Conservatoire, was expecting us the next day at nine in the morning. I was about to put my foot in the stirrup. My mother sent me with Madame Girard. Monsieur Aubert received us very affably, as the Duc de Morny had spoken to him of me. I was very much impressed by him, with his refined face and white hair, his ivory complexion and magnificent black eyes, his fragile and distinguished look, his melodious voice and the celebrity of his name. I scarcely dared answer his questions. He spoke to me very gently and told me to sit down. You are very fond of the stage, he began. Oh, no, monsieur, I answered. This unexpected reply amazed him. He looked at Madame Girard from under his heavy eyelids, and she at once said, No, she does not care for the stage, but she does not want to marry, and consequently she will have no money, as her father left her a hundred thousand francs, which she can only have on her wedding day. Her mother, therefore, wants her to have some profession, for Madame Bernard only has an annuity, a very good one, but it is only an annuity, and so she will not be able to leave her daughters anything. On that account, she wants Sarah to become independent. Sarah would like to enter a convent. But that is not an independent career, my child said Monsieur Aubert slowly. How old is she? he asked. Fourteen and a half, replied Madame Gerard. No, I exclaimed, I'm nearly fifteen. The kind old man smiled. In twenty years from now, he said, you will insist less about the exact figures. And evidently thinking the visit had lasted long enough, he rose. It appears, he said to Madame Gerard, that this little girl's mother is very beautiful. Oh, very beautiful, she replied. You will please express my regret to her that I have not seen her, and my thanks for having so thoughtfully sent you. He thereupon kissed Madame Gerard's hand, and she coloured slightly. 
this conversation remained engraved on my mind i remember every word of it every movement and every gesture of m aubert's for this little man so charming and so gentle held my future in his transparent looking hand he opened the door for us and touching me on my shoulder said come courage little girl believe me you will thank your mother some day for driving you to it don't look so sad life is well worth beginning seriously but gaily i stammered out a few words of thanks and just as i was making my exit a fine-looking woman knocked against me she was heavy and extremely bustling though and m aubert bent his head toward me and said quietly above all things don't let yourself get stout like this singer stoutness is the enemy of a woman and of an artist the man-servant was now holding the door open for us and as m aubert returned to his visitor i heard him say well most ideal of women i went away rather astounded and did not say a word in the carriage madame gerard told my mother about our interview but the latter did not even let her finish and only said good good thank you the examination was to take place a month after this visit the difficulty was to choose a piece for the examination my mother did not know any theatrical people my godfather advised me to learn phaedre but mademoiselle de brabander objected as she thought it a little offensive and refused to help me if i chose that m medieu our old friend wanted me to work at chimene in le cid but first he declared that i clenched my teeth too much for it it was quite true that i did not make the o open enough and did not roll the r sufficiently either he wrote a little notebook for me which i am copying exactly as my poor dear gerard kept religiously everything concerning me and she gave me later on a quantity of papers which are very useful now the following are my old friend's instructions every morning instead of do re mi practice the te de de in order to learn to vibrate before breakfast repeat forty times over un très gros roi dans un très gros trou in order to vibrate the r before dinner repeat forty times combien c'est ceci ci c'est ci sous c'est ceci ci ci sous c'est ceci ci ci sous ceci ci sous ceci ci sous cela ci sous c'est ceci ci in order to learn not to waste the s at night when going to bed repeat twenty times dis donc dina dis donc du do d'un do du d'un don and twenty times le plus petit papa petit pipi petit popo petit pupu open the mouth square for the d and pout for the p he gave this piece of work quite seriously to mademoiselle de brabander who quite seriously wanted me to practice it my governess was charming and i was very fond of her but i could not help yelling with laughter when after making me to go through the te de de exercise which went fairly well and then the très gros roi etc she started on the saucisse sausages ah no that was a cacophony of hisses in her toothless mouth enough to make all the dogs in paris howl and when she began with the didon accompanied by the plus petit papa i thought my dear governess was losing her reason she half closed her eyes her face was red her moustache bristled up she put on a sententious hurried matter her mouth widened out and looked like the slit in a money-box or else it was creased up into a little ring and she purred and hissed and chirped without ceasing i flung myself exhausted into my wicker work chair choking with laughter and great tears poured from my eyes i stamped on the floor flung my arms out right and left until they were useless and rocked myself backward and forward screaming with laughter my mother attracted by the noise i was making half opened the door mademoiselle de brabander explained to her very gravely that she was showing me monsieur Mendieu's method my mother expostulated with me but i would not listen to anything as i was nearly beside myself with laughter she then took mademoiselle de brabander away and left me alone for she feared that i would finish with hysterics when once i was by myself i began to come down i closed my eyes and thought of my convent again the de 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 got mixed up in my enervated brain with the our father which i used to have to repeat some days fifteen or twenty times as a punishment finally i came to myself again got up and after bathing my face in cold water went to my mother whom i found playing whist with my governess and godfather i kissed mademoiselle de brabander and she returned my kiss with such indulgent kindness that i felt quite embarrassed by it ten days passed by and i did none of monsieur Medieu's exercises except the deux 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 at the piano 
My mother came and woke me every morning for this, and it drove me wild. My godfather made me learn a receipt, but I understood nothing of what he told me about the verses. He considered and explained to me that poetry must be said with an intonation, and that the value must only be put on the rhyme. His theories were boring to listen to and impossible to execute. Then I could not understand the Rissi's character, for it did not seem to me that she loved Hippolyte at all, and she appeared to me to be a scheming flirt. My godfather explained to me that in olden times this was the way people loved each other, and when I remarked that Phaedre appeared to love in a better way than that, he took me by the chin and said, Just look at this naughty child. She is pretending not to understand and would like us to explain to her. This was simply idiotic. I did not understand and had not asked anything, but this man had a bourgeois mind and was sly and lewd. He did not like me because I was thin, but he was interested in me because I was going to be an actress. That word evoked for him the weak side of our art. He did not see the beauty, the nobleness of it, nor yet its beneficial power. I could not fathom all this at that time, but I did not feel at ease with this man, whom I had seen from my childhood, and who was almost like a father to me. I did not want to continue learning Arisi. In the first place, I could not talk about it with my governess, as she would not discuss the piece at all. I then learned the École des Femmes, and Mademoiselle de Brabander explained at Nienz to me. The dear good lady did not see much in it, for the whole story appeared to her of childlike simplicity, and when I said the lines, he has taken from me the ribbon you gave me, she smiled in all confidence when Medier and my godfather laughed heartily. Finally, the examination day arrived. Everyone had given me advice, but no one any really helpful counsel. It had not occurred to anyone that I ought to have had a professional to prepare me for my examination. I got up in the morning with a heavy heart and an anxious mind. My mother had had a black silk dress made for me. It was slightly low-necked and was finished with a gathered bertha. The frock was rather short and showed my drawers. These were trimmed with embroidery and came down to my brown kit boots. A white kimp emerged from my black bodice and was fastened round my throat, which was too slender. My hair was parted on my forehead and then fell as it liked, for it was not held by pins or ribbons. I wore a large straw hat, although this season was rather advanced. Everyone came to inspect my dress and I was turned round and round twenty times at least. I had to make my courtesy for everyone to see. Finally, it seemed to give general satisfaction. My petite dame came downstairs with her grave husband and kissed me. She was deeply affected. Our old Marguerite made me sit down and put before me a cup of cold beef tea, which she had simmered so carefully for a long time that it was then a delicious jelly, and I swallowed it in a second. I was in a great hurry to start. On rising from my chair, I moved so brusquely that my dress caught on an invisible splinter of wood and was torn. My mother turned to a visitor who had arrived about five minutes before and had remained in contemplative admiration ever since. There, she said to him in a vexed tone, that is proof of what I told you. All your silks tear with the slightest movement. Oh no, replied our visitor quickly. I told you that this one was not well dressed and let you have it at a low price on that account. The man who spoke was the most extraordinary individual imaginable. I do not mean as regards his appearance, as he was like a not too ugly young Jew. He was shy and a Dutchman, never violent, but tenacious. I had known him from my childhood. His father, who was a friend of my grandfather's on my mother's side, was a rich tradesman and the father of a tribe of children. He gave each of his sons a small sum of money and sent them all out to make their fortune where they liked. Jacques, the one of whom I am speaking, came to Paris. He had commenced by selling Passover cakes, and as a boy had often brought me some of them to the convent, together with the dainties that my mother sent me. Later on, my surprise was great on seeing him offer my mother rolls of oil cloth, such as is used for tablecloths for early breakfast. I remember one of those cloths, the border of which was formed of medallions representing the French kings. It was from that oil cloth that I learned my history best. For the last month, he had owned quite an elegant vehicle, and he sold silks that were not well dressed. At present, he is one of the leading jewellers of Paris. The slit in my dress was soon mended, and knowing now that the silk was not well dressed, I treated it with respect. Finally we started. 
Mademoiselle de Brabander, Madame Girard, and I, in a carriage that was only intended for two persons, and I was glad that it was so small, for I was close to two people who were fond of me, and my silk frock was spread carefully over the knees. When I entered the waiting room that leads into the recital hall of the conservatoire, there were about twenty young men and about thirty girls there. All these girls were accompanied by their mother, father, aunt, brother or sister. There was an odor of pomade and vanilla that made me feel sick. When we were shown into this room, I felt that everyone was looking at me, and I blushed to the back of my head. Madame Girard drew me gently along, and I turned to take Mademoiselle de Brabander's hand. She came shyly forward, blushing more, and still more confused than I was. Everyone looked at her, and I saw the girls nudge each other and nod in her direction. One of them suddenly got up and moved across to her mother. Oh, mercy, look at that old sight, she said. My poor governess felt most uncomfortable, and I was furious. I thought she was a thousand times nicer than all those fat, dressed-up, common-looking mothers. Certainly she was different from other people in her appearance, for Mademoiselle de Bramander was wearing a salmon-colored dress, an Indian shawl drawn tightly across her shoulders, and fastened with a very large camille brooch. Her bonnet was trimmed with ruches so close together that it looked like a nun's headgear. She certainly was not at all like these dreadful people in whose society we found ourselves, and among whom there were not more than ten exceptions to the rule. The young men were standing in compact groups near the windows. They were laughing and, I suspect, making remarks in doubtful taste. The heavy red baize door opened, and a girl with a red face and a young man perfectly scarlet came back after acting their scene. They each went to their respective friends, and then chattered away, finding fault with each other. A name was called out, Mademoiselle de Capetit, and I saw a tall, fair, distinguished-looking girl move forward without any embarrassment. She stopped on her way to kiss a pretty woman, stout, with a pink and white complexion, and very much dressed up. Don't be afraid, mother dear, she said, and then she added a few words in Dutch before disappearing, followed by a young man and a very thin girl who were to give her her cues. This was explained to me by Lyotot, who called over the names of the pupils and took down the names of those who were to act and those who were to give the cues. I knew nothing of all this and wondered who was to give me the cues for Agnès. He mentioned several young men, but I interrupted him. Oh no, I said. I will not ask anyone. I do not know any of them, and I will not ask. Well, then, what will you recite, mademoiselle? asked Lyotot with the most outré accent possible. I will recite a fable, I replied. He burst out laughing as he wrote down my name and the title De Pigeon, which I gave him. I heard him still laughing under his heavy moustache as he continued his round. He then went back into the conservatoire, and I began to get feverish with excitement, so that Madame Gerard was anxious about me, as my health, unfortunately, was very delicate. She made me sit down, and then she put a few drops of eau de cologne behind my ears. There, that will teach you to wink like that, were the words I suddenly heard, and a girl with the prettiest face imaginable had her ears boxed only. Nathalie Mouroy's mother was correcting her daughter, I sprang up, trembling with fright and indignation, and was as angry as a young turkey cock. I wanted to go and box the horrible woman's ears in return, and then to kiss the pretty girl who had been insulted in this way, but I was held back firmly by my two guardians. The captain now returned, and this caused a diversion in the waiting room. She was radiant and quite satisfied with herself. Oh, very well satisfied indeed. Her father held out a little flask to her in which was some kind of cordial, and I should have liked some of it too, for my mouth was dry and burning. Her mother then put a little woolen square over her chest before fastening her coat for her, and then all three of them went away. Several other girls and young men were called before my turn came. Finally, the call of my name made me jump as a sardine does when pursued by a big fish. I tossed my head to shake my hair back, and my petit dame stroked my badly dressed silk. Mademoiselle de Brabander reminded me about the O and the A, the R, the P and the T, and I then went alone into the hall. I had never been alone an hour in my life. As a little child, I was always clinging to the skirts of my nurse. At the convent, I was always with one of my friends or one of the sisters. At home, either with Mademoiselle de Brabander or Madame Gerard, or, if they were not there, in the kitchen with Marguerite. 
And now there I was alone in that strange looking room, with a platform at the end, a large table in the middle, and seated round this table, men who either grumbled, growled, or jeered. There was only one woman present, and she had a loud voice. She was holding an eyeglass, and as I entered, she dropped it and looked at me through her opera glass. I felt everyone's gaze on my back as I climbed up the few steps to the platform. Leoto bent forward and whispered, Make your bow and commence, and then stop when the chairman rings. I looked at the chairman and saw that it was Monsieur Bert. I had forgotten that he was director of the conservatoire, just as I had forgotten everything else. I at once made my bow and began. Deux pigeons s'aimaient d'amour tendre, l'un d'eux se noyait. A low grumbling sound was heard, and then a ventriloquist muttered. It isn't an elocution class here. What an idea to come here reciting fables. It was Beauvalet, the thundering tragedian of the Comédie Française. I stopped short, my heart beating wildly. Go on, my child, said a man with silver hair. This was provost. Yes, it won't be as long as a scene from a play, exclaimed Augustine Brouin, the one woman present. I began again. Deux pigeons se met à tendre, l'un d'eux se nouillant au logis. Louder, my child, louder, said a little man with curly white hair in a kindly tone. I stopped again, confused and frightened, seized suddenly with such a foolish fit of nervousness that I could have shouted or howled. Samson saw this and said to me, Come, come, we are not ogres. He had just been talking in a low voice with Aubert. Come now, begin again, he said, and speak up. Ah, no, put in Augustine Brouin. If she is to begin again, it will be longer than a scene. The speech made all the table laugh, and that gave me time to recover myself. I thought all these people unkind to laugh like this at the expense of a poor little trembling creature who had been delivered over to them, bound hand and foot. I felt, without exactly defining it, a slight contempt for these pitiless judges. Since then I have very often thought of that trial of mine, and I have come to the conclusion that individuals who are kind, intelligent and compassionate become less estimable when they are together. The feeling of personal irresponsibility encourages their evil instinct, and the fear of ridicule chases away their good ones. When I had recovered my willpower, I began my fable again, determined not to mind what happened. My voice was more liquid on account of emotion, and the desire to make myself heard caused it to be more resonant. There was a silence, and before I had finished my fable, the little bell rang. I bowed, and came down the few steps from the platform, thoroughly exhausted. Monsieur Aubert stopped me as I was passing by the table. Well, little girl, he said. That was very good indeed. Monsieur Provost and Monsieur Beauvalet both want you in their class. I recalled slightly when he told me which was Monsieur Beauvalet, for who was the ventriloquist who had given me such a fright. Well, which of these two gentlemen should you prefer? he asked. I did not utter a word, but pointed to Monsieur Provost. Ah, well, that's all right. Get your handkerchief out, my poor Beauvalet, and I shall entrust this child to you, my dear Provost. It was only at that moment that I comprehended, and wild with joy exclaimed, Then I passed! Yes, you have passed, and there is only one thing I regret, and that is that such a pretty voice should not be for music. I did not hear anything else, for I was beside myself with joy. I did not stay to thank anyone, but bounded to the door. My petite dame, mademoiselle, I have passed! I exclaimed, and when they shook hands and asked me no end of questions, I could only reply, Oh, it's quite true. I have passed. I have passed. I was surrounded and questioned. How do you know that you have passed? No one knows beforehand. Yes, yes, I know, though. Monsieur Aubert told me. I am to go into Monsieur Provost's class. Monsieur Beauvalet wanted me, but his voice is too loud for me. A disagreeable girl exclaimed. Can't you stop that? And so they all want you. A pretty girl, who was too dark, though, for my taste, came nearer and asked me gently what I had recited. The fable of the two pigeons, I replied. She was surprised, and so was everyone, while as for me, I was wildly delighted to surprise them all. I tossed my heart on my head, shook my frock out, and dragging my two friends along, ran away dancing. They wanted to take me to the confectioners to have something, but I refused. We got into a cab, and I should have liked to push that cab along myself. 
i fancied i saw the words i have passed written up over all the shops when on account of the crowded streets the cab had to stand it seemed to me that the people stared at me and i caught myself tossing my head as though telling them all that it was quite true i had passed my examination i never thought any more about the convent and only experienced a feeling of pride at having succeeded in my first venturesome enterprise venturesome but the success had depended only on me it seemed to me as though the cabman would never arrive at two six five rue saint honore i kept putting my head out of the window and saying faster cabby faster please at last we reached the house and i sprang out of the cab and hurried along to tell the good news to my mother on the way i was stopped by the daughter of the hall porter she was a staymaker and worked in a little room on the top floor of the house the window of which was opposite our dining room where i used to do my lessons with my governess so that i could not help seeing her ruddy wide-awake face constantly i had never spoken to her but i knew who she was well mademoiselle Sarah, are you satisfied she called out oh yes i have passed i answered and i could not resist stopping a minute in order to enjoy the astonishment of the whole porter family i then hurried on but on reaching the courtyard came to a dead stand anger and grief taking possession of me for there i beheld my petite dame her two hands forming a trumpet her head thrown back shouting to my mother who was leaning out of the window yes yes she has passed i gave her a thump with my clenched hand and began to cry with rage for i had prepared a little story for my mother ending up with a joyful surprise i had intended putting on a very sad look on arriving at the door and pretending to be broken-hearted and ashamed i felt sure she would say oh i am not surprised my poor child you are so foolish and then i should have thrown my arms round her neck and said it isn't true it isn't true i have passed i had pictured to myself her face brightening up and then old marguerite and my godfather laughing heartily and my sisters dancing with joy and here was madame gerard sounding her trumpet and spoiling all my effects that i had prepared so well i must say that the kind woman continued as long as she lived that is the greater part of my life spoiling all my effects it was all in vain that i made scenes she could not help herself whenever i told a good story and wanted it to be very effective she would invariably burst into fits of laughter before the end of it if i started on a story with a very lamentable ending which was to be a surprise she would sigh and roll her eyes and murmur oh dear oh dear so that i always missed the effect i was counting on still more often when anything was being guessed and i asked people for the answer she would reply before any one else as she was always in my confidence and i had perhaps told her the answer a second before all this used to exasperate me to such a degree that before beginning a story or a game i used to ask her to go out of the room and she would get up and go laughing at the idea of the blunder she would make if there furious then on this occasion and abusing madame gerard i went upstairs to my mother whom i found at the open door she kissed me affectionately and on seeing my sulky face asked if i was not satisfied yes i replied but i'm furious with gerard be nice mamma and pretend you don't know shut the door and i will ring she did this and i rang the bell marguerite opened the door and my mother came and pretended to be astonished my sisters too arrived and my godfather and my aunt when i kissed my mother exclaiming i have passed everyone shouted with joy and i was gay again i had made my effect anyhow it was the career taking possession of me unawares my sister regina whom the sisters would not have in the convent and so had sent home began to dance a jig she had learned this in the country when she had been put out to nurse and upon every occasion she danced it finishing always with a couplet my little dear rejoice everything is for you nothing could be more comic than this chubby child with her serious air regina never laughed and only a suspicion of a smile ever played over her thin lips and over her mouth which was too small nothing could be more comic than to see her looking grave and rough dancing the jig she was funnier than ever that day as she was excited by the general joy she was four years old and nothing ever embarrassed her she was both timid and bold she detested society and people generally but if made to go in the dining-room she embarrassed people by her crude remarks which were most odd by her rough answers and her kicks and blows 
she was a terrible child with silvery hair dark complexion blue eyes too large for her face and thick lashes which made a shadow on her cheeks when she lowered the lids and joined her eyebrows when her eyes were open she would be four or five hours sometimes without uttering a word without answering any question she was asked and then she would jump up from her little chair begin to sing as loud as she could and dance the jig on this day she was in a good temper for she kissed me affectionately and opened her thin lips to smile my sister jeanne kissed me and made me tell her about my examination my godfather gave me a hundred francs and monsieur medieu who had just arrived to find out the result promised to take me the next day to barbadiens to choose a clock for my room as that was one of my dreams End of section 5, read by Claudia Caldi. Section 6 of Memories of My Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memories of My Life by Sarah Bernard. I Decline Matrimony and Wed Art, Part 1. The great change began in me from that day. For rather a long time indeed, my soul remained childlike, but my mind discerned life more distinctly. I felt the need of creating a personality for myself. That was the first awakening of my will. I wanted to be someone. Mademoiselle de Brabander declared to me that this was pride. It seemed to me that it was not quite that, but I could not then define what the sentiment was which imposed this wish on me. I did not understand until a few months later why I wished to be someone. A friend of my godfather's made me an offer of marriage. This man was a rich tanner and very kind, but so dark and with such long hair and such a beard that he disgusted me. I refused him, and my godfather then asked to speak to me alone. He made me sit down in my mother's boudoir and said to me, it is pure folly to refuse Monsieur B. He has 60,000 francs a year and expectations. It was the first time I had heard this use of the word, and when the meaning was explained to me, I wondered if that was the right thing to say on such an occasion. Why, yes, replied my godfather, you are idiotic with your romantic ideas. Marriage is a business affair and must be considered as such. Your future father and mother-in-law will have to die, just as we shall, and it is by no means disagreeable to know that they will leave two million francs to their son, and consequently to you, if you marry him. I shall not marry him, though. Why? Because I do not love him. But you never loved your husband before, replied my practical adviser. You can love him after. After what? Ask your mother, but listen to me now, for it is not a question of that. You must marry. Your mother has a small income which your father left her, but this income comes from the profits of the manufactory which belongs to your grandmother, and she cannot bear your mother, who will therefore lose that income, and then have nothing and three children on her hands. It is that accursed lawyer who is arranging all this. The whys and wherefores would take too long to explain. Your father managed his business affairs very badly. You must marry, therefore, if not for your own sake, for the sake of your mother and sisters. You can then give your mother the hundred thousand francs your father left you, which no one else can touch. Monsieur B. will allow you three hundred thousand francs. I have arranged everything, so that you can give this to your mother if you like, and with 400,000 francs she will be able to live very well. I cried and sobbed, and asked to have time to think it over. I found my mother in the dining room. Has your godfather told you? She asked gently in rather a timid way. Yes, mother, yes, he has told me. Let me think it over, will you? I said, sobbing, as I kissed her neck lingeringly. I then locked myself in my bedroom, and for the first time for many days, I regretted the separation from my convent. All my childhood rose up before me, and I cried more and more, and felt so unhappy that I wished I could die. Gradually, however, I began to get calm again, and realized what had happened, and what my godfather's words meant. Most decidedly, I did not want to marry this man. Since I had been at the Conservatoire, I had learned a few things vaguely. 
very vaguely, for I was never alone, but I understood enough to make me not want to marry without being in love. I was, however, destined to be attacked in a quarter from which I should not have expected it. Madame Gerard asked me to go up to her room to see the embroidery she was doing on a frame for my mother's birthday. My astonishment was great to find Monsieur B. there. He begged me to change my mind. He made me very wretched, for he pleaded with tears in his eyes. Do you want a larger marriage settlement? he asked. I would make it five hundred thousand francs. But it was not at all that, and I said in a very low voice, I do not love you, monsieur. If you do not marry me, mademoiselle, he said, I shall die of grief. I looked at him and repeated to myself the words, die of grief. I was embarrassed and desperate, but at the same time delighted, for he loved me just as a man does in a play. Phrases that I had read or heard came to my mind vaguely, and I repeated them without any real conviction, and then left him without the slightest coquetry. Mr. B. did not die. He is still living and has a very important financial position. He is much nicer now than when he was so black, for at present he is quite white. I had just passed my first examination with remarkable success, particularly in tragedy. Monsieur Provost, my professor, had not wanted me to compete in Zaire, but I had insisted. I thought that scene with Zaire and her brother, Nivestan, very fine, and it suited me. But when Zaire overwhelmed with her brother's reproaches, falls on her knees at his feet, Provost wanted me to say the words, Strike, I tell you, I love him, with violence, and I wanted to say them gently, perfectly resigned to death that was almost certain. I argued about it for a long time with my professor, and finally I appeared to give in to him during the lesson. But on the day of the competition I fell on my knees before Nerestan with a sob so real, my arms outstretched, offering my heart so full of love to the deadly blow that I expected, and I murmured with such tenderness, Strike, I tell you, I love him, that the whole house burst into applause and demanded it twice over. The second prize for tragedy was awarded me, to the great dissatisfaction of the public, as it was thought that I ought to have had the first prize, and yet it was only just that I should have the second, on account of my age and the short time I had been studying. I had a first assess it for comedy in La Fosse Agnès, and Sassi wrote an article about it. I felt, therefore, that I had the right to refuse Monsieur P., my future lay open before me, and consequently my mother would not be in want if she should lose her present income. A few days later, Monsieur Renier, professor at the Conservatoire and secretary of the Comédie Française, came to ask my mother whether she would allow me to play in a piece of his at the Vaudeville. The piece was German, and the managers would give me twenty-five francs for each performance. I was amazed at the sum. Seven hundred and fifty francs a month for my first appearance. I was wild with joy. I besought my mother to accept the offer made by the vaudeville, and she told me to do as I liked in the matter. I asked Monsieur Camille Doucet, director of the Beaux-Arts, to allow me to recite something to him, and as my mother always refused to accompany me, Madame Gerard went with me. My little sister, Regina, begged me to take her, and very unwisely I consented. We had not been in the director's office more than five minutes before my sister, who was only six years old, began to climb on the furniture. She jumped on a stool and finally sat down on the floor, pulling the paper basket, which was under the desk, toward her, and proceeded to spread all the torn papers which it contained about the room. On seeing this, Camille Doucet mildly observed that she was not a very good little girl, my sister, with her head in a basket, answered in her husky voice, If you bother me, monsieur, I shall tell everyone that you are there to give out holy water that is poison. My aunt says so. My face turned purple with shame, and I stammered out, Please do not believe that, monsieur de say. My little sister is telling an untruth. Regina sprang to her feet, and clenching her fists, rushed at me like a little fury. Aunt Rosine never said that, she exclaimed. You are telling the untruth. Why, she said it to Monsieur de Bonny, and he answered. 
i had forgotten this and i have forgotten what the duc de morny answered but beside myself with anger i put my hand over my sister's mouth and took her quickly away she howled like a wildcat and we rushed like a hurricane through the waiting-room which was full of people i then gave way to one of those violent fits of temper to which i had been subject in my childhood i sprang into the first cab that passed the door and when once in the cab struck my sister with such fury that madame gerard was alarmed and protected her with her own body receiving all the blows i gave with my head arms and feet for in my anger rage and shame i flung myself about to right and left my rage was all the more profound from the fact that i was very fond of camille doucet he was gentle and charming affable and kind-hearted he had refused my aunt something she had asked for and unaccustomed to being refused anything she had aspired against him this had nothing to do with me though and i wondered what camille doucet would think and then too i had not asked him about the vaudeville all my fine dreams had come to nothing and it was this little monster who looked as fair and as wide as a seraph who had just shattered my hopes huddled up in the cab an expression of fear on her self-willed face and her thin lips compressed she was gazing at me under her long lashes with half-closed eyes on reaching home i told my mother all that had happened and she declared that my little sister should have no dessert for two days regina was greedy but her pride was greater than her greediness she turned round on her little heels and dancing her jig began to sing my little stomach isn't at all glad until i wanted to rush at her and shake her a few days later during my lessons i was told that the minister refused to allow me to act at the vaudeville monsieur renier told me how sorry he was but he added in kindly tone oh but my dear child the conservatoire thinks a lot of you therefore you need not to worry too much i am sure that camille doucet is at the bottom of it i said no he certainly is not answered monsieur renier Camille Doucet was our warmest advocate, but the ministry would not, upon any account, hear of anything that might be detrimental to your debut next year. I at once felt most grateful to Camille Doucet for his kindness in bearing no ill will after my little sister's stupid behaviour. I began to work again with the greatest zeal and did not miss a single lesson. Every morning I went to the conservatoire with my governess. We started early, as I preferred walking to taking the omnibus, and I kept the franc which my mother gave me every morning, part of which was for the omnibus and part for cakes. We were to walk home always, but every other day we took a cab with the two francs I had saved for this purpose. My mother never knew about this little scheme, but it was not without remorse that my kind Rabander consented to be my accomplice. As I said before, I did not miss a lesson, and I even went to the deportment class, at which poor old Monsieur Lee, duly curled, powered, and adorned with lace frills, presided. This was the most amusing lesson imaginable. Very few of us attended this class, and Monsieur Lee avenged himself on us for the abstention of the others. At every lesson, each one of us was called forward. He addressed us by the familiar term of thou, and considered us as his property. There were only five or six of us, but we each had to mount the stage. He always stood up with his little black stick in his hand. No one knew why he should have this stick. Now, young ladies, he would say, the body thrown back, the head up on tiptoes, that's it, perfect. One, two, three, march and we marched along on tiptoes with heads up and eyelids drawn over our eyes in order to see where we were walking we marched along like this with all the stateliness and solemnity of camels he then taught us to make our exit with indifference dignity or fury and it was amusing to see us going toward the doors either with a lagging step or in an animated or hurried way according to the mood in which we were supposed to be then we heard enough go not a word for monsieur lee would not allow us to murmur a single word everything he used to say is in the look the gesture the attitude then there was what he called l'assiette which meant the way to sit down in a dignified manner 
to let oneself fall into a seat wearily, or the assiette, which meant, I'm listening, monsieur, say what you wish. Ah, that was distractingly complicated. That way of sitting down. We had to put everything into it. The desire to know what was going to be said to us, the fear of hearing it, the determination to go away, the will to stay. Oh, the tears that this assiette cost me. Poor old Monsieur Lee. I do not bear him any ill will, but I did my utmost later on to forget everything he had taught me, for nothing could have been more useless than those deportment lessons. Every human being moves about according to his or her proportions. Women who are too tall take long strides. Those who stoop walk like the eastern women. Stout women walk like ducks. Short-legged ones trot. Very small women skip along and the gawky ones walk like cranes. Nothing can be done for them, and the deportment class has very wisely been abolished. The gesture must depict the thought, and it is harmonious or stupid according to whether the artist is intelligent or null. For the theatre one needs long arms. It is better to have them too long than too short. An artist with short arms can never, never make a fine gesture, it was all in vain that poor Elie told us this or that. We were always stupid and awkward, while he was always comic. Oh, so comic, poor old man. I also took fencing lessons. Aunt Rosine put this idea into my mother's head. I had a lesson once a week from the famous pond. Oh, what a terrible man he was. Brutal, rude, and always teasing. He was an incomparable fencing master, but he disliked giving lessons to brats like us, as he called us. He was not rich, though, and I believe, but I am not sure of it, that this class had been organized for him by a distinguished patron of his. He always kept his hat on, and this horrified Mademoiselle de Brabander. He smoked his cigar too all the time, and this made his pupils cough, as they were already out of breath from the fencing exercise. What tortured those lessons were! He brought with him sometimes friends of his who delighted in our awkwardness. This gave rise to a scandal as one day one of these gay spectators made a most violent remark about one of the pupils named Chatelain, and the latter turned round quickly and gave him a blow in the face. A skirmish immediately occurred, and Pons, on endeavouring to intervene, received a blow or two himself. This made a great stir, and from that day forth visitors were not allowed to be present at the lesson. I persuaded my mother to let me discontinue attending this class, and this was a great relief to me. I very much preferred Renier's lesson to any others. He was gentle, had nice manners, and taught us to be natural in what we recited. But I certainly owe all that I know to the variety of instruction which I had, and which I followed up in the most devoted way. Provost taught a broad style, with diction somewhat pompous but sustained. He especially emphasized freedom of gesture and inflection. Beauvalet, in my opinion, did not teach anything that was good. He had a deep, effective voice, but that he could not give to anyone. It was an admirable instrument, but it did not give him any talent. He was awkward in his gestures, his arms were too short and his face common. I detested him as a professor. Samson was just the opposite. His voice was not strong, but piercing. He had a certain acquired distinction, but was very correct. His method was simplicity. Provost emphasized breast. Samson exactitude, and he was very particular about the finals. He would not allow us to drop the voice at the end of the phrase. Coquelin, who is one of Renier's pupils, I believe, has a great deal of Samson's style, although he has retained the essentials of his master's teaching. As for me, I remember my three professors, Renier, Provost, and Samson, as though I had heard them only yesterday. The year passed by without any great change in my life, but two months before my second examination, I had the misfortune to have to change my professor. Provost was taken ill, and I went into Samson's class. He counted very much on me, but he was authoritative and persistent. He gave me two very bad parts in two very bad pieces, Hortense in L'Ecole de Vieillard by Casimir de la Vigne for comedy, and La Fille du Cid for tragedy. This piece was also by Casimir de la Vigne. 
I did not feel at all in my element in these two roles, both of which were written in hard, emphatic language. The examination day arrived, and I did not look at all nice. My mother had insisted on my having my hair done up by her hairdresser, and I had cried and sobbed on seeing this figure all make partings all over my head in order to separate my rebellious mane. Idiot that he was, he had suggested this style to my mother, and my head was in his stupid hands for more than an hour and a half, for he never before had to deal with a mane like mine. He kept mopping his forehead every five minutes and muttering, What hair! Good heavens! It is horrible! Just like toe! It might be the hair of a white negress! Turning to my mother, he suggested that my head should be entirely shaved and the hair then trained as it grew again. I will think about it, replied my mother in an absent-minded way. I turned my head so abruptly to look at her when she said this, that the curling irons burned my forehead. The man was using the irons to uncurl my hair. He considered that it curled naturally in such a disordered style that he must get the natural curl out of it and then wave it, as this would be more becoming to the face. Mademoiselle's hair is stopped in its growth by this extreme curliness. All the Tangier's girls and aggressives have hair like this. As Mademoiselle is going on the stage, she would look better if she had hair like Madame, he said, bowing with respectful admiration to my mother, who certainly had the most beautiful hair imaginable. It was fair and so long that, when standing up, she could tread on it and not bend her head. It is only fair to say, though, that my mother was very short. Finally, I was out of the hands of this wretched man, and was nearly dead with fright after an hour and a half's brushing, combing, curling, hairpinning, with my head turned from left to right and from right to left. I was completely disfigured at the end of it all, and did not recognize myself. My hair was drawn tightly back from my temples. My ears were very visible and stood out, looking positively improper in their nakedness, while on the top of my head was a parcel of little sausages arranged near each other to imitate the ancient diadem. I was perfectly hideous. My forehead, of which I caught a glimpse under the golden mass of my hair, seemed to me immense, implacable. I did not recognize my eyes, accustomed as I was to see them veiled by the shadow of my hair. My head seemed to weigh two or three pounds, I was accustomed to do my hair as I still do, with two hairpins, and this man had put five or six packets in it. All this was heavy for my poor head. I was late, and so I had to dress very quickly. I cried with anger, and my eyes grew smaller, my nose larger, and my veins swelled. But it was the climax when I had to put my hat on. It would not go on the pile of sausages, and my mother wrapped my head up in a lace scarf and hurried me to the door. On arriving at the conservatoire, I hurried with my petite dame to the waiting room, while my mother went direct to the hall. When once I was in the waiting room, I tore off the lace and, seated on a bench after relating the odyssey of my hairdressing, I gave my head up to my companions. All of them adored and envied my hair, because it was so soft and light and golden. All of them took pity on my sorrow and were touched by my ugliness. Their mothers, however, were spluttering in their own fat with joy. The girls began to take out my hairpins, and one of them, Marie Lloyd, whom I liked best, took my head in her hands and kissed it affectionately. Oh, your beautiful hair, what have they done to it? She exclaimed, pulling out the last of the hairpins. This sympathy made me once more burst into tears. Finally, I stood up triumphant, without any hairpins and without any sausages. But my poor hair was heavy with the beef marrow the wretched man had put on it, and it was full of the partings he had made for the creation of the sausages. It fell now in mournful-looking, greasy flakes around my face. I shook my head for five minutes in mad rage. I then succeeded in making the hair more loose, and I put it up as well as I could with a couple of hairpins. The competition had commenced, and I was the tenth to be called. I could not remember what I had to say. Madame Girard moistened my temples with cold water, and Mademoiselle de Brabandelle, who had only just arrived, did not recognize me and was looking about for me everywhere. She had broken her leg nearly three months ago and had to support herself on a crutch, but she had wished to come. 
Madame Kedrar was just beginning to tell her about the drama of the hair when my name echoed through the room. Mademoiselle Charles Bernard. It was Leotard, who later on was prompter at the Comédie Française and who had a strong Auvergne accent. Mademoiselle Charles Bernard, I heard again, and I then sprang up without an idea in my mind and without uttering a word. I looked round for the pupil who was to give me my answers, and together we made our entry. I was surprised at the sound of my voice, which I did not recognize. I had cried so much that it had affected my voice, and I spoke through my nose. I heard a woman's voice say, Poor child, she ought not to have been allowed to compete. She has an atrocious cold, her nose is running, and her face is swollen. I finished my scene, made my bow, and went away in the midst of very feeble and spiritless applause. I walked like a somnambulist, and on reaching Madame Gerard and Mademoiselle de Brabander, fainted away in their arms. Someone went to the hall in search of a doctor, and the rumour that the little Bernard had fainted reached my mother. She was sitting far back in a box, bored to death. When I came to myself again, I opened my eyes and saw my mother's pretty face, with tears hanging on her long lashes. I laid my head against hers and cried quietly, but this time the tears were refreshing, not salt ones that burned my eyelids. I stood up, shook out my dress, and looked at myself in the greenish mirror. I was certainly less ugly now, for my face was rested, my hair was once more soft and light, and altogether there was a general improvement in my appearance. The tragedy competition was over, and the prizes had been awarded. I had no recompense at all, but my last year's second prize had been mentioned. I felt confused, but it did not cause me any disappointment, as I had quite expected things to be like this. Several persons had protested in my favour. Camille Doucet, who was a member of the jury, had argued a long time for me to have a first prize in spite of my bad recitation. He said that my examination reports ought to be taken into account, and they were excellent, and then too I had the best class reports. Nothing, however, could overcome the bad effect produced that day by my nasal voice, my swollen face, and my heavy flakes of hair. After half an hour's interval, during which I drank a glass of port wine and ate cakes, the signal was given for the comedy competition. I was down at the 14th for this, so that I had ample time to recover. My fighting instinct now began to take possession of me, and a sense of injustice made me feel rebellious. I had not deserved my prize that day, but it seemed to me that I ought to have received it nevertheless. I made up my mind that I would have the first prize for comedy, and with the exaggeration that I have always put into everything, I began to get excited, and I said to myself that if I did not have the first prize, I must give up the idea of the stage as a career. My love of mysticism and weakness for the convent came back to me more strongly than ever. Yes, I said to myself, I will go back to the convent, but only if I do not get the first prize. And then the most foolish, illogical strike imaginable was waged in my weak girl's brain. I felt a genuine vocation for the convent when distressed about losing the prize, and a genuine vocation for the theatre when I was hopeful about winning the prize. With a very natural partiality, I discovered in myself the gift of absolute self-sacrifice, renunciation and devotion of every kind, qualities which would win for me easily the post of Mother Superior in the Grand Cham convent. Then, with the most indulgent generosity, I attributed to myself all the necessary gifts for the fulfilment of my other dream, to become the first, the most celebrated and the most envied of actresses. I counted on my fingers all my qualities, gracefulness, charm, distinction, beauty, mystery, piquancy. Oh yes, I found I had all these, and when my reason and my honesty raised any doubt or suggested a part to this fabulous inventory of my qualities, my combative and paradoxical ego at once found a plain decisive answer which admitted of no further argument. It was under these special conditions and in this frame of mind that I went on to the stage when my turn came. The choice of my role for this competition was a very stupid one. I had to represent a married woman who was reasonable and given to reasoning, and I was a mere child and looked much younger than I was. In spite of this, I was very brilliant. I argued well, was very gay, and had immense success. 
I was transfigured with joy and wildly excited, so sure I felt of a first prize. I never doubted for a moment that it would be awarded to me unanimously. When the competition was over, the committee met to discuss the award, and in the meantime I asked for something to eat, and a cutlet was brought from the pastry cook patronized by the conservatoire, and I devoured it, to the great joy of Madame Querard and Mademoiselle de Brabander, for I detested meat and always refused to eat it. The members of the committee at last went to their places in the state box, and there was silence in the hall. The young men were called first onto the stage. There was no first prize awarded to them. Parfurou's name was called for the second prize for comedy. Parfurou is known today as Monsieur Paul Porel, director of the Vaudeville Theatre, and Jean's husband. After this came the turn for the girls. I was in the doorway, ready to rush up to the stage. The words first prize for comedy were uttered, and I made a step forward, pushing aside a girl who was a head taller than I was. First prize for comedy awarded anonymously to Mademoiselle Marie Lloyd. The tall girl I had pushed aside now went forward, slender and beaming toward the stage. There were a few muttered protests, but her beauty, her distinction, and her modest charm won the day with everyone, and Marie Lloyd was cheered. She passed me on her return and kissed me affectionately. We were great friends, and I liked her very much, but I considered her a non-entity as a pupil. I do not remember whether she had received any prize the previous year, but certainly no one expected her to have one now, and I was simply petrified. Second prize for comedy, Mademoiselle Bernard. I had not heard this, and was pushed forward by my companions. On reaching the stage I bowed, and all the time I could see hundreds of Marie Lloyds dancing before me. Some of them were making grimaces, others were throwing me kisses, some were fanning themselves and other bowing. They were very tall, all these Marie Lloyds, too tall for the ceiling, and they walked over the heads of all the people and came toward me, crushing me, stifling me, so I could not breathe. My face, it seems, was whiter than my dress. On returning to the green room, I sat down without uttering a word. I looked at Marie Lloyd, who was being made much of, and who was greatly complimented by everyone. She was wearing a pale blue tartan dress, with a bunch of forget-me-nots in the bodice and another in her black hair. She was very tall and delicate. White shoulders emerged modestly from her dress, which was cut very low, as for her this did not matter. Her fine face, with its somewhat proud expression, was charming and very beautiful. Although very young, she had more warmly charm than all of us. Her large brown eyes had a certain play in them, and her little round mouth gave a smile which was full of mischief, and the nostrils of her wonderfully cut nose dilated. The oval of her beautiful face was intercepted by two little pearly transparent ears of the most exquisite shape. She had long, flexible white neck, and the pose of her head was charming. It was a beauty prize that the jury had conscientiously awarded to Marie Lloyd. She had come on the stage gay and fascinating in her role of silly man, and in spite of the monotony of her delivery, the carelessness of her elocution, the impersonality of her acting, she had carried off all the votes because she was the very personification of silly man, that coquette of twenty years of age who was unconsciously so cruel. She had realized for everyone the ideal dreamed of by Molière. All these thoughts shaped themselves later on in my brain, and this first lesson, which was so painful at the time, was of great service to me in my career. I never forgot Marie Lloyd's prize, and every time that I had to create a role, the physical body of the character always appeared before me dressed, with her hair down, walking, bowing, sitting down, getting up. But this was only a vision which lasted a second, for my mind always thought of the soul governing this personage. When listening to an author reading his work, I tried to define the intention of his idea, endeavouring to identify myself with that intention. I have never played an author false with regard to his idea, and I have always tried to represent the personage according to history, whenever it is a historical personage, and when it is an invention according to the author. I have sometimes tried to compel the public to return to the truth, and to destroy the legendary side of certain personages whom history, thanks to its documents, now represents to us as they were in reality, but the public never followed me. 
I soon realized that legend remains victorious in spite of history, and this is perhaps a good thing for the mind of the crowd. Jesus, John of Arc, Shakespeare, the Virgin Mary, Mahomet, and Napoleon I have all entered into legend. It is impossible now for our brain to picture Jesus and the Virgin Mary accomplishing humiliating human functions. They lived the life that we are living. Death chilled their sacred limbs, and it is not without rebellion and grief that we accept this fact. We start off in pursuit of them in an ethereal heaven. In the infinite of our dreams, we cast down all the dross of humanity in order to let them, clothed in the ideal, be seated on a throne of love. We do not like Joan of Arc to be the rustic, bold, peasant woman, repulsing violently the old soldier who wants to joke with her, sitting astride her big steed like a man, laughing readily at the coarse jokes of the soldiers, submitting to the lewd promiscuities of the barbarous epoch in which she lived, and having on that account all the more merit in remaining a most heroic maiden. We do not care for such useless truths. In the legend she is a fragile woman guided by a divine soul, her girl's arm, which holds the heavy banner, is sustained by an invisible angel. In her childish eyes there is something from another world, and it is from this that all the warriors get their strength and courage. It is thus that we wish it to be, and so the legend remains triumphant. Section 7 of Memories of My Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memories of My Life by Sarah Bernard A Decline Matrimony and Wed Art Part 2 But to return to the Conservatoire, nearly all the pupils had gone away, and I remained quiet and embarrassed on my bench. Marie Lloyd came and sat down by me. Are you unhappy? she asked. Yes, I answered. I wanted the first prize, and you have it. It is unjust. I do not know whether it is just or not, answered Marie Lloyd, but I assure you that it is not my fault. I could not help laughing at this. Shall I come home with you to luncheon? she asked, and her beautiful eyes grew moist and beseeching. She was an orphan and unhappy, and on this day of triumph she felt the need of a family. My heart began to melt with pity and affection. I threw my arms round her neck and we all four went away together, Marie Lloyd, Madame Gerard, Mademoiselle de Brabander, and I. My mother had sent me word that she had gone on home. In the cab, my don't care character won the day once more, and we chatted gaily about one and another of the people we had seen during the morning. Oh, how ridiculous such and such a person was! Did you see her mother's bonnet? And all the stemonet, did you see his white gloves? He must have stolen them from some policeman and hereupon we laughed like idiots, and then began again. And that poor Chatelaine had had his hair curled, said Mary Lloyd. Did you see his head? I did not laugh any more, though, for this reminded me of how my own hair had been uncurled, and that it was thanks to that I had not won the first prize for tragedy. On reaching home, we found my mother, my aunt, my godfather, our old friend Mélieu, Madame Gerard's husband, and my sister Jeanne, with her hair all curled. This gave me a pang, for she had straight hair, and it had been curled to make her prettier, although she was charming without that, and the curl had been taken out of my hair, so that I had looked uglier. My mother spoke to Marie Lloyd with a charming and distinguished indifference peculiar to her. My godfather made a great fuss over her, for success was everything to this bourgeois. He had seen my young friend a hundred times before, and had not been struck by her beauty, nor yet touched by her poverty, but on this particular day he assured us that he had for a long time predicted Marie Lloyd's triumph. He then came to me, put his hands on my shoulders, and held me facing him. Well, you were a failure, he said. Why persist now in going in for the theatre? You are thin and small, your face is rather nice close to, but ugly in the distance, and your voice does not carry. Yes, my dear girl, put in Monsieur Medieu, your godfather is right. You had better marry the flower man who proposed, or that imbecile of a Spanish tanner who lost his brainless head for the sake of your pretty eyes. You will never do anything on the stage. You better marry. Monsieur Gerard came and shook hands with me. He was a man of nearly sixty years of age, and Madame Gerard was under thirty. He was melancholy, gentle and shy. 
he had been awarded the distinction of the legion of honour and he wore a long shabby frock coat had aristocratic gestures and was private secretary to m de la tour de moulin a deputy very much in favour m gerard was a well of science and i owe a great deal to his kindness jeanne whispered to me sister's godfather said when he came in that you looked as ugly as possible jeanne always spoke of my godfather in this way i pushed her away and we sat down to table all through the meal my one wish was to go back to the convent i did not eat much and directly after luncheon was so tired that i had to go to bed when once i was alone in my room between the sheets with tired limbs my head heavy and my heart oppressed with keeping back my sighs i tried to consider my wretched situation but sleep the great restorer came to the rescue and i was very soon slumbering peacefully when i awoke i could not collect my thoughts at first i wondered what time it was and looked at my watch it was just ten and i had been asleep since three o'clock in the afternoon i listened for a few minutes but everything was silent in the house on a table near my bed was a small tray on which was a cup of chocolate and a cake a sheet of writing paper was placed upright against the cup i trembled as i took it up for i never received any letters with great difficulty by my night light i managed to read the following words written by madame gerard when you had gone to sleep the duc de montmagny sent word to your mother that camille Doucet had just assured him that you were to be engaged for the comedie francaise do not worry any more therefore my dear child but have faith in the future your petite dame i pinched myself to make sure that i was really awake i got up and rushed to the window i looked out and the sky was black yes it was black to everyone else but starry to me the stars were shining and i looked for my own special one and chose the largest and brightest i went back toward my bed and amused myself with jumping on to it holding my feet together each time i missed i laughed like a lunatic i then drank my chocolate and nearly choked myself devouring my cake standing up on my bolster i then made a long speech to the virgin mary at the head of my bed i adored the virgin mary and i explained to her my reasons for not being able to take the veil in spite of my vocation i tried to charm and persuade her and i kissed her very gently on her foot which was crushing the serpent then in the obscurity of the room i looked for my mother's portrait i could scarcely see this but i threw kisses to it I then took up the letter again from my petite dame and went to sleep with it in my mind. I do not remember what my dreams were that memorable night. The next day everyone was very kind to me. My godfather, who arrived early, nodded his head in a contented way. She must have some fresh air, he said. I will pay for a lando. The drive seemed to me delicious, for I could dream to my heart's content, as my mother disliked talking when in a carriage. Two days later, our old servant, Marguerite, breathless with excitement, brought me a letter. On the corner of the envelope, there was a wide stamp around which stood the magic words, Comédie Française. I glanced at my mother, and she nodded, as a sign that I might open the letter, after blaming Marguerite for giving me a letter before obtaining her permission to do so. It is for tomorrow, tomorrow, I exclaimed. I am to go there tomorrow, look, read it. My sisters came rushing to me and seized my hands. I danced round with them, singing, It is tomorrow, it is tomorrow. My younger sister was eight years old, but I was only six that day. I went upstairs to the flat on the top floor to tell Madame Girard. She was just sopping her children's white frocks and pinafores. She took my face in her hands and kissed me affectionately. Her two hands were covered with a soapy leather and left a snowy patch on each side of my head. I rushed downstairs again in that condition, and went noisily into the drawing-room. My godfather, Monsieur Medieu, my aunt and my mother, were just commencing whist. I kissed each of them, leaving a little lather on their faces, at which I laughed heartily. But I was allowed to do anything that day, for I had become a personage. The next day, Tuesday, I was to go to the Théâtre Français at one o'clock, to see Monsieur Thierry, who was then the rector. What was I to wear? That was the great question. My mother had sent for the milliner, who had arrived with various hats. I chose a white one trimmed with pale blue, a white bavole and blue strings. Aunt Rosine had sent one of her dresses for me, for my mother thought all my frocks were too childish. Oh, that dress! I shall see it all my life. 
it was hideous cabot green with black velvet put on in grecian pattern i looked like a monkey in that dress but i was obliged to wear it fortunately it was covered by a mantle of black gross grain stitched all round with white it was thought better for me to be dressed like a grown-up person and all my clothes were suitable only for a child mademoiselle de bramander gave me a pair of white gloves and madame grara sunshade my mother gave me a very pretty turquoise ring dressed up in this way looking pretty in my white hat and comfortable in my green dress but comforted by my mantle i went with madame gerard to monsieur thierry's my aunt let me her carriage for the occasion as she thought it would look better to arrive in a private carriage later on i found that this arrival in my own carriage with a footman made a very bad impression what all the theatre people thought i never cared to consider and it seems to me that my extreme youth might really have preserved me from all suspicion m thierry received me very kindly and made a little nonsensical speech he then unfolded a paper which he handed to madame gerard asking her to look at it and then to sign it this paper was my engagement and my petite dame explained that she was not my mother ah said m thierry getting up then will you take it with you and have it signed by mademoiselle's mother he then took my hand i felt an instinctive horror at the touch of his for it was flabby and there was no life or sincerity in his grasp i quickly took mine away and looked at him he was plain with a red face and eyes that avoided one's gaze as i was going away i met coquelin who hearing i was there had waited to see me he had made his debut a year before with great success well it's settled then he said gaily i showed him the engagement and shook hands with him i went quickly down the stairs and just as i was leaving the theatre found myself in the midst of a group in the doorway are you satisfied asked a gentle voice which i recognized as monsieur lucette oh yes monsieur thank you so much i answered but my dear child i have nothing to do with it he said your competition was not at all good but nevertheless we count on you put in monsieur renier and then turning to camille doucet he asked what do you think your excellency i think that this child will be a very great artist he replied there was silence for a moment well you have got a turn out exclaimed bouvalet rudely he was the first tragedian of the comedie and the worst bred man in france or anywhere else this turn out belongs to mademoiselle's aunt remarked camille doucet shaking hands with me gently oh well i would much rather it belong to her than to me answered the tragedian i then stepped into the carriage which had caused such a sensation at the theatre and drove away on reaching home i took the engagement to my mother she signed it without reading it and i then fully made up my mind to be someone quand même a few days later after my engagement at the comédie française my aunt gave a dinner party among her guests were the duc de morny camille doucet the minister of the bazaar monsieur de valesky rossini my mother mademoiselle de brabander and i during the evening a great many other people came my mother had dressed me very elegantly and it was the first time i had worn a really low dress oh how uncomfortable i was everyone paid me great attention rossini asked me to recite some poetry and i consented willingly glad and proud to be of some little importance i chose casimir de lavigne's poem l'âme du bouc etoile that should be said with music as an accompaniment exclaimed rossini when i came to an end everyone approved this idea and valesky said mademoiselle will begin again and you could improvise an accompaniment cher maître there was great excitement and i at once began again rossini improvised the most delightful harmony which filled me with emotion my tears flowed freely without my being conscious of them and at the end my mother kissed me saying this is the first time that you have really moved me as a matter of fact she adored music and it was rossini's improvisation that had moved her the comte de Calatry was also present an elegant young hussar who paid me great compliments and invited me to go and recite some poetry at his mother's house my aunt then sang a song which was very much in vogue and had great success she was coquettish and charming and just a trifle jealous of this insignificant niece who had taken up the attention of her admirers for a few minutes when i returned home i was quite another being i sat down dressed as i was on my bed and remained for a long time deep in thought hitherto all i had known of life had been through my family and my work 
I had now just had a glimpse of it through society, and I was struck by the hypocrisy of some of the people and the conceit of others. I began to wonder uneasily what I should do, shy and frank as I was. I thought of my mother. She did not do anything, though. She was indifferent to everything. I thought of my aunt Rosine, who on the contrary liked to mix in everything. I remained there looking down on the ground, my head in a wheel, and feeling very anxious, and I did not go to bed until I was thoroughly cold. Section 8 of Memories of My Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memories of My Life by Sarah Bernhardt. I make my debut and exit. The next few days passed by without any particular events. I was working hard at Iphigenie. As Monsieur Thierry had told me, I was to make my debut in this role. At the end of August, I received a notice requesting me to be at the rehearsal of Iphigenie. Oh, that first notice, how it made my heart beat. I could not sleep at night, and daylight did not come quickly enough for me. I kept getting up to look at the time. It seemed to me that the clock had stopped. I had dozed, and I fancied it was the same time as before. Finally, a streak of light coming through the window panes was, I thought, the triumphant sun illuminating my room. I got up at once, pulled back the curtains, and mumbled my role while dressing. I thought of rehearsing with Madame de Fillard, the first actress at the Comédie Française, for tragedy, with Maubant, with... I trembled as I thought of all this, for Madame de Fillard was not supposed to be very indulgent. I arrived for the rehearsal an hour before the time. The stage manager, de Venn, smiled and asked me whether I knew my role. Oh, yes, I exclaimed with conviction. Come and rehearse it. Would you like to? And he took me to the stage. I went with him through the long corridor of busts, which leads from the foyer of the artiste to the stage. He told me the names of the celebrities represented by these busts. I stood still a moment before that of Adrien Lacouveur. I love that artiste, I said. Do you know her story, he asked. Yes, I have read all that has been written about her. That's quite right, my child, said the worthy man. You ought to read all that concerns your art. I will lend you some very interesting books. He took me on toward the stage, the mysterious gloom, the scenery reared up like fortifications, the bareness of the floor, the endless number of weights, ropes, trees, freezes, Harrow's overhead, the yawning house completely dark, the silence broken by the creaking of the floor, and the vault-like chill that one felt. All this together awed me. It did not seem to me to be part of that brilliant frame for the living artiste who every night won the applause of the house by their merriment or their sobs. No, I felt as though I were in the tomb of dead glories, and the stage seemed to me to be getting crowded with the illustrious ghosts of those whom the manager had just mentioned. With my highly strung nerves, my imagination, which was always evoking something, now saw them advance toward me, stretching out their hands. These specters wanted to take me away with them. I put my hands over my eyes and stood still. "'Are you not well?' asked Monsieur de Ven. "'Oh, yes, thank you. It was just a little giddiness. His voice had chased away the specters, and I opened my eyes and paid attention to the worthy man's advice. Book in hand, he explained to me where I was to stand and my changes of place. He was rather pleased with my way of reciting, and he taught me a few of the traditions. At the line, Euripide all the tell, conduce la fictime, he said. Mademoiselle Favart was very effective there. The artistes gradually began to arrive, grumbling more or less. They glanced at me, and then rehearsed their scenes without taking any further notice of me at all. 
I felt inclined to cry, but I was more vexed than anything else. I heard a few words that sounded to me coarse, used by one or another of the artistes. I was not accustomed to such language, as at home everyone was rather scrupulous, and at my aunt's trifle affected, while at the convent it is unnecessary to say I had never heard a word that was out of place. It is true that I had been through the conservatoire, but I had not associated intimately with any of the pupils, with the exception of Marie Lloyd and Rose Beretta, the eldest sister of Blanche Beretta, who is now an associate of the Comédie Française. When the rehearsal was over, it was decided that there should be another one at the same hour the following day, in the public foyer. The costume maker came in search of me, as she wanted to try on my costume. Mademoiselle de Brabander, who had arrived during the rehearsal, went up with me to the costume room. She wanted my arms to be covered, but the costume maker told her gently that this was impossible for tragedy. A dress of white woolen material was tried on me. It was very ugly, and the veil was so stiff that I refused it. A wreath of roses was tried on, but this, too, was so ugly that I refused to wear it. Well, then, mademoiselle, said the costume maker dryly, you will have to get these things and pay for them yourself, as this is the costume supplied by the comedy. Very well, I answered, blushing. I will get them myself. On returning home, I told my mother my troubles, and, as she was always very generous, she promptly bought me a veil of white barrage that fell in beautiful, large, soft folds, and a wreath of hedge roses which, at night, looked very soft and white. She also ordered me buskins from the shoemaker employed by the comedy. The next thing to think about was the makeup box. For this, my mother had recourse to the mother of Dika Petit, my fellow student at the conservatoire. I went with Madame de Capetit to Monsieur Massin, a manufacturer of these makeup boxes. He was the father of Leotine Massin, another conservatoire pupil. We went up to the sixth floor of a house in the Rue Romère, and on a plain looking door read the words Massin, manufacturer of makeup boxes. I knocked, and a little hunchback girl opened the door. I recognized Leontine's sister, as she had come several times to the conservatoire. Oh, she exclaimed, what a surprise for us. Titin, she then called out, here is Mademoiselle Sarah. Leontine Messin came running out of the next room. She was a pretty girl, very gentle and calm in demeanor. She threw her arms round me, exclaiming, How glad I am to see you. And so you are coming out at the comedy? I saw it in the paper. I blushed up to my ears at the idea of being mentioned in the paper. I am engaged at the variété, she said, and then she talked away at such a rate that I was bewildered. Madame Petit did not enter into all this and tried in vain to separate us. She had replied by a nod and indifferent thanks, to Leontine's inquiries about her daughter's health. Finally, when the young girl had finished saying all she had to say, Madame Petit remarked, You must order your box. We have come here for that, you know. Ah, then you will find my father in his workshop at the end of the passage, and if you are not very long, I shall still be here. I am going to rehearsal at the varieties later on. Madame Petit was furious, for she did not like Leotin Messin. Don't wait, mademoiselle, she said. It will be impossible for us to stay afterwards. Leotin was annoyed, and shrugging her shoulders, she turned her back on my companions. She then put her hat on, kissed me, and bowing gravely to Madame Petit, remarked, Goodbye, madame, girl talks and I hope I shall never see you again. She then ran off, laughing merrily. I heard Madame Petit mutter a few disagreeable words in Dutch, but I did not understand the meaning of them at the time. 
We then went to the workshop and found old Messin at his workbench, planing some small planks of white wood. His hunchback daughter kept coming in and out, humming gaily all the time. The father was glum and harassed and had an anxious look. As soon as we had ordered the box, we took our leave. Madame Petit went out first and Leotine's sister then put her hand into mine and said quietly, Father was not very polite, but it is because he is jealous. He wanted my sister to be at the Théâtre Francaise. I was rather disturbed by this confidence, and I had a vague idea of the painful drama which was acting so differently on the various members of this humble home. On September 1st, 1862, the day I was to make my debut, I was in the Rue du Faux, looking at the theatrical posters. They used to be put up then, just at the corner of the Rue du Faux and the Rue saint Honoré. On the poster of the Comédie Française, I read the words, Debut of Mademoiselle Sarah Bernhardt. I have no idea how long I stood there, fascinated by the letters of my name, but I remember that it seemed to me as though every person who stopped to read the poster looked at me afterwards, and I blushed to the very roots of my hair. At five o'clock I went to the theater. I had a dressing room on the top floor, which I shared with Mademoiselle Coblanc. This room was on the other side of the Rue de Rucheleur, in a house rented by the Comédie Française. A small covered bridge over the street served as a passage and means of communication for us to reach the theater. I was a tremendously long time dressing and did not know whether I looked nice or not. My petite dame thought I was too pale and Mademoiselle de Brabander considered that I had too much color. My mother was to go direct to her seat in the theater and Aunt Rosine was away in the country. When we were told that the play was about to commence, I broke out into a cold perspiration from head to foot and felt ready to faint away. I went downstairs trembling, tottering, and my teeth chattering. When I arrived on the stage, the curtain was being raised. That curtain, which was raised so slowly and solemnly, was to me, like the veil being torn which was to let me have a glimpse of my future. A deep, gentle voice made me turn round. It was Provost, my first professor, who had come to encourage me. I greeted him warmly, so glad was I to see him again. Samson was there, too. I believe that he was playing that night in one of Moliere's comedies. The two men were very different. Provost was tall. His silvery hair was blown about and he had a droll face. Samson was small, precise, dainty. His shiny white hair curled firmly and closely round his head. Both men had been moved by the same sentiment of protection for the poor, fragile, nervous girl, who was, nevertheless, so full of hope. Both of them knew my zeal for work, my obstinate will, which was always struggling for the victory over my physical weakness. They knew that my device, condemnation, had not been adopted by me merely by chance, but that it was the outcome of a deliberate exercise of willpower on my part. My mother had told them how I had chosen this device at the age of nine, after a formidable jump over a ditch which no one could jump, and which my young cousin had dared me to attempt. I had hurt my face, broken my wrist, and was in pain all over. While I was being carried home, I exclaimed furiously, Yes, I would do it again, Grandmam, if anyone did me again, and I will always do what I want to do all my life. In the evening of that day, my aunt, who was grieved to see me in such pain, asked me what would give me any pleasure. My poor little body was all bandaged, but I jumped with joy at this and quite consoled, I whispered in a coaxing way. I should like to have some writing paper with a motto of my own. My mother asked me rather slyly what my motto was. I did not answer for a minute, and then, as they were all waiting quietly, I uttered such a furious cond mem that my aunt far started back muttering, 
What a terrible child. Samson and Provost reminded me of this story in order to give me courage. But my ears were buzzing so that I could not listen to them. Provost heard my catchword on the stage and pushed me gently forward. I made my entry and hurried toward Agamemnon, my father. I did not want to leave him again, as I felt I must have someone to hold on to. I then rushed to my mother, Clymenestra. I got through my part, and on leaving the stage, I tore up to my room and began to undress. Madame Girard was terrified and asked me if I was mad. I had only played in one scene, and there were four more. I realized then that it would really be dangerous to give way to my nerves. I had recourse to my own motto, and, standing in front of the glass, gazing into my own eyes, I ordered myself to be calm and to conquer myself. And my nerves, in a state of confusion, yielded to my brain. I got through the play, but was very insignificant in my part. The next morning, my mother sent for me early. She had been looking at Sarsi's article in L'Opinion Nationale, and she now read me the following lines. Mademoiselle Bernhardt, who made her debut yesterday in the role of Iphigenie, is a tall, pretty girl with a slender figure and very pleasing expression. The upper part of her face is remarkably beautiful. She holds herself well, and her enunciation is perfectly clear. This is all that can be said for her at present. The man is an idiot, said my mother, drawing me to her. You were charming. She then prepared a little cup of coffee for me and made it with cream. I was happy, but not completely so. When my godfather arrived in the afternoon, he exclaimed, Good heavens, my poor child, what thin arms you have. As a matter of fact, people had left and I had heard them. When stretching out my arms, I had said the famous lines in which Vavard had made a famous effect that was now a tradition. I certainly made no effect, unless the smiles caused by my long, thin arms can be reckoned such. My second appearance was in Valerie, when I did have some slight success. My third appearance at the comedy resulted in the following effusion from the pen of the same Sarsi. L'Opinion Nationale, September 12th. The same evening, Les Femmes Savantes was given. This was Mademoiselle Bernhardt's third appearance, and she took the role of Henriette. She was just as pretty and insignificant in this as in that of Junie. He had made a mistake, as it was Iphigenie I had played, and a Valerie, both of which roles had been entrusted to her previously. This performance was a very poor affair, and gives rise to reflections by no means gay. That Mademoiselle Bernhardt should be insignificant does not so much matter. She is a debutante, and among the number presented to us, it is only natural that some should be failures. The pitiful part is, though, that the comedians playing with her were not much better than she was, and they are societaires of the Théâtre Francaise. All that they had more than their young comrade was a greater familiarity with the boards. They are just as Mademoiselle Bernhardt may be in twenty years' time, if she stays at the Comédie Francaise. I did not stay there, though, for one of those nothings which change a whole life changed mine. I had entered the comedy expecting to remain there always. I had heard my godfather explain to my mother all about the various stages of my career. The child will have so much during the first five years, he said, and so much afterwards, and then at the end of thirty years she will have the pension given to associates, that is, if she ever becomes an associate. He appeared to have his doubts about this. My sister Regina was the cause, though quite involuntarily this time, of the drama which made me leave the comedy. It was Molière's anniversary, and all the artistes of the Frances had to salute the bust of the great writer, according to the tradition of the theater. It was to be my first appearance at a ceremony, and my little sister, 
on hearing me tell about it at home, besought me to take her to it. My mother gave me permission to do so, and our old Marguerite was to accompany us. All the members of the comedy were assembled in the foyer. The men and women, dressed in different costumes, all wore the famous doctor's cloak. The signal was given that the ceremony was about to commence, and everyone hurried to the corridor where the busts were. I was holding my little sister's hand, and just in front of us was the very fat and very solemn Madame Natalie. She was a societaire of the comedy, old, spiteful, and surly. Regina, in trying to avoid the train of Marie Rogers' cloak, stepped on to Natalie's, and the latter turned round and gave the child such a violent push that she was knocked against a column holding a bust. Regina screamed out, and, as she turned back to me, I saw that her pretty face was bleeding. "'You miserable creature!' I called out to the fat woman, and, as she turned round to reply, I slapped her in the face. She proceeded to faint. There was a great tumult, and an uproar of indignation, approval, stifled laughter, satisfied revenge, pity from those artists who were mothers, for the poor child, etc. Two groups were formed, one around the wretched Natalie, who was still in her swoon, and the other around little Regina, and the different aspect of these two groups was rather strange. Around Natalie were cold, solemn-looking men and women fanning the fat, helpless lump with their handkerchiefs or fans. A young, but severe-looking societaire was sprinkling her with drops of water. Natalie, on feeling this, roused up suddenly, put her hands over her face, and muttered in a faraway voice, "'How stupid! You'll spoil my makeup!' The younger man was stooping over Regina, washing her pretty face, and the child was saying in her broken voice, "'I did not do it on purpose, sister. I am certain I didn't. She's an old cow, and she just kicked for nothing at all. Regina was a fair-haired seraph who might have made the angels envious, for she had the most ideal and poetical beauty, but her language was by no means choice, and nothing in the world could change it. Her coarse speech made the friendly group burst out laughing, while all the members of the enemy's camp shrugged their shoulders. Brissant, who was the most charming of the comedians and a general favorite, came up to me and said, We must arrange this little matter, mademoiselle, for Natalie's short arms are really very long. Between ourselves, you were a trifle hasty, but I like that. And then that child is so droll and pretty, he added, looking at my little sister. The house was stamping with impatience, but this little scene had caused twenty minutes' delay and we were obliged to go on the stage at once. Marie Roger kissed me, saying, You are a plucky little comrade. Rose Beretta drew me to her, murmuring, How dared you to do it? She is a societaire. As for me, I was not very clear about what I had done, but my instinct warned me that I should pay dearly for it. The following day I received a letter from the manager asking me to call at the comedy at one o'clock about a matter concerning me privately. I had been crying all night long, more through nervous excitement than from remorse, and I was more particularly annoyed at the idea of the attacks I should have to endure for my own family. I did not let my mother see the letter, for from the day that I had entered the comedy, she had given me full liberty. I received my letters now direct, without her supervision, and I went about alone. At one o'clock precisely, I was shown into the manager's office. Monsieur Thierry, his nose more congested than ever, and his eyes more crafty, preached me a deadly sermon, blamed my want of discipline, absence of respect, and scandalous conduct, and finished his pitiful harangue by advising me to beg Madame Natalie's pardon. I have asked her to come, he added, and you must apologize to her before three societies belonging to the committee. If she consents to forgive you, the committee will then consider whether to fine you or to cancel your engagement. 
I did not reply for a few minutes. I thought of my mother in distress, my godfather laughing in his bourgeois way, and my aunt far triumphant with her usual phrase, That child is terrible. I thought, too, of my beloved Brabander, with her hands clasped, her mustache drooping sadly, her small eyes full of tears, so touching in their mute supplication. I could hear my gentle, timid Madame Gerard arguing with everyone, so courageous she was always in her confidence in my future. Well, mademoiselle, said Monsieur Thierry curtly, I looked at him without speaking, and he began to get impatient. I'll go and ask Madame Natalie to come here, he said, and I beg you will do your part as quickly as possible, for I have other things to attend to than to put your blunders right. Oh, no, do not fetch Madame Natalie, I said at last. I shall not apologize to her. I will leave. I will cancel my engagement at once. He was stupefied, and his arrogance melted away in pity for the ungovernable, willful child who was about to ruin her whole future for the sake of a question of self-esteem. He was at once gentler and more polite. He asked me to sit down, which he had not hitherto done, and he sat down himself opposite to me and spoke to me gently about the advantages of the comedy and of the danger that there would be for me in leaving that illustrious theater which had done me the honor of admitting me. He gave me a hundred other very good, wise reasons which softened me. When he saw the effect he had made, he wanted to send for Madame Natalie, but I roused up like a little wild animal. Oh, don't let her come here. I should slap her again, I exclaimed. Well then, I must ask your mother to come, he said. My mother would never come, I replied. Then I will go and call on her. It would be quite useless, I persisted. My mother has given me my liberty, and I am quite free to lead my own life. I alone am responsible for all that I do. Well then, mademoiselle, I will think it over, he said, rising to show me that the interview was at an end. I went back home determined to say nothing to my mother. But my little sister, when questioned about her wound, had told everything in her own way, exaggerating, if possible, the brutality of Madame Natalie and the audacity of what I had done. Rosa Beretta, too, had been to see me and had burst into tears, assuring my mother that my engagement would be cancelled. The whole family was very much excited and distressed when I arrived. And when they began to argue with me, it made me still more nervous. I did not take calmly the reproaches which one and another of them addressed to me, and I was not at all willing to follow their advice. I went to my room and locked myself in. The following day no one spoke to me, and I went up to Madame Gerard to be comforted and consoled. Several days passed by, and I had nothing to do with the theater. Finally, one morning... I received a notice requesting me to be present for the reading of a play. It was Dolores, by Monsieur de Bournier. This was the first time I had been asked to the reading of a new piece. I was evidently to have the creation of a role. All my sorrows were at once dispersed like a cloud of butterflies. I told my mother of my joy, and she naturally concluded that as I was asked to go to a reading, my engagement was not to be cancelled and I was not to be asked again to apologize to Madame Natalie. I went to the theater, and to my utter surprise, I received from Monsieur Devin the role of Dolores, the chief part in Borneo's play. I knew that Favart, who should have had this role, was not well, but there were other artistes for it, and I could not get over my joy and surprise. Nevertheless, I felt somewhat uneasy. A terrible presentiment has always warned me of any troubles about to come upon me. I had been rehearsing for five days when one morning on going upstairs, I suddenly found myself face to face with Natalie, seated under Jerome's portrait of Rachel, known as the Red Pimento. 
I did not know whether to go downstairs again or to pass by. My hesitation was noticed by the spiteful woman. Oh, you can go by, mademoiselle, she said. I have forgiven you, as I have avenged myself. The role that you like so much is not to be left to you after all. I went by without uttering a word. I was thunderstruck by her speech, which I guessed would prove true. I did not mention this incident to anyone, but continued rehearsing. It was on Tuesday that Natalie had spoken to me, and on Friday I was disappointed to hear that Devans was not there, and that there was to be no rehearsal. Just as I was getting into my cab, the hall porter ran out to give me a letter from Devans. The poor man had not ventured to come himself and give me the news, which he was sure would be so painful to me. He explained to me in his letter that on account of my extreme youth, the importance of the role, such responsibility for such young shoulders as Madame Favard had recovered from her illness, it was wiser, etc. I finished reading the letter through blinding tears, but very soon anger took the place of grief. I rushed back again and up to the manager's office. He could not see me just then, but I said I would wait. At the end of an hour, thoroughly impatient, taking no notice of the office boy and the secretary, who wanted to prevent my entering, I opened the door of Monsieur Thierry's office and walked in. I was desperate, and all that anger with injustice and fury with falsehood could inspire me with. I let him have in a stream of eloquence, only interrupted by my sobs. The manager gazed at me in bewilderment. He could not conceive of such daring and such violence in a girl so young. When at last, thoroughly exhausted, I sank down on an armchair. He tried to calm me, but all in vain. I will leave at once, I said. Give me back my engagement and I will send you back mine. Finally, tired of argument and persuasion, he called his secretary in, gave him the necessary orders, and the latter soon brought in my engagement. Here is your mother's signature, mademoiselle. I leave you free to bring it back within forty-eight hours. After that time, if I do not receive it, I shall consider that you are no longer a member of the theater. But believe me, you are acting unwisely. Think it over within the next forty-eight hours. I did not answer, but went out of his office. That very evening, I sent back to Monsieur Thierry the engagement bearing his signature and tore up the one with that of my mother. I had left Molière's theater and was not to re-enter it until twelve years later. Section 9 of Memories of My Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memories of My Life by Sarah Bernhardt Castles in Spain This proceeding of mine was certainly violently decisive, and it completely upset my home life. I was not happy from this time forth among my own people, as I was continually being blamed for my violence. Irritating remarks with a double meaning were constantly being made by my aunt and my little sisters. My godfather, whom I had once for all requested to mind his own business, no longer dared to attack me openly, but he influenced my mother against me. There was no longer any peace for me except at Madame Gerard's, and so I was constantly with her. I enjoyed helping her in her domestic affairs. She taught me to make cakes, chocolate, and scrambled eggs. All this gave me something else to think about, and I soon recovered my gaiety. One morning there was something very mysterious about my mother. She kept looking at the clock and seemed uneasy because of my godfather, who lunched and dined with us every day, had not arrived. It's very strange, my mother said. For last night, after whist, he said, you should be with us this morning before luncheon. It's very strange indeed. She was usually calm, 
but she kept coming in and out of the room, and when Marguerite put her head in at the door to ask whether she should serve the luncheon, my mother told her to wait. Finally, the bell rang, startling my mother and Jean. My little sister was evidently in the secret. Well, it's settled, exclaimed my godfather, shaking the snow from his head. Here, read that, you self-willed girl. He handed me a letter stamped with the words Teatro du Gymnase. It was from Montigny, the manager at this theater, to Monsieur de Quervois, a friend of my godfather's, whom I knew very well. The letter was very friendly, as far as Monsieur de Quervois was concerned, but it finished with the following words. I will engage your protege in order to be agreeable to you but she appears to me to have a vile temper. I blushed as I read these lines, and I thought my godfather was wanting intact, as he might have given me real delight and avoided wounding me in this way. But he was the clumsiest-minded man that ever lived. My mother seemed very much pleased, so that I kissed her pretty face and thanked my godfather. Oh, how I loved kissing that pearly face, which was always so cool, and always slightly dewy. When I was a little child, I used to ask her to play yet butterfly on my cheeks with her long lashes, and she would put her face close to mine and open and shut her eyes, tickling my cheeks while I lay back breathless with delight. The following day, I went to the gymnase. I was kept waiting for some little time, together with about fifty other girls. Monsieur Monval, a cynical old man who was stage manager and almost general manager, then interviewed us. I liked him at first because he was like Monsieur Girard, but I very soon disliked him. His way of looking at me, of speaking to me, and of taking stock of me generally roused my ire at once. I answered his questions curtly in our conversation which seemed likely to take an aggressive turn, was cut short by the arrival of Monsieur Montigny, the manager. Which of you is Mademoiselle Sarah Bernhardt, he asked. I at once rose, and he continued, Will you come into my office, Mademoiselle? Montigny had been an actor, and was plump and good-natured. He appeared to be somewhat infatuated with his own personality, with his ego, but that did not matter to me. After some friendly conversation, he preached a little to me about my outburst at the comedy and made me a great many promises about the roles he should give me. He prepared my engagement and gave it to me to take home for my mother's signature and that of my family. I am quite free, I said to him, so that my own signature is all that is required. Oh, very good, he said. But what nonsense to give such a self-willed girl full liberty. Your parents did not do you a good turn by that. I was just on the point of replying that what my parents chose to do did not concern him. But I held my peace, signed the engagement, and hurried home feeling very joyful. Montigny kept his word at first. He let me understudy Victoria Lafontaine, a young artiste, very much in vogue just then, who had the most delightful talent. I played in La Maison Sans Yvonne, and I took her role at a moment's notice in Le Demain de Jou, a piece which had great success. I was fairly good in both pieces, but Montaigne, in spite of my entreaties, never came to see me in them, and the spiteful stage manager played me various tricks. I used to feel a sullen anger stirring within me, and I struggled with myself as much as possible to keep my nerves calm. One evening on leaving the theater, a notice was handed to me requesting me to be present at a reading of a play the following day. Montigny had promised me a good role, and I fell asleep that night lulled by fairies who carried me off into the land of glory and success. On arriving at the theater, I found Blanche Pearson and Celine Montalant already there, two of the prettiest creatures that God had ever pleased to create. The one is fair as the rising sun, 
and the other as dark as a starry night. Well, she was brilliant looking in spite of her black hair. There were other women there, too. Very, very pretty ones. The play to be read was entitled Une Marie qui lance sa femme, and it was by Raymond Deslande. I listened to it without any great pleasure, and I thought it stupid. I waited anxiously to see what role was given to me, and I discovered this only too soon. It was a certain Princess Dimchenka, a frivolous, foolish, laughing individual who was always eating or dancing. I did not like this role at all. I was very inexperienced on the stage, and my timidity made me rather awkward. Then, too, I had not worked for three years with such persistency and conviction to create now the role of an idiotic woman in an imbecile play. I was in despair, and the wildest ideas came into my head. I wanted to give up the stage and go into business. I spoke of this to our old family friend, Maydier, who was so unbearable. He approved of my idea and wanted me to take a shop of confectioners on the Boulevard des Italiens. This became a fixed idea with the worthy man. He loved sweets himself, and he knew lots of recipes for kinds that were not generally known and which he wanted to introduce. I remember one kind that he wanted to call Bonbon Negra. It was a mixture of chocolate and essence of coffee to be rolled into grilled licorice root. It was like black praline and was extremely good. I was very persistent in this idea at first and went with Maydier to look at a shop. But when he showed me the little flat over it where I should have to live, it upset me so much that I gave up forever the idea of business. I went every day to the rehearsal of the stupid piece and was bad-tempered all the time. Finally, the first performance took place, and my part was neither a success nor a failure. I simply was not noticed, and at night my mother remarked, My poor child, you were ridiculous in your Russian prince's role, and I was very much grieved. I did not answer at all, but I should honestly have liked to kill myself. I slept very badly that night, and towards six in the morning, I rushed up to Madame Gerard's. I asked her to give me some laudanum, but she refused. When she saw that I really wanted it, the poor dear woman understood my idea. Well then, I said, swear by your children that you will not tell anyone what I am going to do, and that I will not kill myself. A sudden idea had just come into my mind and without weighing it, I wanted to carry it out at once. She promised, and I then told her that I should go at once to Spain, as I had wanted to see that country for a long time. Go to Spain, she exclaimed. With whom and when? With the money I have saved, I answered, and this very morning. Everyone is asleep at home. I shall go and pack my trunk and start at once with you. No, no, I cannot go, exclaimed Madame Gerard, nearly beside herself. There is my husband to think of, and then, too, I have my children. Her little girl was scarcely two years old at that time. Well, then, ma petite dame, find me someone to go with me. I do not know anyone, she answered, crying in her excitement. My dear little Sarah, give up such an idea, I beseech you. But by this time it was a fixed idea with me, and I was very determined about it. I went downstairs, packed my trunk, and then returned to Madame Gerard's. I had wrapped up a pewter fork and paper, and this I threw against one of the panes of glass in a skylight window opposite. The window was opened abruptly, and the sleepy, angry face of a young woman appeared. I made a trumpet of my two hands and called out, Caroline! Will you start with me at once to Spain? The bewildered expression on the young woman's face showed that she had not comprehended what I had said, but she replied at once. I am coming, mademoiselle. She then closed her window, and ten minutes later, Caroline was tapping at the door. Madame Gerard had sunk down aghast in an armchair. Monsieur Gerard 
had asked several times from his bedroom what was going on. Sarah is here, his wife had replied. I will tell you later on. Caroline did dressmaking by the day at Madame Gerard's, and she had offered her services to me as lady's maid. She was agreeable and rather daring, and she now accepted my offer at once. But as it would not do to arouse the suspicions of the concierge, it was decided that I should take her dresses in my trunk, and that she should put her linen into a bag that my petite dame should lend her. Poor dear Madame Gerard had given in. She was quite conquered and soon began to help in my preparations, which certainly did not take me long. The next thing was that I did not know how to get to Spain. You go through Bordeaux, said Madame Gerard. Oh, no, exclaimed Caroline. My brother-in-law is a skipper and he often goes to Spain by Marseille. I had saved 900 francs and Madame Gerard lent me 600. It was perfectly mad, but I felt ready to conquer the world and nothing would have induced me to give up my plan. Then, too, it seemed to me as though I had been wishing to see Spain for a long time. I had got it into my head that my fate willed it, that I must obey my star, and a hundred other ideas, each one more foolish than the other, strengthened me in my plan. I was destined to act in this way, I thought. I went downstairs again. The door was still ajar. With Carolyn's help, I carried the empty trunk up to Madame Gerard's, and Carolyn emptied my wardrobe and drawers, and then packed the trunk. I shall never forget that delightful moment. It seemed to me as though the world was about to be mine. I was going to start off with the woman to wait on me. I was about to travel alone, with no one to criticize what I decided to do. I should see an unknown country about which I had dreamed and I should cross the sea. Oh, how happy I was. Twenty times I must have gone up and down the staircase which separated our two flats. Everyone was asleep, and the flat was so constructed that not a sound of our going in and out could reach my mother. I could go through the kitchen for my bedroom without any difficulty. My trunk was at last strapped, Carolyn's valise fastened, and my little bag crammed full. I was quite ready to start, but the fingers of the clock had moved along by this time, and to my horror I discovered that it was eight o'clock. Marguerite would be going down from her bedroom at the top of the house to prepare my mother's coffee, my chocolate, and bread and milk for my sisters. In a fit of despair and wild determination, I kissed Madame Gerard with such violence as almost to stifle her and rushed once more to my room to get my little Virgin Mary, which went with me everywhere. I threw a hundred kisses to my mother's room, and then, with wet eyes and a joyful heart, went downstairs. My petite dame had asked the man who polished the floors to take the trunk and valise down, and Carolyn had fetched a cab. I went like a whirlwind past the concierge's door. She had her back turned toward me and was sweeping the floor. I sprang into the cab, and the driver whipped up his horses. I was on my way to Spain. I had written an affectionate letter to my mother, begging her to forgive me and not to be grieved. I had written a stupid letter of explanation to Montigny, the manager of the gymnase theater. The letter did not explain anything, though. It was written by a child whose brain was certainly a little affected, and I finished up with these words. Have pity on a poor, crazy girl. Sardou told me later on that he happened to be in Montigny's office when he received my letter. I had been talking to Montigny for over an hour, he said, about a piece I was going to write. The conversation was very animated, and when the door was opened, Montigny exclaimed in a fury, I had given orders that I was not to be disturbed. He was somewhat appeased, however, on seeing old Monvale's troubled look, and he knew there was some urgent matter. Oh, what's happened now, he asked, taking the letter that the old stage manager held out to him. On recognizing my paper, with its gray border, he said, Oh, it's from that mad child. Is she ill? No, said Monvale. She has gone to Spain. 
She can go to the deuce, exclaimed Montigny. Send for Madame de Yerdenay to take her part. Bernhardt has a good memory, and half the roll must be cut. That will settle it. Any trouble for tonight, Sardou asked Montigny. Oh, nothing, he answered. It is that little Sarah Bernhardt who has cleared off to Spain. That girl from the Frances who boxed Natalie's ears? Yes. She's rather amusing. Yes, but not for her managers, remarked Montigny, continuing immediately afterwards the conversation which had been interrupted. This is exactly as Victoria and Sardou related the incident. On arriving at Marseille, Caroline went to get information about the journey. The result was that we embarked on an abominable trading boat, a dirty coaster smelling of oil and steel fish, a perfect horror. I had never been on the sea, so I fancied that all the boats were like this and that it was no good complaining. After six days of rough sea, we landed Alicante. Oh, that landing, how well I remember it. I had to jump from boat to boat, from plank to plank, with the risk of falling into the water a hundred times over. For I am naturally inclined to dizziness, and the little bridges without any rails, rope, or anything, thrown across from one boat to another, and bending under my light weight, seemed to me like mere ropes stretched across space. Exhausted with fatigue and hunger, I went to the first hotel recommended to us at Alicante. Oh, what a hotel it was! The house itself was built of stone with low arcades. Rooms on the first floor were given to me, and certainly the owners of it had never had two ladies in their house before. The bedroom was large, but with a low ceiling. By way of decoration, there were enormous real fish bones, arranged in garlands caught up by the heads of fish. By half shutting one's eyes, this decoration might be taken for delicate sculpture of ancient times. I had a bed put up for Caroline in this sinister-looking room. We pulled the furniture across against the doors, and I did not undress, for I could not venture on those sheets. I was accustomed to find sheets perfumed with iris, for my pretty little mother, like all Dutch women, had a mania for linen and cleanliness, and she had inculcated me with this harmless mania. It was about five in the morning when I opened my eyes, no doubt instinctively, as there had been no sound to rouse me. A door, leading I did not know where, opened, and a man looked in. I gave a shrill cry, seized my little Virgin Mary, and waved her about wild with terror. Caroline roused up with a start and courageously rushed to the window. She threw it up, screaming, Fire! Thieves! Help! The man disappeared, and the house was soon invaded by the police. I leave it to be imagined what the police of Alicante forty years ago were like. I answered all the questions asked me by a vice consul who was Hungarian and spoke French. I had seen the man, and he had a silk handkerchief on his head. He had a beard, and on his shoulder a poncho. But that was all I knew. The Hungarian vice consul, who, I believe, represented France, Austria, and Hungary, asked me the color of the brigand's beard, silk handkerchief, and poncho. It had been too dark for me to distinguish the colors exactly. The worthy man was very much annoyed at my answer. After taking down a few notes, he was very thoughtful for a moment, and then gave orders for a message to be taken to his home. It was to ask his wife to send a carriage and to prepare a room in order to receive a young foreigner in distress. I prepared to go with him, and after paying my bill at the hotel, we started off in the Hungarian's carriage, and I was welcomed by his wife with the most touching cordiality. I drank the coffee with thick cream, which he poured for me, and, during breakfast, told her who I was and where I was going. She then told me in return that her father was an important manufacturer of cloth, that he was from Bohemia, and a great friend of my father's, and she took me to the room that had been prepared for me, made me go to bed, and told me that while I was asleep she would write me some letters of introduction in Madrid. 
I slept for ten hours without waking, and at six in the evening when I roused up, was thoroughly rested in mind and body. I wanted to send a telegram to my mother, but this was impossible, as there was no telegraph at El Acanti. I wrote a letter, therefore, to my poor dear mother, telling her that I was in the house of friends of my father. The following day I started for Madrid with a letter for the landlord of the Hotel de la Prete del Sol. Nice rooms were given to us, and I sent messengers with the letters from Madame Rutkowitz. I spent a fortnight in Madrid, and was made a great deal of and generally feted. I went to all the bullfights and was infatuated with them. I had the honor of being invited to a great corrida, given in honor of Victor Emmanuel, who was just then the guest of the Queen of Spain. I forgot Paris, my sorrows, disappointments, ambitions, and everything else, and I wanted to live in Spain. A telegram sent by Madame Gerard made me change all my plans. My mother was very ill, the telegram informed me. I packed my trunk and wanted to start off at once, but when my hotel bill was paid, I had not a fraction for the railway journey. The landlord of the hotel took my two banknotes, prepared me a basket of provisions, and gave me 200 francs at the station, telling me that he had received orders from Madame Rutkowitz not to let me want for anything. She and her husband were certainly most delightful people. My heart beat fast when I reached my mother's house in Paris. My petite Tom was waiting for me downstairs in the concierge's room. She was very excited to see me looking so well and kissed me with her eyes full of tears of joy. The concierge and family poured forth their compliments. Madame Gerard went upstairs before me to prepare my mother, and I waited a moment in the kitchen and was hugged by her old servant Marguerite. My sisters both came running in. Jean kissed me and turned me round and examined me. Regina, with her hands behind her back, leaned against the stove, gazing at me furiously. Well, won't you kiss me, Regina, I asked, stooping down to her. No, don't like you, she answered. You've went off without me. Don't like you now. She turned away brusquely to avoid my kiss and knocked her head against the stove. Finally, Madame Gerard appeared again, and I went with her. Oh, how repentant I was, and now deeply affected. I knocked gently at the door of the room, which was hung with pale blue rep. My mother looked very white lying in her bed. Her face was thinner, but wonderfully beautiful. She stretched out her arms like two wings, and I rushed forward to this loving white nest. My mother cried silently, as she always did. Then her hands played with my hair, which she let down, and combed with her long taper fingers. Then we asked each other a hundred questions. I wanted to know everything, and she did too, so that we had the most amusing duet of words, phrases, and kisses. I found that my mother had had a rather severe attack of pleurisy, that she was now getting better, but was not yet well. I therefore took up my abode again with her, and for the time being went back to my old bedroom. Madame Gerard had told me in a letter that my grandmother on my father's side had at last agreed to the proposal made by my mother. My father had left a certain sum of money which I was to have on my wedding day. My mother, at my request, had asked my grandmother to let me have half this sum, and she had at last consented saying that she should use the interest of the other half, but that the half would still be there for me if I changed my mind and consented to marry. I was, therefore, quite decided to live my life as I wished, to go away from home and be quite independent. I adored my mother, but our ideas were quite different. Then, too, my godfather was perfectly odious to me, and for years and years he had been in the habit of lunching and dining with us every day, and of playing whist every evening. He was always hurting my feelings in one way or another. He was an old bachelor, very rich, and with no near relatives. He adored my mother, 
but she had always refused to marry him. She had put up with him at first because he was a friend of my father. After my father's death, she had put up with him still because she was then accustomed to him until finally she quite missed him when he was ill or traveling. But, placid as she was, my mother was positive and could not endure any kind of constraint. She, therefore, rebelled against the idea of another master. She was very gentle, but determined, and this determination of hers ended sometimes in the most violent anger. She used then to turn very pale and violet rings would come round her eyes. Her lips would tremble, her teeth chatter, her beautiful eyes take a fixed gaze. The words would come at intervals from her throat, all chopped up, hissing and hoarse. After this she would faint, and the veins of her throat then used to swell, and her hands and feet turn icy cold. Sometimes she would be unconscious for hours, and the doctors told us that she might die in one of these attacks, so that we did all in our power to avoid these terrible accidents. My mother knew this and rather took advantage of it, and, as I had inherited this tendency to fits of rage from her, I could not and did not wish to live with her. As for me, I am not placid. I am active and always ready for fight, and what I want I always want immediately. I have not the gentle obstinacy peculiar to my mother, the blood begins to boil under my temples before I have time to control it. Time has made me wiser in this respect, but not sufficiently so. I am aware of this, and it causes me suffering. I did not say anything about my plans to our dear invalid, but I asked our old friend, Maidier, to find me a flat. The old man who had tormented me so much during my childhood had been most kind to me ever since my debut at the Théâtre Francais, and in spite of my escapade with Natalie and my exploit when at the gymnase, he was now ready to see the best in me. When he came to see us the day after my return home, I stayed talking with him for a time in the drawing room and confided my intentions to him. He quite approved and said that my intercourse with my mother would be all the more agreeable through this separation. I took a flat in the Rue du Faux, quite near to my mother, and Madame Girard undertook to have it furnished for me. As soon as my mother was well again, I talked to her about it, and several times over induced her to agree that it was really better I should live by myself, and in my own way. When once she had accepted the situation, everything went along satisfactorily. My sisters were present when we were talking about it. Jean was close to my mother, and Regina, who had refused to speak to me or look at me ever since my return three weeks ago, suddenly jumped on my lap. "'Take me with you this time,' she exclaimed suddenly. "'I will kiss you if you will.' I glanced at my mother, rather embarrassed. Oh, take her, she said, for well, she is unbearable. Regina jumped down again and began to dance a jig, muttering the rudest, silliest things at the same time. She then nearly stifled me with kisses, sprang onto my mother's armchair and kissed her hair, her eyes, her cheeks, saying, You are glad I am going, aren't you? You can give everything to your Jenny. My mother colored slightly. But as her eyes fell on Jean, her expression changed, and a look of unspeakable affection came over her face. She pushed Regina gently aside, and the child went on with her jig. We two will stay together, said my mother, leaning her head back on Jean's shoulder, and she said this quite unconscious of the full force of her words, just in the same way as she had gazed at my sister. I was perfectly stupefied and closed my eyes so that I should not see. I could only hear my little sister dancing her jig and emphasizing every stamp on the floor with the words, Are we too, as well, we too, we too. It was a very painful little drama that was stirring our four hearts in this little bourgeois home, and the result of it was that I settled down finally with my little sister in the flat in Rue Dufault. I kept Caroline with me and engaged a cook. 
My petite dame, Madame Gerard, was with me nearly all day, and I dined every evening with my mother. Section 10 of Memories of My Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memories of My Life by Sarah Bernhardt I Return to the Stage I was still on friendly terms with an actor from the Port saint Martin Theatre, who had been appointed stage manager there. Mark Fournier, who was at that time manager of this theatre, a piece entitled La Biche au Bois, was then being played. It was a fairyland story, and was having great success. A delicious actress from the Odeon Theatre, Mademoiselle Dubay, had been engaged for the principal role. She played tragedy princesses most charmingly. I often had tickets for the Port saint Martin, and I thoroughly enjoyed La Biche au Bois. Madame Olgaard sang admirably in her role of the young prince and amazed me. Then, too, Marquita charmed me with her dancing. She was delightful in her dances, which were so animated, so characteristic, and always so full of distinction. Thanks to old Joss, I knew everyone. But to my surprise and terror one evening, toward five o'clock, on arriving at the theater to take our seats, he exclaimed on seeing me, Why, here is our princess, our little biche au bois. Here she is. It is the providence that watches over theaters who has sent her. I struggled like an eel caught in a net, but it was all in vain. Monsieur Marc Fournier, who could be very charming, gave me to understand that I should be doing him a veritable service and keeping up the receipts. Joss, who guessed what my scruples were, exclaimed, But my dear child, it will still be your high art, for it is Mademoiselle de Bay from the Odeon Theatre who is playing this role of princess, and Mademoiselle de Bay is the first artiste at the Odeon, and the Odeon is an imperial theatre, so that it cannot be any disgrace after your studies. Marquita, who had just arrived, also persuaded me, and Madame Olgade was sent for to rehearse the duos I was to sing. Yes, and I was to sing with a veritable artiste, one who was considered to be the first artiste of the opera comique. The time passed by, and Joss helped me to rehearse my role, which I almost knew as I had seen the piece often, and I had an extraordinary memory. The minutes flew, and the half hours made up entire hours. I kept looking at the clock, the large clock in the manager's room, where I was studying my role. Madame Olgade rehearsed with me. She thought my voice was pretty, but I kept singing wrong, and she helped and encouraged me all the time. I was dressed up in Mademoiselle de Pay's clothes, and finally the moment arrived and the curtain was raised. Poor me! I was more dead than alive, but my courage returned after a triple burst of applause for the couplet which I sang on waking, in very much the same way as I should have murmured a series of Racine's lines. When the performance was over, Mark Fournier offered me, through Joss, a three years engagement, but I asked to be allowed to think it over. Joss had introduced me to a dramatic author, Lambert Tebost a charming man who was certainly talented, too. He thought I was just the ideal actress for his heroine, La Bergère d'Ivre. But Monsieur Fail, an old actor who had become the manager of the Ambigo Theatre, was not the only person to consult. A certain Monsieur de Chilly had some interest in the theatre. He had made his name in the role of Rodin in the Juif Errant, and, after marrying a rather wealthy wife, had left the stage, and was now interested in the business side of theatrical affairs. He had, I think, just given the ambiguous up to fail. De Chilly was then helping on a charming girl named Laurence Girard. She was gentle and very bourgeois, rather pretty, 
but without any real beauty or grace. Phil told Lambert T. Boast that he had spoken to Laurent Girard, but that he was ready to do as the author wished in the matter. The only thing he stipulated was that he should hear me before deciding. I was willing to humor the poor fellow, who must have been as poor a manager as he had been an artiste. I acted for him at the Ambigu Theatre. The stage was only lighted by the wretched servant, a little transportable lamp. About a yard in front of me I could see Monsieur Fail balancing himself on his chair, one hand on his waistcoat, and the fingers of the other hand in his enormous nostrils. This disgusted me horribly. Lambert, he boast, was seated near him, his handsome face smiling, as he looked at me encouragingly. I was playing in On Ne Badine par la Fec L'Amour, because the play was in prose, and I did not want to take poetry. I believe I was perfectly charming in my role, and Lambert, T. boast, thought so too. But when I had finished, poor Fail got up in a clumsy, pretentious way, said something in a low voice to the author, and took me to his own room. My child, remarked the worthy but stupid manager, you are not at all suitable for the stage. I resented this, but he continued, Oh, no, not at all. And as the door then opened, he added, pointing to the newcomer, Here is Monsieur de Shirley, who was also listening to you, and he will say just the same as I say. Monsieur de Shelley nodded and shrugged his shoulders. Lambert T. Boast is mad, he remarked. No one ever saw such a thin shepherdess. He then rang the bell and told the boy to fetch Mademoiselle Laurent Girard. I understood, and, without taking leave of the two boys, I left the room. My heart was heavy, though, as I went back to the foyer, where I had left my hat. I found Laurent Girard there but she was fetched away the next moment. I was standing near her, and, as I looked in the glass, I was struck by the contrast between us. She was plump with a wide face, magnificent black eyes. Her nose was rather cannoneal, her mouth heavy, and there was a very ordinary look about her generally. I was fair, slight, and frail-looking, like a reed, with a long pale face, blue eyes, a rather sad mouth, and a general look of distinction. This hasty vision consoled me for my failure, and then, too, I felt that this fail was a non-entity, and that it surely was common. Five days later, Mademoiselle de Bay was well again, and took her role as usual. I was destined to meet with both of these men again later on in my life. Shelley, soon after, as manager of the Odeon, and fail twenty years later, in such a wretched situation that the tears came to my eyes when he appeared before me and begged me to play for his benefit. I beseech you, said the poor man, you will be the only attraction at this performance, and I have only you to count on for the receipts. I shook hands with him. I do not know whether he remembered our first interview, but I remembered it well, and could only hope that he did not. Before I would accept the engagement at the Port Saint-Martin, I wrote to Camille Doucet. The following day, I received a letter asking me to go to the offices of the ministry. It was not without some emotion that I went to see this kind man. He was standing up waiting for me when I was ushered into the room. He held out his hands to me and drew me gently toward him. Oh, what a terrible child, he said, giving me a chair. Come now. You must be calmer. It will never do to waste all these admirable gifts in voyages, escapades, and boxing people's ears. I was deeply moved by his kindness, and my eyes were full of regret as I looked at him. Now, don't cry, my dear child, don't cry. Let us try and find out how we are to make up for all this folly. He was quiet for a moment, and then, opening a drawer, he took out a letter. Here is something which will perhaps save us, he said. It was a letter from Duquesse Nell, who had just been appointed manager at the Odeon Theatre, together with Shilly. I am asked with some young artistes to make up the Odeon Company. 
Well, we must attend to this. He got up and, accompanying me to the door, said as I went away, We shall succeed. I went back home and began at once to rehearse all my roles in Racine's plays. I waited very anxiously for several days, consoled by Madame Gerard, who succeeded in restoring my confidence. Finally, I received a letter and went at once to the ministry. Camille Doucette received me with a beaming expression on his face. It's settled, he said. Oh, but it has not been easy, though, he added. You are very young, but very celebrated already for your headstrong character. The only thing is, I have pledged my word that you will be as gentle as a young lamb. Yes, I will be gentle, I promise, I replied, if only out of gratitude. But what am I to do? Here is a letter for Felix de Castel, he replied. He is expecting you. I thank Camille to set heartily, and he then said, I shall see you again less officially at your aunt's on Thursday. I have had an invitation this morning to dine there, so you can tell me then what to Castel says. It was then half past ten in the morning. I went home to put some pretty clothes on. I chose an underskirt of canary yellow, a dress of black silk, with a skirt scalloped round, and a straw hat trimmed with corn and black ribbon. It must have been delightfully mad-looking. I raid in this style, feeling very joyful and full of confidence. I went to call on Felix dos Cadnel. I waited a few moments in a little room very artistically furnished. A young man appeared, looking very elegant. He was smiling and altogether charming. I could not grasp the fact that this fair-haired, gay young man would be my manager. After a short conversation, we agreed on every point we touched. Come to the Odeon at two o'clock, said Deuce Cudnell, by way of leave-taking, and I will introduce you to my partner. I ought to say it the other way around, according to society etiquette, he added, laughing. But we are talking theater. He came a few steps down the staircase with me, and stayed there leaning over the balustrade to wish me good-bye. At two o'clock precisely, I was at the Odeon, and had to wait an hour. I began to grind my teeth, and only the remembrance of my promise to Camille Doucette prevented me from departing. Finally, Ducasnel appeared and took me across to the manager's office. You will now see the other ogre, he said, and I pictured to myself the other ogre, as charming as his partner. I was therefore greatly disappointed on seeing a very ugly little man, whom I recognized as Shirley. He eyed me up and down most impolitely, and pretended not to recognize me. He signed to me to sit down and, without a word, handed me a pen and showed me where to sign my name on the paper before me. Madame Girard interposed, laying her hand on mine. Do not sign without reading it, she said. Are you mademoiselle's mother, he asked, looking up. No, she said, but it is just the same as though I were. Well, yes, you are right. Read it quickly, he continued, and then sign or leave it alone, but be quick. I felt the color coming into my face, for this man was odious. Discussnell whispered to me. There's no ceremony about him. But he's all right. Don't take offense. I signed my engagement and handed it to his ugly partner. You know, he remarked, Monsieur Descanel is responsible for you. I should not, upon any account, have engaged you. And if you had been alone, Monsieur, I answered, I should not have signed. So we are quits. I went away at once and hurried to my mother's to tell her, for I knew this would be a great joy for her. Then, that very day, I set off with my petite dame to buy everything necessary for furnishing my dressing room. The following day, I went to the convent in the Rue Notre Dame des Champs to see my dear governess, Mademoiselle de Bravendeur. She had been ill with acute rheumatism in all her limbs for the last thirteen months. She had suffered so much that she looked like a different person. She was lying in her little white bed a little white cap covering her hair. Her big nose was drawn with pain. Her washed-out eyes seemed to have no color in them. 
her formidable mustache alone bristled up with constant spasms of pain. Besides all this, she was so strangely altered that I wondered what had caused the change. I went near and, bending down, kissed her gently. I then gazed at her so inquisitively that she understood instinctively. With her eyes, she signed to me to look on the table near her, and there in a glass I saw all my dear old friend's teeth. I put the three roses I had brought her in the glass, and, kissing her again, I asked her forgiveness for my impertinent curiosity. I left the convent with a very heavy heart, for the mother superior took me in the garden and told me that my beloved Mademoiselle de Brabander could not live much longer. I therefore went every day for a time to see my gentle old governess, but as soon as the rehearsals commenced at the Odeon, my visits had to be less frequent. One morning about seven o'clock, a message came from the convent to fetch me in great haste, and I was present at the dear woman's death agony. Her face lighted up at the supreme moment with such a holy look that I suddenly longed to die. I kissed her hands, which were holding the crucifix. They had already turned cold. I asked to be allowed to be there when she was placed in her coffin. On arriving at the convent the next day, at the hour fixed, I found the sisters in such a state of consternation that I was alarmed. What could have happened, I wondered. They pointed to the door of the cell without uttering a word. The nuns were standing round the bed, on which was the most extraordinary-looking being imaginable. My poor governess, lying rigid on her deathbed, had a man's face. Her mustache had grown longer, and she had a beard of half an inch all round her chin. Her mustache and beard were sandy, while the long hair framing her face was white. Her mouth, without the support of the teeth, had sunk in so that her nose fell on the sandy mustache. It was like a terrible and ridiculous-looking mask, instead of the sweet face of my friend. It was the face of a man, while the little, delicate hands were those of a woman. There was an awestruck expression in the eyes of the nuns in spite of the assurance of the nurse, who had declared to them, that the body was that of a woman. They had dressed the poor dead body, but the poor little sisters were trembling and crossing themselves all the time. The day after this dismal ceremony, I made my debut with the Odeon in Le Jeu de l'Amour et du Hazard. I was not suitable for Marvin's pieces, as they require a certain coquettishness and an affectation which were not then among my qualities. Then, too, I was rather too slight, so that I had no success at all. Shirley happened to be passing along the corridor, just as Duke Cresnell was talking to me and encouraging me. Shirley pointed to me and remarked, They are no good, these grand folks. There is not even any pluck about them. I was furious at the man's insolence, and the blood rushed to my face, but I saw through my half-closed eyes Camille Doucette's face, that face always so clean-shaven and young-looking, under his crown of white hair. I thought it was a vision of my mind, which was always on the alert, on account of the promise I had made. But no, it was he himself, and he came up to me. "'What a pretty voice you have,' he said. "'Your second appearance will be such a pleasure to us.' "'This man was always courteous, but truthful. "'This debut of mine had not given him any pleasure, "'but he was counting on my next appearance, "'and he had spoken the truth. "'I had a pretty voice, "'and that was all that anyone could say. "'I remained at the Odeon and worked very hard.' I was always ready to take anyone's place at a moment's notice, for I knew all the roles. I had some success, and the students approved of me. When I came on the stage, I was always greeted by applause from them. A few old sticklers looked down at the pit to command silence, but no one cared a straw for them. Finally, my day of triumph dawned. 
Drew Kersnell had the happy idea of putting Athelie on again with Mendelssohn's choruses. Beauvillet, who had been odious as a professor, was charming as a comrade. By special permission from the ministry, he was to play Jog. The role of Zachary was assigned to me. Some of the conservatoire's pupils were to take the spoken choruses, and the pupils who studied singing undertook the musical part. The rehearsals were so bad that Duquesnel and Shirley were in despair. Beauvillet, who was more agreeable now, but not choice as regarded his language, muttered some terrible words. We began over and over again, but it was all to no purpose. The spoken choruses were simply abominable. Shirley exclaimed at last, Well, let the young one say all the spoken choruses. That would be right enough with her pretty voice. Duke Kisnell did not utter a word, but he pulled his mustache to hide a smile. Shirley was coming round to his protege after all. He nodded his head in an indifferent way in answer to his partner's questioning look, and we began again, I reading all the spoken choruses. Everyone applauded, and the conductor of the orchestra was delighted, for the poor man had suffered enough. The first performance was a veritable small triumph for me. Oh, quite a small one, but still full of promise for my future. The public charmed with the sweetness of my voice and its crystal purity, encored the part of the spoken choruses, and I was rewarded by three bursts of applause. At the end of the act, he came to me and said, You were adorable. He addressed me familiarly, using the French thou, and this rather annoyed me, but I answered mischievously, using the same form of speech, you think I am not so thin now? He burst into a fit of laughter, and from that day forth we both used the familiar thou and became the best friends imaginable. Oh, that Odeon Theatre. It's the theatre I have loved most. I was very sorry to leave it, for everyone liked each other there, and everyone was gay. The theatre was a little like the continuation of school. The young artiste came there, and Du Casnel was an intelligent manager, and very polite and young himself. During the rehearsal, we often went off, several of us together, to play at hide-and-seek in the Luxembourg, during the scenes in which we were not acting. I used to think of my few months at the Comédie Française. The little world I had known there had been stiff, scandal-mongering, and jealous. I recalled my few months at the gymnase. Hats and dresses were always discussed there, and everyone chattered about a hundred things that had nothing to do with art. At the Odeon, I was very happy. We thought of nothing but putting on plays, and we rehearsed morning, afternoon, and at all hours, and I liked that very much. For the summer, I had taken a little house in the Via Montmorency at Antwil, I went to the theater in A Little Duke, which I drove myself. I had two wonderful ponies that Aunt Rosine had given to me, because they had very nearly broken her neck by taking fright at St. Cloud at a whirligig of wooden horses. I used to drive at full speed along the quays, and in spite of the atmosphere brilliant with the July sunshine and the gaiety of everything outside, I always ran up the cold, cracked steps of the theater with veritable joy, and rushed up to my dressing room, wishing everyone I passed good morning on my way. When I had taken off my coat and gloves, I went on the stage, delighted to be once more in that infinite darkness with only a poor light, a savant, hanging there and there on a tree, a turret, a wall, or placed on a bench, thrown on the faces of the artiste for a few seconds. There was nothing more vivifying for me than that atmosphere full of microbes, nothing more gay than that obscurity, and nothing more brilliant than that darkness. One day my mother had the curiosity to come behind the scenes. I thought she would have died with horror and disgust. 
Oh, you poor child, she murmured. How can you live in that? When once she was outside again, she began to breathe freely, taking long gasps several times. Oh, yes, I could live in it, and I could scarcely live except in it. Since then, I have changed a little, but I still have a great liking for that gloomy workshop in which we joyous lapidaries of art cut the precious stones supplied to us by the poets. The days passed by, carrying away with them all our little disappointed hopes, and fresh days dawned bringing fresh dreams, so that life seemed to me eternal happiness. I played in turn in La Marquis de Bellemer and Francois Le Champy. In the former I took the part of the foolish baroness, an expert woman at thirty-five years of age. I was scarcely twenty-one myself, and I looked seventeen. In the second piece I played Mariette, and had great success. Those rehearsals of the Marquis de Bellemer and Francois Le Champy have remained in my memory as so many exquisite hours. Madame George Sand was a sweet, charming creature, extremely timid. She did not talk much, but smoked all the time. Her large eyes were always dreamy, and her mouth, which was rather heavy and common, had the kindest expression. She had, perhaps, a medium-sized figure, but she was no longer upright. I used to watch her with the most romantic affection, for had she not been the heroine of a fine love romance? I used to sit down by her, and when I took her hand in mine, I held it as long as possible. Her voice, too, was gentle and fascinating. Prince Napoleon, commonly known as Plon Plon, often used to come to George Sand's rehearsals. He was extremely fond of her. The first time I ever saw that man, I turned pale and felt as though my heart had stopped beating. He looked so much like Napoleon the First. Madame Sand introduced me to him in spite of my wishes. He looked at me in an impertinent way, and I did not like him. I scarcely replied to his compliments and went closer to George Sand. Why, she is in love with you, he exclaimed, laughing. George Sand stroked my cheek gently. She is my little Madonna, she answered. Do not torment her. I stayed with her, casting displeased and furtive glances at the prince. Gradually, though, I began to enjoy listening to him, for his conversation was brilliant, serious, and at the same time witty. He sprinkled his discourses and his replies with words that were a trifle crude, but all that he said was interesting and instructive. He was not very indulgent, though, and I have heard him say base, horrible things about little tears, which I believe had little truth in them. He drew such an amusing portrait one day of that agreeable Louis Bouillet that George Sand, who liked him, could not help laughing, although she called the prince a bad man. He was very unceremonious, too, but at the same time he did not like people to be wanting in respect to him. One day an artiste named Paul de Chey, who was playing in Francois Le Champy, came into the artist's foyer. Prince Napoleon was there, Madame George Sand, the curator of the library, whose name I have forgotten, and I. This artiste was common and something of an anarchist, he bowed to Madame Sand and, addressing the prince, said, You are sitting on my gloves, sir. The prince scarcely moved, pulled the gloves out and, throwing them on the floor, remarked, I thought this seat was clean. The actor colored, picked up the gloves, and went away murmuring some revolutionary threat. I played the part of Hortense in Le Testament de César Giraudot and of Anna Danby in Alexander Dumas's Keen. On the evening of the first performance of the latter piece, the public was very disagreeable. Dumas' pair was quite out of favor, on account of a private matter that had nothing to do with art. Politics for some time past 
had been exciting everyone, and the return of Victor Hugo from exile was very much desired. When Dumas entered his box, he was greeted by yells. The students were there in full force, and they began shouting for Rue Blas. Dumas rose and asked to be allowed to speak. My young friends, he began, as soon as they were silenced. We are quite willing to listen, called out someone, but you must be alone in your box. Dumas protested vehemently. Several members of the orchestra took his side, for he had invited a woman into his box, and whoever that woman might be, no one had any right to insult her in so outrageous a manner. I had never yet witnessed a scene of this kind. I looked through the hole in the curtain and was very much interested and excited. I saw a great Dumas, pale with anger, clenching his fists, shouting, swearing, and storming. Then suddenly there was a burst of applause. The woman had disappeared from the box. She had taken advantage of the moment when Dumas, leaning well over the front of the box, was answering. No, no, this woman shall not leave the box. Just at this moment she slipped away, and the whole house, delighted, shouted, Bravo! Dumas was then allowed to continue, but only for a few seconds. Cries of Rublas, Rublas, Victor Hugo, Hugo, could then be heard again in the midst of an uproar truly infernal. We had been ready to commence the play for an hour, and I was greatly excited. Shirley and Duquesnel then came to us on the stage. Courage, mes enfants, for the house has gone mad, they said. We will commence anyhow. Let what will happen. I'm afraid I shall faint, I said to Duquesne now. My hands were as cold as ice and my heart was beating wildly. What am I to do, I asked him, if I get too frightened? There's nothing to be done, he replied. Be frightened, but go on playing, and don't faint upon any account. The curtain was drawn up in the midst of a veritable tempest. Bird cries, mewing of cats, and a heavy rhythmical refrain of Rublas, Rublas, Victor Hugo, Victor Hugo. My turn came. Burton Payer, who was playing Keen, had been received badly. I was wearing the eccentric costume of an English woman in the year 1820. As soon as I appeared, I heard a burst of laughter, and I stood still, rooted to the spot in the doorway. But the very same instant the cheers of my dear friends, the students, drowned the laughter of the disagreeable people. I took courage and even felt a desire to fight. But it was not necessary, for after the second, endlessly long harangue, in which I give an idea of my love for Keen, the house was delighted and gave me an ovation. Ignotus wrote the following paragraph in the Figaro. Mademoiselle Sarah Bernhardt appeared wearing an eccentric costume, which increased the tumult, but her rich voice, that astonishing voice of hers, appealed to the public, and she charmed them like a little Orpheus. After Keen, I played in La Loterie du Mariage. When we were rehearsing the piece, Aga came up to me one day, in the corner where I usually sat, I had a little armchair there from my dressing room and put my feet up on a straw chair. I liked this place because there was a little gas burner there and I could work while waiting for my turn to go on the stage. I loved embroidering and tapestry work. I had a quantity of different kinds of fancy work commenced and could take up one or the other as I felt inclined. Mademoiselle Agar was an admirable creature. She had evidently been created for the joy of the eyes. She was a brunette, tall, pale, with large, dark, gentle eyes, a very small mouth with full, rounded lips, which went up at the corners in an almost imperceptible smile. She had exquisite teeth, and her head was covered with thick, glossy hair. She was the living incarnation of one of the most beautiful types of ancient Greece. 
Her pretty hands were long and rather soft, while her slow and rather heavy walk completed the evocation. She was the great tragedian of the Odeon Theatre. She approached me with her measured tread, followed by a young man of from twenty-four to twenty-six years of age. Well, my dear, she said, kissing me, there is a chance for you to make a poet happy. She then introduced Francois Copé. I invited the young man to sit down, and then I looked at him more thoroughly. His handsome face, emaciated and pale, was that of the immortal Bonaparte. A thrill of emotion went through me, for I adored Napoleon I. Are you a poet, monsieur, I asked. Yes, mademoiselle. His voice, too, trembled, for he was still more timid than I was. I have written a little piece, he continued, and Mademoiselle Agar is sure that you will play it with her. Yes, my dear, put in Agar, you are going to play it for him. It is a little masterpiece, and I am sure you will have a gigantic success. Oh, and you too. You will be so beautiful in it, said the poet, gazing rapturously at Agar. I was called onto the stage just at this moment, and on returning a few minutes later, I found the young poet talking in a low voice to the beautiful tragedian. I coughed, and Agar, who had taken my armchair, wanted to give it back. On my refusing it, she pulled me down on her lap. The young man drew up his chair, and we chatted away together, our three heads almost touching. It was decided that after reading the piece, I should show it to Duke Chasnel who alone was capable of judging poetry, and that we should then get permission from both managers to play it for the benefit of Monsieur X. After the first performance, the young man was delighted, and his pale face lighted up with a grateful smile as he shook hands excitedly. Agar walked away with him as far as the little landing, which projected over the stage. I watched them as they went the magnificent statue-like woman, and the slender outline of the young writer. Agar was perhaps thirty-five at that time. She was certainly very beautiful, but to me there was no charm about her, and I could not understand why this poetical Bonaparte was in love with this matronly woman. It was as clear as daylight that he was, and she too appeared to be in love. This interested me infinitely. I watched them clasp each other's hands, and then, with an abrupt and almost awkward movement, the young poet bent over the beautiful hand he was holding and kissed it fervently. Aga came back to me with a faint color in her cheeks. This was rare with her, for she had a marble-like complexion. Here is the manuscript, she said, giving me a little roll of paper. The rehearsal was over, and I wished Aga goodbye and on my way home, read the piece while driving. I was so delighted with it that I drove straight back to the theater to give it to Duke Castell at once. I met him coming downstairs. Do come back again, please, I exclaimed. Good heavens, my girl, what is the matter, he asked. You look as though you have won a big lottery prize. Well, it is something like that, I said and entering his office, I produced the manuscript. Read this, please, I continued. I'll take it with me, he said. Oh, no, read it here at once, I insisted. Shall I read it to you? No, no, he replied. Your voice is treacherous. It makes charming poetry of the worst lines possible. Well, let me have it, he continued, sitting down in his armchair. He began to read while I looked at the newspapers. It's delicious, he soon exclaimed. It's a perfect masterpiece. I sprang to my feet in my joy. And you will get your lead to accept it? Oh, yes. You can make your mind easy. But when do you want to play it? Well, the author seems to be in a great hurry, I said. And Agar, too. And you as well, he put in, laughing but this is a role that just suits your fancy. Yes, my dear Duke, I acknowledged. I, too, want it put on at once. Do you want to be very nice, I added? If so, 
Let us have it for the benefit of Monsieur X in a fortnight from now. That would not make any difference to other arrangements, and our poet would be so happy. Good, said Du Casnel. I will settle it like that. What about the scenery, though, he muttered, meditatively, biting his nails, which were his favorite meal when disturbed in his mind. I had already thought that out, so I offered to drive him home, and on the way I put my plan before him. We might have the scenery of Jean de Seigneury, a piece that had recently been put on and taken off again immediately, after being jeered at by the public. The scenery consisted of a superb Italian park, with flowers, statues, and even a flight of steps. As to costumes, if we spoke of them to Chili, no matter how little they might cost, he would shriek, as he had done in his role of Rodin. The only thing for it was that Agar and I would have to supply our own costumes. On arriving at Duquesnel's house, he suddenly asked me to go in with him and discuss the costumes with his wife. I accepted his invitation, and, after kissing the prettiest face imaginable, I told the owner of the face about our plot. She approved of everything, and promised to begin at once to look out for pretty designs for our costumes. While she was talking, I compared her with Agar. Oh, how much I preferred that charming head with its fair hair, those large limpid eyes, and the whole face with its two little pink dimples. Her hair was soft and light, and formed a halo round her forehead. I admired, too, her delicate wrists, finishing with the prettiest hands imaginable, hands that were, later on, quite famous. On leaving the friendly couple, I drove straight to Agar's to tell her what had happened. She kissed me over and over again, and a cousin of hers, a priest, who happened to be there, appeared to be very delighted with my story. He seemed to know about everything. Presently there was a timid ring at the bell, and Francois Copé was announced. I'm just going away, I said to him, as I met him in the doorway and shook hands. Agar will tell you everything. The rehearsals of his piece, La Passant, commenced very soon after this, and were delightful, for the shy young poet was a most interesting and intelligent talker. The first performance took place as arranged, and Le Passant was a veritable triumph. The whole house cheered over and over again, and the curtain was raised eight times for Agar and me. We tried in vain to bring the author forward, as the public wished to see him. Francois Copé was not to be found. The young poet, hitherto unknown, had become famous within a few hours. His name was on all lips. As for Agar and myself, we were simply overwhelmed with praise, and Shirley wanted to pay for our costumes. We played this one-act piece more than a hundred times consecutively to a full house. We were asked to give it at the Tuileries and at the house of the Princess Matilda. Oh, that first performance at the Tuileries. It is stamped on my brain forever, and with my eyes shut I can see every detail again, even now. It had been managed between Duquesnel and the officials sent from the court that Agar and I should go to the Tuileries to see the room where we were to play in order to have it arranged according to the requirements of the feast. The Comte de la Ferriere was to introduce me to the Emperor, who would then introduce me to the Empress Eugenie. Aga was to be introduced by the Princess Matilda, for whom she was then sitting as Minerva. Monsieur de la Ferriere came for me at nine o'clock in a state carriage, and Madame Gerard accompanied me. Monsieur de la Ferriere was a very agreeable man with rather stiff manners. As we were turning round the Rue Royale, the carriage had to draw up an instant, and General Fleury approached us. I knew him, as he had been introduced to me by Morny. He spoke to us, and the Comte de la Ferriere explained where we were going. As he left us, he said to me, "'Good luck!' Just at that moment, a man who was passing by took up the words and called out, Good luck, perhaps, 
but not for long, you crowd of good-for-nothings. On arriving at the Tuileries Palace, we all three got out of the carriage and were shown into a small yellow drawing room on the ground floor. I will go and inform His Majesty that you are here, said Monsieur de la Ferriere, leaving us. When alone with Madame Gerard, I thought I would rehearse my three courtesies. Now, ma petite dame, I said, tell me whether they are right. I made the courtesies, murmuring, Sire, sire, I began over again several times, looking down at my dress as I said, Sire, when suddenly I heard a stifled laugh. I stood up quickly, furious with Madame Gerard, but I saw that she, too, was bent over in a half-circle. I turned round quickly, and behind me was the Emperor. He was clapping his hands silently and laughing quietly, but still he was laughing. My face flushed, and I was embarrassed, for I wondered how long he had been there. I had been courtesying I do not know how many times, trying to get my reverence to my mind, and saying, There, that's too low, though. There, is that right, Gerard? Good heavens, I now said to myself. Has he heard all that? In spite of my confusion, I now made my courtesy again. But the emperor said, smiling, It's no use. It could not be better than it was just now. Save them for the Empress, who is expecting you. Oh, that, just now, I wondered when it had been. I could not question Madame Gerard, as she was following at some distance with Monsieur de la Ferriere. The Emperor was at my side, talking to me of a hundred things, but I could only answer in an absent-minded way on account of that just now. I liked him much better like this, quite near, than in his portraits. He had such fine eyes, which he half closed while looking through his long lashes. His smile was sad and rather mocking. His face was pale and his voice faint, but seductive. We found the Empress seated in a large armchair. Her body was encased in a gray dress and seemed to have been molded into the material. I thought her very beautiful. She, too, was more beautiful than her portrait. I made my three courtesies under the laughing eyes of the emperor. The emperor spoke, and the spell was then broken. That rough, hard voice coming from that brilliant woman gave me a shock. From that moment I felt ill at ease with her, in spite of her graciousness and her kindness. As soon as Agar arrived and had been introduced, the Empress had us conducted to the large drawing room where the performance was to take place. The measurements were taken for the platform, and there was to be the flight of steps where Agar had to pose as the unhappy courtesan, cursing mercenary love and longing for ideal love. This flight of steps was quite a problem, they were supposed to represent the first three steps of a huge flight, leading up to a Florentine palace, and had to be half hidden in some way. I asked for some shrubs and flowering plants, which I arranged along all three of the steps. The Prince Imperial, who had come in, was then about thirteen years of age. He helped me to arrange the plants, and laughed wildly when Agar mounted the steps to try the effect. He was delicious, with his magnificent eyes with heavy lids like those of his mother, and with his father's long eyelashes. He was witty like the emperor, whom people surnamed Louis the Imbecile, and who certainly had the most refined, subtle, and at the same time the most generous wit. We arranged everything as well as we could, and it was decided that we should return two days later for a rehearsal before their majesties. How gracefully the Prince Imperial asked permission to be present at the rehearsal. His request was granted, and the Empress then took leave of us in the most charming manner. But her voice was very ugly. She told the two ladies who were with her to give us wine and biscuits and to show us over the palace if we wished to see it. I did not care much about this, but... Ma petite dame and Agar 
seemed so delighted at the offer that I gave in to them. I have regretted ever since that I did so, for nothing could have been uglier than the private rooms, with the exception of the emperor's study and the staircases. This inspection of the palace bored me terribly. A few of the pictures consoled me, and I stayed some time gazing at Unterhalter's portrait representing the Empress Eugenie. She looked beautiful, and I thanked heaven that the portrait could not speak, for it served to explain and justify the wonderful good luck of Her Majesty. The rehearsal took place without any special incident. The young prince did his utmost to prove to us his gratitude and delight, for it was a dress rehearsal on his account, as he was not to be present at the soiree. He sketched my costume, and intended to have it copied for a costume ball, which was to be given for the imperial child. Our performance was in honor of the Queen of Holland, accompanied by the Prince of Orange, commonly known in Paris as Prince Citron. A rather amusing incident occurred during the evening. The Empress had remarkably small feet, and, in order to make them look still smaller, she forced them into shoes that were too narrow. She looked wonderfully beautiful that night, with her pretty sloping shoulders emerging from a dress of pale blue satin, embroidered with silver. On her lovely hair she was wearing a little diadem of turquoises and diamonds, and her small feet were on a cushion of silver brocade. All through Coppe's piece, my eyes wandered frequently to this cushion, and I saw the two little feet moving restlessly about. Finally, I saw one of the shoes pushing its little brother very, very gently, and then I saw the heel of the empress come out of its prison. The foot was then only covered at the toe, and I was very anxious to know how it would get back, for, under such circumstances, the foot swells and cannot go into a shoe that is too narrow. When the piece was over, we were recalled twice, and as it was the empress who gave the signal for the applause, I thought she was putting off the moment for getting up, and I saw her pretty little sore foot trying in vain to get back into its shoe. The light curtain went down, and as I told Agar about the cushion drama, we watched the various phases through the divisions in the curtains. The emperor rose, and everyone followed his example. He offered his arm to the Queen of Holland, but she looked at the Empress, who had not yet risen. The Empress' face lighted up with that smile which I had already seen. He said a word to General Fleury, and immediately the generals and other officers on duty, who were seated behind the sovereigns, formed a rampart between the crowd and the Empress. The Emperor and the Queen of Holland then passed on, without appearing to have noticed Her Majesty's distress, and the Prince of Orange, with one knee on the ground, helped the beautiful sovereign to put on her Cinderella-like slipper. I saw that the Empress leaned more heavily on the Prince's arm than she liked, for her pretty foot was evidently rather painful. We were then sent for to be complimented, and we were surrounded and feted so much that we were delighted with our evening. Section 11, Chapter 10 of Memories of My Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are made in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sarah Oakley. Memories of My Life by Sarah Bernhardt. In Fire and War. After Le Passant and the famous success of that adorable piece, a success in which Agar and I had our share, she thought more of me and began to like me. He insisted on paying for our costumes, which was great extravagance for him. I had become the adored queen of the students, and I used to receive little bouquets of violets, sonnets, and long, long poems, too long to read. Sometimes on arriving at the theater, as I was getting out of my carriage, I received a shower of flowers which simply covered me, and I was delighted and used to thank my worshippers. The only thing was that their admiration blinded them, so that when in some pieces I was not so good, 
and the house was rather cherry of applause, my little army of students would be indignant and would cheer wildly without rhyme or reason. I can understand quite well that this used to exasperate the regular subscribers of the Odeon, who were very kindly disposed toward me, nevertheless. They, too, used to spoil me, but they would have liked me to be more humble and meek and less headstrong. How many times one or another of those old subscribers would come and give me a word of advice? Mademoiselle, you were charming and dreamy, one of them observed, but you bite your lips, and the Roman women never did that. My dear girl, another one said, you were delicious in François le Champy, but there is not a single Briton woman in the whole of Brittany with her hair frizzed. A professor from the Sorbonne said to me one day, rather curtly, It is a want of respect, mademoiselle, to turn your back on the public. But, monsieur, I replied, I was accompanying an old lady to a door at the back of the stage. I could not walk along with her backward. The artistes we had before you, mademoiselle, who were quite as talented, found a way of going across the stage without turning their backs on the public. With this, he turned quickly on his heels and was going away, but I stopped him. Monsieur, will you go to that door through which you intended to pass without turning your back on me? He made an attempt and then furious turned his back on me and disappeared, slamming the door after him. I lived for some time at 16 Rue Aubert in a flat on the first floor, which was rather a nice one. I had furnished it with old Dutch furniture, which my grandmother had sent me. My godfather advised me to insure against fire, as this furniture, he assured me, constituted a small fortune. I decided to follow his advice and asked my petite dame to take the necessary steps for me. A few days later, she told me that someone would call about it on the 12th. On the day in question, toward two o'clock, a gentleman called. But I was in an extremely nervous condition and could not see anyone. I had refused to be disturbed and had shut myself up in my bedroom in a frightfully depressed state. That same evening, I received a letter from the fire insurance company asking me which day their agent might call to have the agreement signed. I replied that he might come on Saturday. On Friday, I was so utterly wretched that I sent to ask my mother to come and lunch with me. I was not playing that day, as I never used to play on Tuesdays and Fridays, the days we went through our repertory, for, as I was playing every other day in new pieces, it was feared that I should be overtired. My mother on arriving thought I looked very pale. Yes, I replied, I do not know what is the matter with me, but I am in a very nervous state and most depressed. The governess came to fetch my little boy to take him out for a walk but I would not let him go. Oh, no, I exclaimed. The child must not leave me today. I am afraid of something happening. What happened was fortunately of a less serious nature than I, with my love for my family, was dreading. I had my grandmother living with me at that time, and she was blind. It was the grandmother who had given me most of my furniture. She was a spectral-looking woman, and her beauty was of a cold, hard type. She was fearfully tall, and she looked like a giantess. She was thin and very upright, and her long arms were always stretched in front of her, feeling for all the objects in her way, so that she might not knock herself, although she was always accompanied by the attendant whom I had engaged for her. Above this long lady was her little face, with two immense pale blue eyes, which were always open even when asleep through the night. She was generally dressed from head to foot in gray, and this neutral color gave something unreal to her general appearance. My mother, after trying to comfort me, went away about two o'clock. My grandmother, seated opposite me in her large Voltaire armchair, questioned me. What are you afraid of? she asked. Why are you so mournful? I have not heard you laugh all day. I did not answer, but looked at my grandmother. It seemed to me that the trouble I was dreading would come through her. Are you not there? 
she persisted. Yes, I am here, I answered, but please do not talk to me. She did not utter another word, but with her two hands on her lap, sat there for hours. I sketched her strange, prophet-like face. It began to grow dusk, and I thought I would go and dress after being present at the meal taken by my grandmother and the child. My friend, Rose Beretta, was dining with me that evening, and I had also invited a most charming man who was very intelligent and distinguished. His name was Charles Haas. Arthur Meyer came too, a young journalist already very much in vogue. I told them about my forebodings with regard to that day and begged them not to leave me before midnight. After that, I said, it will not be today and the wicked sprites who are watching me will have missed their chance. They agreed to humor my fancy, and Arthur Meyer, who ought to have gone to some first night at one of the theaters, gave it up. Dinner was more animated than luncheon had been, and it was nine o'clock when we left the table. Rose Beretta sang us some delightful old songs. I went away for a minute to see that all was right in my grandmother's room. I found my maid with her head wrapped up in cloths, soaked in sedative water. I asked what was the matter, and she said that she had a terrible headache. I told her to prepare my bath and everything for me for the night, and then to go to bed. She thanked me and obeyed. I went back to the drawing room, and sitting down to the piano played Il Baccio, Mendelssohn's Bells, and Weber's Last Thought. I had not come to the end of this last melody when I stopped, suddenly hearing cries in the street of, Fire! Fire! They are shouting fire! exclaimed Arthur Meyer. That's all the same to me, I said, shrugging my shoulders. It's not midnight yet, and I am expecting my own misfortune. Charles Haas had opened the drawing room window to see where the shouts were coming from. He stepped out on the balcony and then came quickly in again. The fire is here! he exclaimed. Look. I rushed to the window and saw the flames coming from the two windows of my bedroom. I ran back through the drawing room to the corridor and then to the room where my child was sleeping with his governess and nurse. They were all fast asleep. Arthur Meyer opened the hall door, the bell of which was being rung violently. I roused the two women quickly, wrapped the sleeping child in his blankets, and rushed to the door with my precious burden. I then ran downstairs and, crossing the street, took him to Guadicelli's chocolate shop opposite, just at the corner of Rue de Comartin. The kind man took my little slumberer in, let him lie on the couch, where the child continued his sleep without any break. I left him in charge of his governess and his nurse, and went quickly back to the flaming house. The firemen who had been sent for had not yet arrived, and at all costs I was determined to rescue my poor grandmother. It was impossible to go back up the principal staircase, as it was filled with smoke. Charles Haas, bareheaded and in evening dress, a flower still in his buttonhole, started with me up the narrow back staircase. We were soon on the first floor, but when once there my knees shook, it seemed as though my heart had stopped, and I was seized with despair. The kitchen door at the top of the first flight of stairs was locked with a triple turn of the key. My willing companion was tall, slight, and elegant, but not strong. I besought him to go down and fetch a hammer, a hatchet, or something, but just at that moment, a newcomer wrenched the door open by a violent plunge with his shoulder against it. This new arrival was no other than Monsieur Sauvage, a friend of mine. He was a most charming and excellent man, a broad-shouldered Alsatian, well-known in Paris, very lively and kind, and always ready to do anyone a service. I took my friends to my grandmother's room. She was sitting up in bed, out of breath, with calling Catherine, the servant who waited upon her. This maid was about twenty-five years of age a big strapping girl from Burgundy, and she was now sleeping peacefully in spite of the uproar in the street, the noise of the fire engines, which had arrived at last, and the wild shrieks of the occupants of the house. 
Soez shook the maid while I explained to my grandmother the reason of the tumult and why we were in her room. Very good, she said, and then she added calmly, Will you give me the box, Sarah, that you will find at the bottom of the wardrobe? The key of it is here. But, Grandmother, I exclaimed, the smoke is beginning to come in here. We have not any time to lose. We'll do as you like. I shall not leave without my box. With the help of Charles Haas and Arthur Meyer, we put my grandmother on Soege's back in spite of herself. He was of medium height, and she was extremely tall, so that her long legs touched the ground, and I was afraid she might get them injured. Soege, therefore, took her in his arms, and Charles Haas carried her legs. We then set off, but the smoke stifled us, and after descending about ten stairs, I fell down in a faint. When I came to myself, I was in my mother's bed. My little boy was asleep in my sister's room, and my grandmother was installed in a large armchair. She sat bolt upright, frowning and with an angry expression on her lips. She did not trouble about anything but her box until at last my mother was angry and reproached her severely in Dutch with only caring for herself. She answered excitedly, and her neck craned forward as though to help her head to peer through the perpetual darkness which surrounded her. Her thin body wrapped in an Indian shawl of many colors, the hissing of her strident words which flowed freely, all contributed to make her resemble a serpent in some terrible nightmare. My mother did not like this woman, who had married my grandfather when he had six big children, the eldest of whom was sixteen, and the youngest, my uncle, five years. This second wife had never had any children of her own, and she had been indifferent and even hard toward those of her husband, and consequently she was not liked in the family. I had taken her in because smallpox had broken out in the family with whom she had been boarding. She had then wished to stay with me, and I had not had courage enough to oppose her. On the occasion of the fire, though, I considered she behaved so badly that a strong dislike to her came over me, and I resolved not to have her any longer in my house. News of the fire was brought to us. It continued to rage and burned everything in my flat, absolutely everything, even to the very last book in my library. My greatest trouble was that I lost a magnificent portrait of my mother by Bassompierre Severin, a pastelist very much in vogue under the empire, an oil portrait of my father, and a very pretty pastel of my sister Jeanne. I had not much jewelry, and all that was found of the bracelet given to me by the emperor was a huge shapeless mass, which I still have. I had a very pretty diadem, set with diamonds and pearls, given to me by Kabil Bey after a performance at his house. The ashes of this had to be riddled in order to find the stones. The diamonds were there, but the pearls had melted. I was absolutely ruined. For the money that my father and his mother had left me, I had spent in furniture, curiosities, and a hundred other useless things, which were the delight of my life. I had, too, and I own it was absurd, a tortoise named Prisagère. Its back was covered with a shell of gold set with very small blue, pink, and yellow topazes. Oh, how beautiful it was, and how droll! It used to wander around my flat, accompanied by a small tortoise named Zerbinette, which was its servant and I amused myself for hours watching Crisager flashing with a hundred lights under the rays of the sun or the moon. Both my tortoises died in this fire. Du Quesnel, who was very kind to me at that time, came to see me a few weeks later, for he had just received a summons from the fire insurance company whose papers I had refused to sign the day before the catastrophe. The company claimed a heavy sum from me for damages to the other tenants of the house. The second story was almost entirely destroyed, and for many months the whole building had to be propped up. I did not possess the 40,000 francs claimed. Duquesnel offered to give a benefit performance for me, which would, he said, free me from my difficulty. 
De Chuyi was very willing to agree to anything that would be of service to me. This benefit was a wonderful success thanks to the presence of the adorable Adelina Patti. The young singer, who was then the Marquise de Co, had never before sung at a benefit performance, and it was Arthur Meyer who brought me the news that La Patti was going to sing for me. Her husband came during the afternoon to tell me how glad she was of this opportunity of proving to me her sympathy. As soon as the fairy bird was announced, every seat in the house was promptly taken, at prices which were higher than those originally fixed. She had no reason to regret her friendly action, for never was any triumph more complete. The students greeted her with three cheers as she came on the stage. She was a little surprised at this noise of bravos and rhythm. I can see her now coming forward, her two little feet encased in pink satin. She was like a bird, hesitating as to whether it would fly or remain on the ground. She looked so pretty, so smiling, and when she trilled out the gem-like notes of her wonderful voice, the whole house was delirious with excitement. Everyone sprang up, and the students stood on their seats, waved their hats and handkerchiefs, nodded their young heads in their feverish enthusiasm for art, and encored with intonations of the most touching supplication. The divine singer then began again, and three times over she had to sing the cavatina from the Barber of Seville, Una Voce Poca Fa. I thanked her affectionately afterwards, and she left theater escorted by the students who followed her carriage for a long way, shouting over and over again, Long live Adelina Patti! Thanks to that evening's performance, I was able to pay the insurance company. I was ruined all the same, or very nearly so. I stayed a few days with my mother, but we were so cramped for room there that I took a furnished flat in the Rue de l'Arcade. It was a wretched house, and the flat was dark. I was wondering how I should get out of my difficulties when one morning, Monsieur C., my father's notary, was announced. This was the man I disliked so much, but I gave orders that he should be shown in. I was surprised that I had not seen him for so long a time. He told me that he had just returned from Hombourg, that he had seen in the newspaper an account of my misfortune, and had now come to put himself at my service. In spite of my distrust, I was touched by this, and I related to him the whole drama of my fire. I did not know how it had started, but I vaguely suspected my maid Josephine of having placed my lighted candle on the little table to the left of the head of my bed. I had frequently warned her not to do this, but it was on this little piece of furniture that she always placed my water bottle and glass and a dessert dish with a couple of raw apples for I like eating apples when I wake in the night. On opening the door, there was always a terrible draft, as the windows were left open until I went to bed. On closing the door after her, the lace bed curtains had probably caught fire. I could not explain the catastrophe in any other way. I had several times seen the young servant do this stupid thing, and I supposed that on that night in question, she had been in a hurry to go to bed on account of her bad headache. As a rule, when I was going to undress myself, she prepared everything and then came in and told me, but this time she had not done so. As a rule, too, I just went into the room myself to see that everything was right, and several times I had been obliged to move the candle. That day, however, was destined to bring me misfortune of some kind, though it was not a very great one. But, said the notary, you were not insured then. No, I was going to sign my policy the day after the event. Ah, exclaimed the man of law. And to think that I had been told you set the flat on fire yourself for the sake of picking up a large sum for damages. I shrugged my shoulders, for I had seen insinuations to this effect in a newspaper. I was very young at this time, but I already had a certain disdain for tittle-tattle. Oh, well, I must arrange matters for you, if things are like this, said Maitressy. You are really better off than you imagine as regards the money on your father's side, he continued. As your grandmother leaves you an annuity, 
You can get a good amount for this by agreeing to insure your life for 250,000 francs for 40 years for the benefit of the purchaser. I agreed to everything and was only too delighted at such a windfall. This man promised to send me, two days after his return, 120,000 francs, and he kept his word. My reason for giving the details of this little episode, which after all belongs to my life, is to show how differently things turn out from what seems likely, according to logic or according to our own expectations. It is quite certain that the accident, which just then happened to me, scattered to the winds the hopes and plans of my life. I had arranged for myself a luxurious home with the money that my father and his mother had left me. I had reserved and placed out the amount necessary to complete my monthly salary for the next two years, and I was reckoning that at the end of the two years, I should be in a position to demand a very large salary. And all these arrangements had been upset by the carelessness of a domestic. I had rich relatives and very rich friends, but not one among them stretched out a hand to help me out of the ditch into which I had fallen. My rich relatives had not forgiven me for going on to the stage, and yet, heaven knows what tears it had cost me to take up this career that had been forced upon me. My uncle, Faure, came to see me at my mother's house, but my aunt would not listen to a word about me. I used to see my cousin secretly, and sometimes his pretty sister. My rich friends considered that I was wildly extravagant and could not understand why I did not place the money I had inherited in good, sound investments. I received a great deal of poetry on the subject of my fire. Most of the pieces were anonymous. I have kept them, however, and I quote the following one, which is rather nice. Façon, te voilà sans abri, la flamme a ravagé ton gîte. Hier, plus légère qu'un colibri, ton esprit d'aujourd'hui s'agite. S'exhalant en gémissement sur tout ce que le feu dévore. Tu pleures tes beaux diamants? Non, tes grands dieux les ont encore. Ne regrette pas ces colliers, qu'on a leur cou les riches dames. Tu trouveras dans les alliés des tissus verts aux fines trames. Ta perle, mais c'est le jet noir. Qui, sur l'envers du fossé puce, est le cadre de ton miroir, est une bordure de mousse. Tes bracelets, mais tes bras nus, tu paraîtras sans toi plus belle. Sur les bras polis de Vénus, aucun cercle d'or n'est en celle. Garde ton charme si puissant, ton parfum de plantes sauvages. Laisse les bijoux, au passant, à celle que le temps ravage. Avec ta guitare à ton cou, va. Par la France et par l'Espagne, suis ton chemin, je ne sais où, par la plaine et par la montagne. Passe comme la plume au vent, comme le son de ta main d'or, comme un flot qui pèse en rêvant, les flancs d'une barque sonore. The proprietor of one of the hotels, now very much in vogue, sent me the following letter, which I quote word for word. Madame, if you would consent to dine every evening for a month in our large dining room, I would place at your service a suite of rooms on the first floor consisting of two bedrooms, a large drawing room, a small boudoir, and a bathroom. It is, of course, understood that the suite of rooms would be yours, free of charge, if you would consent to do as I ask. Yours truly, etc. P.S. You would only have to pay for the fresh supplies of plants for your drawing room. This was the extent of the man's coarseness. I asked one of my friends to go and give the low fellow his answer. I was in despair, though, for I felt that I could not live without comfort and luxury. I soon made up my mind as to what I must do, but not without great sorrow. I had been offered a magnificent engagement in Russia, and I should have to accept it. Madame Gerard was my sole confidante, and I did not mention my plan to anyone else. The idea of Russia terrified her, 
for at that time my chest was very delicate, and cold was my most cruel enemy. It was just as I had made up my mind to this that the lawyer arrived. His avaricious and crafty mind had schemed out the clever and, for him, profitable combination, which was to change my whole life once more. I took a pretty flat on the first floor of a house in the Rue de Rome. It was very sunny, and that delighted me more than anything else. There were two drawing rooms and a large dining room. I arranged for my grandmother to live at a home kept by lay sisters and nuns. She was a Jewess and carried out very strictly all the laws laid down by her religion. The house was very comfortable, and my grandmother took with her her own maid, the young girl from Burgundy, to whom she was accustomed. When I went to see her, she told me that she was much better off there than with me. When I was with you, she said, I found your boy too noisy. I very rarely went to visit her there, for after seeing my mother turn pale at her unkind words, I never cared any more for her. She was happy, and that was the essential thing. I now played in Le Batard, in which I had great success, in La Franchie, in L'Autre by George Sand, and in Jean-Marie, a little masterpiece by André Ferrier, which had the most brilliant success. Porel played the part of Jean-Marie. He was at that time slender and full of hope as regarded his future. Since then, his slenderness has developed into plumpness and his hope into certitude. Evil days then came upon us. Paris began to get feverish and excited. The streets were black with groups of people discussing and gesticulating and all this noise was only the echo of far distant groups gathered together in German streets. These other groups were yelling, gesticulating, and discussing, but they knew, while we did not know. I could not keep calm, but was extremely excited until finally I was ill. War was declared, and I hate war. It exasperates me and makes me shudder from head to foot. At times I used to spring up terrified, upset by the distant cries of human voices. Oh, war! What infamy, shame, and sorrow! War! What theft and crime abetted, forgiven, and glorified! On the 19th of July, war was seriously declared, and Paris then became the theater of the most touching and burlesque scenes. Excitable and delicate as I was, I could not bear the sight of all these young men gone wild who were yelling the Marseillaise and rushing along the streets in close file, shouting over and over again, To Berlin! To Berlin! My heart used to beat wildly, for I too thought that they were going to Berlin. I understood the fury they felt, for these people had provoked us without plausible reasons, but at the same time it seemed to me that they were getting ready for this great occasion without sufficient respect and dignity. My own impotence made me feel rebellious, and when I saw all the mothers with pale faces, and eyes swollen with crying, holding their boys in their arms and kissing them in despair, the most frightful anguish seemed to choke me. I cried too, almost unceasingly, and I was wearing myself away with anxiety but I did not foresee the horrible catastrophe that was to take place. The doctors decided that I must go to Aubonne. I did not want to leave Paris, for I had caught the general fever of excitement. My weakness increased, though, day by day, and on the 27th day of July I was taken away in spite of myself. Madame Guerard, my manservant, and my maid accompanied me, and I also took my child with me. At the stations, there were posters everywhere announcing that the Emperor Napoleon had gone to Metz to take command of the army. On arriving at Aubonne, I was obliged to go to bed. My condition was considered very serious by Dr. Longley, who told me afterwards that he certainly thought I was going to die. I vomited blood and had to have a piece of ice in my mouth all the time. At the end of about twelve days, however, I began to get up, and after this I soon recovered my strength and my calmness, and went for long rides. The war news led us to hope for victory, 
There was great joy and a certain emotion felt by everyone on hearing that the young Prince Imperial had received his baptism of fire at Sarbrook in the engagement commanded by General Frossard. Life seemed to me beautiful again, for I had great confidence in the issue of the war. I pitied the Germans for having embarked on such an adventure, but alas, the glorious progress which my brain had been so active in imagining was cut short by the atrocious news from saint Privat. The political news was posted up every day in the little garden of the casino at Aubonne. The public went there to get information. Detesting tranquility as I did, I used to send my manservant to copy the telegrams. Oh, how grievous it was, that terrible telegram from saint Privat informing us laconically of the frightful butchery of Marshal Canrobert's heroic defense and of Bazaine's first treachery in not going to the rescue of his comrades. I knew Canrobert and liked him immensely. Later on he was one of my faithful friends, and I shall always remember the exquisite hours spent in listening to his accounts of the bravery of others, never of his own, and what an abundance of anecdotes, what wit, what charm! This news of the Battle of saint Privat caused my feverishness to return. My sleep was full of nightmares, and I had a relapse. The news was worse every day. After saint Privat came Ravolat, where thirty-six thousand men, French and German, were cut down in a few hours. Then came the sublime but powerless efforts of McMahon, who was repulsed as far as Sedan, and finally Sedan. Sedan, oh, the horrible awakening. The month of August had finished the night before amid a tumult of weapons and dying groans, but the groans of the dying men were mingled still with hopeful cries. The month of September, though, was cursed from its very birth. Its first war cry was stifled back by the brutal and cowardly hand of destiny. A hundred thousand men! A hundred thousand Frenchmen had to capitulate, and the Emperor of France had to hand his sword over to the King of Prussia. Ah, oh, that cry of grief, that cry of rage, uttered by the whole nation, it can never be forgotten. On the 1st of September, toward ten o'clock, Claude, my manservant, knocked at my door. I was not asleep, and he gave me his copy of the first telegrams. Battle of Sedan commenced. McMahon wounded, etc., etc. Ah, uh, go back again, I said, and as soon as a fresh telegram comes, bring me the news. I feel that something unheard of, something great and quite different is going to happen. We have suffered so terribly this last month that there can only be something good now, something fine, for God's scales meet out joy and suffering equally. Go at once, Claude, I added, and then full of confidence, I soon fell asleep again and was so tired that I slept until one o'clock. When I awoke, my maid, Elise, the most delightful girl imaginable, was seated near my bed. Her pretty face and her large, dark eyes were so mournful that my heart stopped beating. I gazed at her anxiously, and she put into my hands the copy of the last telegram. The Emperor Napoleon has just handed over his sword. The blood rushed to my head, and my lungs were too weak to control it. I lay back on my pillow, and the blood escaped through my lips with the groans of my whole being. For three days I was between life and death. Dr. Langley sent for one of my father's friends, a shipowner named Monsieur Manoir. He came at once, bringing with him his young wife. She too was very ill worse in reality than I was in spite of her fresh look, for she died six months later. Thanks to their care and to the energetic treatment of Dr. Longley, I came through alive from this attack. I decided to return at once to Paris, as the siege was about to be proclaimed, and I did not want my mother and my sisters to remain in the capital. Independently of this, Everyone at Aubonne was seized with a desire to get away, invalids and tourists alike. 
a post-chaise was found, the owner of which agreed for an exorbitant price to take me to the next train that came. When once in it, we were more or less comfortably seated as far as Bordeaux, but it was impossible to find five seats in the express from there. My manservant was allowed to travel with the engine driver. I do not know where Madame Gerard and my maid found room, but in the compartment I entered with my little boy, there were already nine persons. An ugly old man tried to push my child back when I had put him in, but I pushed him again energetically in my turn. No human force will make us get out of this carriage again, I said. Do you hear that, you ugly old man? We are here and we shall stay. A stout lady, who took up more room herself than three ordinary persons, exclaimed, well, that is lively, but we are suffocated already. It's shameful to let eleven persons get into a compartment where there are only seats for eight. Will you get out then? I retorted, turning to her quickly, for without you there would only be seven of us. The stifled laughter of the other travelers showed me that I had won over my audience. Three young men offered me their places but I refused, declaring that I was going to stand. The three young men had risen, and they declared that they would also stand then. The stout lady called a railway official. Come here, please, she began. The official stopped an instant at the door. It is perfectly shameful, she went on. There are eleven in this compartment, and it is impossible to move. Don't you believe it, exclaimed one of the young men. Just look for yourself. We are standing up and there are three seats empty. Send us some more people in here. The official went away laughing and muttering something about the woman who had complained. She turned to the young man and began to talk abusively to him. He bowed very respectfully in reply and said, Madame, if you will calm down, you shall be satisfied. We will seat seven on the other side, including the child, and then you will only be four on your side. The ugly old man was short and slight. He looked sideways at the stout lady and murmured, Four? Four? His look and tone showed that he considered the stout lady took up more than one seat. This look and tone were not lost on the young man, and before the ugly old man had comprehended, he said to him, Will you come over here and have this corner? All the thin people will be together then, he added, inviting a placid, calm-looking young Englishman of about 18 to 20 years of age to take the old man's seat. The Englishman had the body of a prize fighter with a face like that of a fair-haired baby. A very young woman opposite the stout one laughed till the tears came. All six of us then found room on the thin people's side of the carriage. We were a little crushed, but had been considerably enlivened by this little entertainment, and we certainly needed something to enliven us. The young man who had taken the matter in hand, in such a witty way, was tall and nice-looking. He had blue eyes and his hair was almost white, and this gave to his face a most attractive freshness and youthfulness. My boy was on his knee during the night. With the exception of the child, the stout lady, and the young Englishman, no one went to sleep. The heat was overpowering, and the war was, of course, discussed. After some hesitation, one of the young men told me that I resembled Mademoiselle Sarah Bernhardt. I answered that there was every reason why I should resemble her. The young men then introduced themselves. The one who had recognized me was Albert Delpy. The second was a Dutchman. Baron von Zellern, or von Zellen, I do not remember exactly which, and the young man with the white hair was Felix Bohr. He told me that he was from Havre, and that he knew my grandmother very well. I kept up a certain friendship with these three men afterwards, but later on Albert Delpy became my enemy. All three are now dead. Albert Delpy died a disappointed man, for he had tried everything and succeeded in nothing. The Dutch baron died in a railway accident, and Felix Faure as president of the French Republic.
The young woman, on hearing my name, introduced herself in her turn. I think we are slightly related, she said. I am Madame La Roque. Of Bordeaux? I asked. Yes. My mother's brother had married a Mademoiselle La Roque of Bordeaux, so that we were able to talk of our family. Altogether, the journey did not seem very long, in spite of the heat, the overcrowding, and our thirst. The arrival in Paris was more gloomy. We shook hands warmly with each other. The stout lady's husband was awaiting her with a telegram in his hand. The unfortunate woman read it, and then, uttering a cry, burst into sobs and fell into his arms. I gazed at her, wondering what sorrow had come upon her. Poor woman. I could no longer see anything ridiculous about her. I felt a pang of remorse at the thought that we had been laughing at her so much when misfortune had already singled her out. On reaching home, I sent word to my mother that I should be with her sometime during the day. She came at once, as she wanted to know how my health was. We then arranged about the departure of the whole family, with the exception of myself, as I wanted to stay in Paris during the siege. My mother, my little boy, and his nurse, my sisters, my aunt Annette, who kept house for me, and my mother's maid were all ready to start two days later. I had taken rooms at Frascati's at Havre for the whole tribe, but the desire to leave Paris was one thing and the possibility of doing so another. The stations were invaded by families like mine who thought it more prudent to emigrate. I sent my manservant to engage a compartment, and he came back three hours later with his clothes torn after receiving various kicks and blows. Madame cannot go into that crowd, he assured me. It is quite impossible. I should not be able to protect her. And then, too, Madame will not be alone. There is Madame's mother, the other ladies, and the children. It is really quite impossible. I sent at once for three of my friends, explained my difficulty, and asked them to accompany me. I told my butler to be ready, as well as my other manservant and my mother's footman. He, in his turn, invited his younger brother, who was a priest, and who was very willing to go with us. We all set off in a railway omnibus. There were seventeen of us in all, and only nine who were really traveling. Our eight protectors were not too many, for they were not human beings who were taking tickets, but wild beasts, haunted by fear and spurred on by a desire to escape. These brutes saw nothing but the little ticket office, the door leading to the train, and then the train which would ensure their escape. The presence of the young priest was a great help to us, for his religious character made people refrain sometimes from blows. When once all my people were installed in the compartment which had been reserved for them, they waved their farewells through kisses, and the train started. A shudder of terror then ran through me, for I suddenly felt so absolutely alone. It was the first time I had been separated from the little child who was dearer to me than the whole world. Two arms were then thrown affectionately round me, and a voice murmured, My dear Sarah, why did you not go to? You are so delicate. Will you be able to bear the solitude without the dear child? It was Madame Gerard who had arrived too late to kiss the boy, but was there now to comfort the mother. I gave way to my despair, regretting that I had sent him away, and yet, as I said to myself, there might be fighting in Paris. The idea never for an instant occurred to me that I might have gone away with him. I thought that I might be of some use in Paris. Of some use, but in what way? This I did not know. The idea seemed stupid, but nevertheless, that was my idea. It seemed to me that everyone who was well ought to stay in Paris. In spite of my weakness, I felt that I was well, and with reason, as I proved later on. I therefore stayed, not knowing at all what I was going to do. End of Section 11, Chapter 10 This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 12 of Memories of My Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Read by Jessica Hendra. Memories of My Life. By Sarah Bernhardt. I Establish My War Hospital. For some days I was perfectly dazed, missing the usual life around me, and missing the affection of those I loved. The defense, however, was being organized, and I decided to use my strength and intelligence in tending the wounded. The question was, where could we install an ambulance? The Odeon Theatre had closed its doors, but I moved heaven and earth to get permission to organize an ambulance at the Odeon. And thanks to Emile de Girardin and du Cassinel, my wish was granted. I went to the War Office and made my declaration, and my request and my offers were accepted for a military ambulance. The next difficulty was that I wanted food. I wrote a line to the Prefect of Police. A military courier arrived very soon after my letter, bringing me a note from the Prefect, containing the following lines. Madame, if you could possibly come at once, I would wait for you until six o'clock. Excuse the earliness of the hour, but I have to be at the chamber at nine in the morning, and as your note seems to be urgent, I am anxious to do all I can to be of service to you. Comte de Caratre. I remembered a Comte de Caratre who had been introduced to me at my aunt's house the evening I had recited poetry accompanied by Rossini. He was a young lieutenant, good-looking, witty, and lively. He had introduced me to his mother, a very charming woman, and I had recited poetry at her soirees. The young lieutenant had gone to Mexico, and for some time we had kept up a correspondence. But this had gradually ceased, and we had not met again. I asked Madame Girard whether she thought the prefect might be a near relative of my young friend's. "'It may be so,' she replied, and we discussed this in the carriage which was taking us at once to the Tuileries Palace, where the prefect had his offices. My heart was very heavy when we came to the stone steps. Only a few months previously, one April morning, I had been there with Madame Girard. Then, as now, a footman had come forward to open the door of my carriage— but the April sunshine had then lighted up the steps, caught the shining lamps of the state carriages, and sent its rays in all directions. There had been a busy, joyful coming and going of the officers, and elegant salutes had been exchanged. On this occasion the misty, crafty-looking November sun fell heavily on all it touched. Black, dirty-looking cabs drove up one after the other, knocking against the iron gate grazing the steps, advancing or moving back according to the coarse shouts of their drivers. Instead of the elegant salutations, I heard now such phrases as, "'Well, how are you, old chap?' "'Oh, the wooden jaws!' "'Well, any news?' "'Yes, it's the very deuce with us!' etc., etc. The palace was no longer the same. The very atmosphere had changed. The faint perfume which elegant women leave in the air as they pass was no longer there. A vague odor of tobacco, of greasy clothes, of hair plastered with pomatum, made the atmosphere seem heavy. Ah, the beautiful French empress! I could see her again in her blue dress, embroidered with silver, calling to her aid Cinderella's good fairy to help her on again with her little slipper. The delightful young prince imperial, too. I could see him helping me to place the pots of verbena and marguerites, and holding in his arms which were not strong enough for it, a huge pot of rhododendrons, behind which his handsome face completely disappeared. I could see the Emperor Napoleon the Third himself, with his half-closed eyes, clapping his hands at the rehearsal of the courtesies intended for him. The fair Empress, dressed in strange clothes, had rushed away in the carriage of her American dentist, for it was not even a Frenchman, but a foreigner, who had had the courage to protect the unfortunate woman and the gentle utopian emperor had tried in vain to be killed on the battlefield. Two horses had been killed under him, but he had not received so much as a scratch, and after this he had given up his sword, and we at home had all wept with anger, shame, and grief at this giving up of the sword. Yet what courage it must have required for this brave man to carry out such an act! He had wanted to save a hundred thousand men, to spare a hundred thousand lives, and to reassure a hundred thousand mothers. Our poor beloved emperor! History will some day do him justice, for he was good, 
humane, and confiding. Alas, alas, he was too confiding. I stopped a minute before entering the prefect's suite of rooms. I was obliged to wipe my eyes, and, in order to change the current of my thoughts, I said to my petite dame, Tell me, should you think me pretty if you saw me now for the first time? Oh, yes, she replied warmly. So much the better, I said, for I want this old prefect to think me pretty. There are so many things I must ask him for. On entering his room, what was my surprise to recognize in him the lieutenant I knew? He had become captain, and then prefect of the Seine. When my name was announced by the usher, he sprang up from his chair, and came forward with his face beaming, and both hands stretched out. "'Ah, you had forgotten me,' he said, and then he turned to greet Madame Girard in a friendly way. "'But I never thought I was coming to see you,' I replied. "'And I am delighted,' I continued, "'for you will let me have everything I ask for.' "'Only that,' he remarked, with a short burst of laughter. "'Well, will you give me your orders, madame?' he continued. "'Yes. I want bread, milk, meat, vegetables, sugar, wine, brandy, potatoes, eggs, coffee,' I said in one breath. "'Oh, let me get my breath!' exclaimed the Count Prefect. "'You speak so quickly that I am gasping.' I was quiet a moment, and then I continued. "'I have started an ambulance at the Odeon, but as it is a military ambulance, the municipal authorities refuse me food. I have five wounded men already, and I can manage for them, but other wounded men are being sent to me, and I shall have to give them food.' "'You shall be supplied above and beyond all your wishes,' said the prefect. "'There is food in the palace which was being stored by the unfortunate empress. She had prepared enough for months and months. I will have all you want sent to you, except meat, bread, and milk, and as regards these I will give orders that your ambulance shall be included in the municipal service, although it is a military one. Then I will give you an order for salt and some other things, which you will be able to get from the opera.' "'From the opera?' I repeated, looking at him incredulously. "'But it is only being built, and there is nothing but scaffolding there yet.' "'Yes, but you must go through the little doorway under the scaffolding, opposite the Rue Scribe. You then go up the little spiral staircase leading to the provision office, and there you will be supplied with what you want.' "'There is still something else I want to ask,' I said. "'Go on. I am quite resigned, and ready for your orders,' he replied." "'Well, I am very uneasy,' I said, "'for they have put a stock of powder in the cellars under the Odeon. "'If Paris were to be bombarded, and a shell should fall on the building, "'we should all be blown up, and that is not the aim and object of an ambulance.' "'You are quite right,' said the kind man, "'and nothing could be more stupid than to store powder there. "'I shall have more difficulty about that, though,' he continued." for I shall have to deal with a crowd of stubborn bourgeois who want to organize the defense in their own way. You must try to get a petition for me, signed by the most influential householders and tradespeople in the neighborhood. Now, are you satisfied? he asked. Yes, I replied, shaking hands with him cordially, with both hands. You have been most kind and charming. Thank you very much. I then moved toward the door. But I stood still again suddenly, as though hypnotized by an overcoat hanging over a chair. Madame Girard saw what had attracted my attention, and she pulled my sleeve gently. "'My dear Sarah,' she whispered, "'do not do that!' I looked beseechingly at the young prefect, but he did not understand. "'What can I do now to oblige you, beautiful Madonna?' he asked. I pointed to the coat, and tried to look as charming as possible. "'I am very sorry,' he said, bewildered. "'But I do not understand at all.' I was still pointing to the coat. "'Give it me, will you?' I said. "'My overcoat?' "'Yes.' "'What do you want it for?' "'For my wounded men when they are convalescent.' He sank down on a chair in a fit of laughter. I was rather vexed at this uncontrollable outburst, and I continued my explanation. "'There is nothing so funny about it,' I said. "'I have a poor fellow, for instance, whose two fingers have been taken off.' He does not need to stay in bed for that, naturally, and his soldier's cape is not warm enough. It is very difficult to warm the big foyer of the Odeon sufficiently, and those who are well enough have to be there. The man I tell you about is warm enough at present, because I took Henry Fould's overcoat when he came to see me the other day. My poor soldier is huge, and as Henry Fould is a giant, I might never have had such an opportunity again. 
I shall want a great many overcoats, though, and this looks like a very warm one. I stroked the furry lining of the coveted garment, and the young prefect, still choking with laughter, began to empty the pockets of his overcoat. He pulled out a magnificent white silk muffler from the largest pocket. Will you allow me to keep my muffler? he asked. I put on a resigned expression and nodded my consent. Our host then rang, and when the usher appeared he handed him the overcoat and said in a solemn voice, in spite of the laughter in his eyes, Will you carry this to the carriage for these ladies? I thanked him again and went away feeling very happy. Twelve days later I returned, taking with me a letter covered with the signatures of the householders and tradesmen living near the Odeon. On entering the prefect's room, I was petrified to see him, instead of advancing to meet me, rush toward a cupboard, open the door, and fling something hastily into it. After this he leaned back against the door, as though to prevent my opening it. "'Excuse me,' he said in a witty, mocking tone, "'but I took a violent cold after your first visit. I have just put my overcoat—oh, only an ugly old overcoat, not a warm one.' he added quickly, but still an overcoat, inside there, and there it is now, and I will take the key out of the lock. He put the key carefully into his pocket, and then came forward and found me a chair. Our conversation soon took a more serious turn, though, for the news was very bad. For the last twelve days the ambulances had been crowded with the wounded. Everything was in a bad way, home politics as well as foreign politics. The Germans were advancing on Paris. The army of the Loire was being formed. Gambetta, Chanzy, Bourbaki, and Trochan were organizing a desperate defense. We talked for some time about all these sad things, and I told him about the painful impression I had had on my last visit to the Tuileries, of my remembrance of everyone so brilliant, so considerate, and so happy formerly, and so deeply to be pitied at present. We were silent for a moment, and then I shook hands with him, told him I had received all he had sent, and returned to my ambulance. The prefect had sent me ten barrels of wine and two of brandy, thirty thousand eggs all packed in boxes with lime and bran, a hundred bags of coffee, boxes of tea, forty boxes of Albert biscuits, a thousand tins of preserve, and a quantity of other things. Monsieur Menier, the great chocolate manufacturer, had sent me five hundred pounds of chocolate. One of my friends, who was a flower dealer, had made me a present of twenty sacks of flour, ten of which were maize flour. Felix Potin, my neighbor when I was living at eleven Boulevard Malacherbes, had responded to my appeal by sending two barrels of raisins, a hundred boxes of sardines, three sacks of rice, two sacks of lentils, and twenty sugar loaves. From Monsieur de Rothschild I had received two barrels of brandy and a hundred bottles of his own wine for the convalescence. I had also received a very unexpected present. Lionet du Bourg, an old schoolfellow of mine at the Grand Champ convent, sent me fifty tin boxes, each containing four pounds of salt butter. She had married a very wealthy gentleman farmer, who cultivated his own farms, which it seems were very numerous. I was very much touched at her remembering me, for I had never seen her since the old days at the convent. I had also asked for all the overcoats and slippers of my various friends and I had bought up a job lot of two hundred flannel vests. My Aunt Betty, my blind grandmother's sister, who is still living in Holland and is now ninety-three years of age, managed to get for me, through the delightful Dutch ambassador, Baron Blank, three hundred nightshirts of magnificent Dutch linen and a hundred pairs of sheets. I received lint and bandages from every corner of Paris, but it was more particularly from the Palais de la Industrie that I used to get my provisions of lint and linen for binding wounds. There was an adorable woman there, named Mademoiselle Hockinet, who was at the head of all the ambulance. All that she did was done with a cheerful gracefulness, and all that she was obliged to refuse, she refused sorrowfully, but still in a gracious manner. She was at that time more than thirty years of age, and although unmarried, she looked more like a young married woman. She had large, blue, dreamy eyes and a laughing mouth, a deliciously oval face, little dimples, and crowning all this grace, this dreamy expression, and this coquettish, inviting mouth, a wide forehead like that of the virgins painted by the early painters, a wide and rather prominent forehead, 
encircled by hair worn in smooth, wide, flat bandeau, separated by a faultless parting. The forehead seemed like the protecting rampart of this delicious face. Mademoiselle Hoquinet was adored by everyone, and made much of, but she remained invulnerable to all homage. She was happy in being beloved, but she would not allow anyone to express affection for her. At the Palais de l'Industrie a remarkable number of celebrated doctors and surgeons were on duty, and they, as well as the convalescents, were all more or less in love with Mademoiselle Hoquinet. As she and I were great friends, she confided to me her observations and her sorrowful disdain. Thanks to her I was never short of linen, nor of lint. I had organized my ambulance with a very small staff. My cook was installed in the public foyer. I had bought her an immense cooking range, so that she could make soups and herb tea for fifty men. Her husband was chief attendant. I had given him two assistants, and Madame Girard, Madame Lamquin, and I were the nurses. Two of us sat up at night, so that we each went to bed every third night. I preferred this to taking on some woman whom I did not know. Madame Lamquin belonged to the Odeon, where she used to take the part of the duennas. She was plain and had a common face, but she was very talented. She talked loud and was very plain-spoken. She called a spade a spade and liked frankness, and no under-meaning to things. At times she was a trifle embarrassing with the crudeness of her words and her remarks, but she was kind, active, alert, and devoted. My various friends who were on service at the fortifications came to me in their free time to do my secretarial work. I had to keep a book, which was shown every day to a sergeant who came from the Val de Grasse military hospital, giving all details as to how many men came into our ambulance, how many died, and how many recovered and left. Paris was in a state of siege, and no one could go far outside the walls, and no news from outside could be received. The Germans were not, however, round the gates of the city. Baron Leray came now and then to see me, and I had, as head surgeon, Dr. Duchesneau, who gave up his whole time, night and day, to the care of my poor men during the five months that this truly frightful nightmare lasted. I cannot recall those terrible days without the deepest emotion. It was no longer the country in danger that kept my nerves strung up, but the sufferings of all her children— there were all those who were away fighting, those who were brought into us wounded or dying, the noble women of the people, who stood for hours and hours in the queue to get the necessary dole of bread, meat, and milk for their poor little ones at home. Ah, those poor women! I could see them from the theatre windows, pressing up close to each other, blue with cold, and stamping their feet on the ground to keep them from freezing, for that winter was the most cruel one we had had for twenty years. Frequently one of these poor, silent heroines was brought in to me, either in a swoon from fatigue or struck down suddenly with congestion caused by cold. On the 20th of December three of these unfortunate women were brought into the ambulance. One of them had her feet frozen, and she lost the big toe of her right foot. The second was an enormously stout woman, who was suckling her child, and her poor breasts were harder than wood. She simply howled with pain. The youngest of the three was a girl of sixteen to eighteen years of age. She died of cold, on the trestle on which I had had her place to send her home. On the twenty-fourth of December there were fifteen degrees of cold. I often sent William, our attendant, out with a little brandy to warm the poor women. Oh, the suffering they must have endured, those heart-broken mothers, those sisters, and fiancés, in their terrible dread. How excusable their rebellion seems during the Commune, and even their bloodthirsty madness. My ambulance was full. I had sixty beds and was obliged to improvise ten more. The soldiers were installed in the artiste's foyer and in the general foyer, and the officers in a room which had formerly been used for refreshments. One day a young Breton named Marie Le Galec was brought in. He had been struck by a bullet in the chest and another in the wrist. Dr. Duchesneau bound up his chest firmly and splintered his wrist. He then said to me very simply, Let him have everything he likes. He is dying. I bent over his bed and said to him, Tell me anything that would give you pleasure, Marie Le Galec. Soup, he answered promptly, in the most comic way. 
Madame Girard hurried away to the kitchen and soon returned with a bowl of broth and pieces of toast. I placed the bowl on the little wooden shelf with four short legs, which was so convenient for the meals of our poor sufferers. The wounded man looked up at me and said, Bara! I did not understand, and he repeated, Bara! His poor chest caused him to hiss out the word, and he made the greatest efforts to repeat his emphatic request. I sent immediately to the marine office, thinking that there would surely be some Breton seamen there, and I explained my difficulty, and my ignorance of the Breton dialect. I was informed that the word bara meant bread. I hurried at once to Le Galec with a large piece of bread. His face lighted up, and taking it from me with his sound hand, he broke it up with his teeth and let the pieces fall in the bowl. He then plunged his spoon into the middle of the broth and filled it up with bread until the spoon could stand upright in it. When it stood up without shaking about, the young soldier smiled. He was just preparing to eat this horrible concoction when the young priest from Saint-Sulpice, who had my ambulance in charge, arrived. I had sent for him on hearing the doctor's sad verdict. He laid his hand gently on the young man's shoulder, thus stopping the movement of his arm. The poor fellow looked up at the priest, who showed him the holy cup. Oh, he said simply, and then, placing his coarse handkerchief over the steaming soup, he put his hands together. We had arranged the two screens, which we used for isolating the dead or dying, around his bed. He was left alone with the priest while I went on my rounds to calm the murmurers, or help the believers to raise themselves for the prayer. The young priest soon pushed aside the partition, and I then saw Marie Le Galec, with a beaming face, eating his abominable bread sop. He fell asleep soon afterward, roused up to ask for something to drink, and died immediately, in a slight fit of choking. Fortunately, I did not lose many men out of the three hundred who came into my ambulance, for the death of the unfortunate ones completely upset me. I was very young at the time, only twenty-four years of age, but I could nevertheless see the cowardliness of some of the men, and the heroism of many of the others. A young Savoyard, eighteen years old, had had his forefinger taken off. Baron Leray was quite sure that he had shot it off himself with his own gun, but I could not believe that. I noticed, though, that in spite of our nursing and care the wound did not heal. I bound it up in a different way, and the following day I saw that the bandage had been altered. I mentioned this to Madame Lamquin, who was sitting up that night together with Madame Girard. Good. I will keep my eye on him. You go to sleep, my child, and count on me. The next day when I arrived she told me that she had caught the young man scraping the wound on his finger with his knife. I called him and told him that I should have to report this to the Val de Grasse hospital. He began to weep and vowed to me that he would never do it again, and five days later he was well. I signed the paper, authorizing him to leave the ambulance, and he was sent to the Army of the Defense. I often wondered what became of him. Another of our patients bewildered us, too. Each time that his wound seemed to be just on the point of healing up, he had a violent attack of dysentery which threw him back. This seemed suspicious to Dr. Duchesneau, and he asked me to watch the man. At the end of a considerable time we were convinced that our wounded man had thought out the most comical scheme. He slept next to the wall and therefore had no neighbor on the one side. During the night he managed to file the brass of his bedstead, he put the filings in a little pot, which had been used for ointment of some kind. A few drops of water and some salt mixed with this powdered brass formed a poison, which might have cost its inventor his life. I was furious at this stratagem. I wrote to the Val de Grasse, and an ambulance conveyance was sent to take this unpatriotic Frenchman away. But side by side with these despicable men, what heroism we saw! A young captain was brought in one day. He was a tall fellow a regular Hercules, with a superb head and a frank expression. On my book he was described as Captain Menesson. He had been struck by a bullet at the top of the arm, just at the shoulder. With a nurse's assistance I was trying as gently as possible to take off his cloak, when three bullets fell from the hood which he had pulled over his head, and I counted sixteen bullet holes in the cloak. The young officer had stood upright for three hours, serving as a target himself, while covering the retreat of his men as they fired all the time on the enemy. This had taken place among the Champinet vines. He had been brought in unconscious in a hospital conveyance. He had lost a great deal of blood, and was half dead with fatigue and weakness. 
He was very gentle and charming, and thought himself sufficiently well two days later to return to the fight. The doctor, however, would not allow this, and his sister, who was a nun, besought him to wait until he was something like well again. "'Oh, not quite well,' she said, smiling, "'but just well enough to have strength to fight.' Soon after he came into the ambulance, the cross of the Legion of Honor was brought for him, and this was a moment of intense emotion for every one. The unfortunate wounded men who could not move turned their suffering faces toward him, and, with their eyes shining through a mist of tears, gave him a fraternal look. The more convalescent among them held out their hands to the young giant. It was Christmas Eve, and I had decorated the ambulance with festoons of green leaves. I had made pretty little chapels in front of the Virgin Mary, and the young priest from Saint-Sulpice came to take part in our poor but poetical Christmas service. He repeated some beautiful prayers, and the wounded men, many of whom were from Brittany, sang some sad, solemn songs, full of charm. Porel, the present manager of the vaudeville theatre, had been wounded on the Avron Plateau. He was then convalescent, and was one of my guests, together with two officers now ready to leave the ambulance. That Christmas supper is one of my most charming, and at the same time most melancholy memories. It was served in the small room which we had made into a bedroom. Our three beds were covered with draperies and skins, which I had fetched from home, and we used them as seats. Mademoiselle Hoquinet had sent me five yards of white pig's pudding, the famous Christmas dish, and all my poor soldiers who were well enough were delighted with this delicacy. One of my friends had had twenty large brioche cakes made for me, and I had ordered some large bowls of punch, the coloured flames from which amused the grown-up sick children immensely. The young priest from Saint-Sulpice accepted a piece of brioche, and after taking a little white wine, left us. Ah, how charming and good he was, that poor young priest, and how well he managed to make that unbearable fourteen cease talking. Gradually the latter began to get humanized, until finally he began to think the priest was a good sort of fellow. Poor young priest! He was shot by the communists, and I cried for days and days over his murder. End of section 12section 13 of memories of my life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org memories of my life by sarah bernard section 13 more hospital days the month of january arrived the army of the enemy held paris day by day in a still closer grip Food was getting scarce. Bitter cold enveloped the city, and the poor soldiers who fell, sometimes only slightly wounded, passed away gently in a sleep that was eternal, their brains numbed and their bodies half-frozen. No more news could be received from outside, but thanks to the United States minister, who had chosen to remain in Paris, a letter arrived from time to time. It was in this way that I received a thin slip of paper, as delicate as a primrose petal, bringing me the following message. Everyone well, courage, a thousand kisses, your mother. This impalpable missive dated from seventeen days previously. And so my mother, my sisters, and my little boy were at the Hague all this time, and my mind, which had been continually travelling in their direction, had been wandering along their own route, toward Havre, where I thought they were established tranquilly at the house of a cousin of my father's mother. I had my two aunts living at the Hague, but the question was, were they there at this time? I no longer knew, and from that moment I never ceased to suffering the most anxious and torturing mental distress. I was doing all in my power just then to have some wood for burning, Comte de Caratry had sent me a large provision before his departure to the provinces, in a balloon, on the 9th of October. I was now very short, and I would not allow the stock we had in the cellars to be touched, so that we should not be quite without fuel in case of an emergency. I had all the little footstools belonging to the theatre used for firewood, all the wooden cases in which the accessories were kept, 
a good number of old Roman benches, armchairs, and curl chairs that were stowed away under the Odeon, and indeed everything which came to hand. Finally, taking pity of my despair, pretty Mademoiselle Lauguigny sent me about twenty thousand pounds weight of wood, and I then took courage again. I had been told about some new system of keeping meat, by which the meat neither lost its juices nor its nutritive quality. I sent Madame Gerard to the council house in the neighborhood of the Odeon, where such provisions were distributed. But some brute answered her that when I had removed all the Buddhistic images from my ambulance, I should receive the necessary food. Monsieur Risson, the mayor, with some functionary holding an influential post, had been to inspect my ambulance. The important personage had requested me to have the beautiful white virgins which were on the mantelpieces and tables taken away, as well as the divine crucified one hanging on the wall of each room in which there were any of the wounded. I refused in a somewhat insolent and very decided way to act in accordance with the wish of my visitor, whereupon the famous Republican turned his back on me and gave orders that I should be refused everything at the council house. I was very determined, however, and I moved heaven and earth until I succeeded in being included for the distribution of food, in spite of the orders of the chief. It is only fair to say that the mayor was a charming man. Madame Gerard returned after her third visit, a child pushing a hand barrow containing ten enormous bottles of the miraculous meat. I received the precious consignment with infinite joy, for my men had been almost without meat for the last three days, and the beloved pot of feu was an almost necessary resource for the poor wounded fellows. On all the bottles were directions as to opening them. Let the meek soak so many hours, etc., etc., Madame Lamquin, Madame Gerard, and I, together with all the staff of the infirmary, were soon grouped anxiously and inquisitively around these glass receptacles. I told the head attendant to open the largest of the bottles, in which, through the glass, we could see an enormous piece of beef, surrounded by thick, muddy-looking water. The string fastened round the rough paper which hid the cork was cut. And then, just as a man was about to put the corkscrew in, a deafening explosion was heard, and a rank odor filled the room. Everyone rushed away terrified. I called them all back, scared and disgusted as they were, and showed them the following words on the directions. Do not be alarmed at the bad odor on opening the bottle. Courageously and with resignation, we took up our work once more, though we felt sick all the time from the abominable exhalation. I took the beef out and placed it on a dish that had been brought for the purpose. Five minutes later this meat turned blue, and then black, and the stench from it was so unbearable that I decided to throw it away. Madame Blanquin was wiser, though, and more reasonable. No, oh no, my dear girl, she said. In these times it will not do to throw meat away, even though it may be rotten, let us put it in a glass bottle again and send it back to the council house. I followed her wise advice, and it was a very good thing I did, for another ambulance installed at Boulevard de Médicis on opening these bottles of meat had been as horrified as we were and had thrown the contents into the street. A few minutes after, the crowd had gathered round in a mob, and, refusing to listen to anything, had yelled out insults addressed to the aristocrats, the clericals, and the traitors, who were throwing good meat intended for the sick into the street, so that the dogs were enjoying it, while the people were starving with hunger. It was with the greatest difficulty that the wretched, mad people had been prevented from invading the ambulance, and when one of the unfortunate nurses had gone out later on, she had been mobbed and beaten until she was left half dead from fright and blows. She did not want to be carried back to her own ambulance, and the druggist begged me to take her in. I kept her for a few days in one of the boxes in the second gallery of the theatre, and when she was better she asked if she might stay with me as a nurse. I granted her wish, and kept her with me afterwards as a maid. She was a fair-haired girl, gentle and timid, and was predestined for misfortune. She was found dead in the Père Lachaise cemetery, after the skirmish between the commoners and the Versailles group. A stray bullet had struck her in the back of the neck, as she was praying at the grave of her little sister, who had died two days before from smallpox. 
I had taken her with me to Saint-Germain, where I had gone to stay during the horrors of the Commune. Poor girl, I had allowed her to go to Paris very much against my own will. As we could not count on this preserved meat for our food, I made a contract with a knacker who agreed to supply me at rather high price with horse flesh, and until the end this was the only meat we had to eat. Well prepared and well seasoned, it was very good. Hope had now fled from all hearts, and we were living in the expectation of we knew not what. An atmosphere of misfortune seemed to hang like lead over us, and it was a sort of relief when the bombardment commenced on the 27th of December. At last, we felt that something fresh was happening. It was an era of fresh suffering. There was some stir at any rate. For the last fortnight, the fact of not knowing anything had been killing us. On the 1st of January 1871, we lifted our glasses to the health of the absent ones, to the repose of the dead, and the toast choked us with a lump in our throats. Every night we used to hear the dismal cry of Ambulance! Ambulance! Underneath the windows of the Odeon, we went down to meet the pitiful procession, and one, two, or sometimes three conveyances would be there, full of our poor wounded soldiers. There would be ten or twelve rows of them, lying or sitting up on the straw. I said that I had one or two places, and lifting the lantern, I looked into the conveyance, and the faces would then turn slowly toward the lamp. Some of the men would close their eyes, as they were too weak to bear even that feeble light. With the help of the sergeant who accompanied the conveyance and our attendant, one of the unfortunates would with difficulty be lifted to the narrow litter on which he was to be carried up to the hospital. Oh, what sorrowful anguish it was for me when, on lifting the patient's head, I discovered that it was getting heavy, it was so heavy, and when bending over that inert face I felt that there was no longer any breath. The sergeant would then give the order to take him back, and the poor dead man was put back in his place, and another wounded man was lifted out. The other dying men would then move back a little, in order not to profane the dead. Ah, what grief it was when the sergeant said, to try to take one or two more in, it is a pity to drag these poor chaps about from one hospital to another. The Val de Grasse is full. Very well, I will take two more, I would say, and then I wondered where we should put them. We had to give up our own beds, and in this way the poor fellows were saved. Ever since the 1st of January we had all three been sleeping every night at the hospital. We had some loose dressing gowns of grey swan skin, not unlike the soldiers' cloaks. The first of us who heard a cry or a groan sprang out of bed, and if necessary called the other two. On the 10th of January, Madame Gerard and I were sitting up at night on one of the lounges in the artist's foyer, awaiting the dismal cry of ambulance. There had been a fierce affray at Clamart, and we knew that there would be many wounded. I was telling her of my fear that the bombs, which had already reached the Mission, the Sorbonne, the Salpetriere, the Val de Grasse, would fall on the Odeon. Oh, but my dear Sarah, said the sweet woman, the hospital flag is waving so high above it that there could be no mistake. If it were struck, it would be purposely, and that would be abominable. But, Kirar, I replied, why should you expect these execrable enemies of ours to be better than we are ourselves? Did we not behave like savages at Berlin in 1806? But at Paris there are such admirable public monuments, she urged. Well, and was not Moscow full of masterpieces? The Kremlin is one of the finest buildings in the world. That did not prevent us giving that admirable city up to pillage. Oh no, my poor petite dame, do not deceive yourself. Armies may be Russian, German, French or Spanish, but they are armies. That is, they are beings who form an impersonal whole, a whole that is ferocious and irresponsible. The Germans will bombard the whole of Paris, if the possibility of doing so should be offered them. You must make up your mind to that, my dear Gerard. I had not finished my sentence when a terrible detonation roused the sleeping neighborhood. Madame Gerard and I had been seated opposite each other. We found ourselves standing up close together in the middle of the room, terrified. My poor cook, her face quite white, came to me for safety. The reports continued rather frequently. The bombarding had commenced from our side that night. I went round to the wounded man, but they did not seem to be much disturbed. 
Only one, a boy of 15, whom we had surnamed Pink Baby, was sitting up in bed. When I went to him to soothe him, he showed me his little medal of the Holy Virgin. It is thank to her that I was not killed, he said. If they would put the Holy Virgin on the ramparts of Paris, the bombs would not come. He lay down again, then, holding his little medal in his hands, and the bombarding continued until six in the morning. Ambulance, ambulance, we then heard, and Madame Gerard and I went down. Here, said the sergeant, take this man. He's losing all his blood, and if I take him any farther, he will not arrive living. The wounded man was put on the litter, but as he was German, I asked this sub-officer to take all his papers and give them in at the ministry. We gave the man the place of one of the convalescents, whom I installed elsewhere. I asked him his name, and he told me that it was Franz Meyer, and that he was the first soldier of the Charles and Lambert. He then fainted from weakness caused by loss of blood. He soon came to himself again with our care, and I then asked him whether he wanted anything, but he did not answer a word. I supposed that he did not speak French, and as there was no one at the hospital who spoke German, I waited until the next day to send for someone who knew his language. I must own that the poor man was not welcomed by his dormitory companions. A soldier named Fortin, who was 23 years of age and a veritable child of Paris, a comical fellow, mischievous, droll and good natured, never ceased railing against the young German, who, on his side, never flinched. I went several times to Fortin and begged him to be quiet, but it was all in vain. Every fresh outbreak of his was greeted with wild laughter, and his success put him into the gayest of humours, so that he continued getting more and more excited all the time. The others were prevented from sleeping, and he moved about wildly in his bed, bursting out into abusive language, when too abrupt a movement intensified his suffering. The unfortunate fellow had had his sciatic nerve torn by a bullet, and he had to endure the most atrocious pain. After my third fruitless appeal for silence, I ordered the two men attendants to carry him into a room where he would be alone. He sent for me, and when I went to him, promised to behave well all night long. I therefore countermanded the order I had given, and he kept his word. The following day, I had Franz Meyer carried into a room where there was a young Breton who had had his skull fractured by the bursting of a shell and therefore needed the utmost tranquillity. One of my friends, who spoke German very well, came to see whether the Schalzian wanted anything. The wounded man's face lighted up on hearing his own language, and then, turning to me, he said, I understand French quite well, madame, and if I listen calmly to the horrors poured forth by your French soldier, it was because I know that you cannot hold out two days longer, and I can understand his exasperation. And why do you think that we cannot hold out? Because I know that you are reduced to eating rats. Dr. Duchesne had just arrived, and he was dressing the horrible wound which the patient had above his thigh. Well, he said, my friend, as soon as your fever has gone down, you shall eat an excellent wing of chicken. The German shrugged his shoulders, and the doctor continued, meanwhile drink this, and tell me what you think of it. Dr. Duchesne gave him a glass of water with a little of the excellent cognac which the prefect had sent me. That was the only design that my soldiers took. The Schalzian said no more, but he put on the reserved circumspect manner of people who know and will not speak. The bombardment continued, and the hospital flag certainly served as a target for our enemies, for they fired with surprising exactitude, and altered their firing directly upon fell a little away from the neighborhood of the Luxembourg. Thanks to this, we had more than twelve bombs one night, these dismal shells, when they burst in the air, were like the fireworks at a fete. The shining splinters then fell down black and deadly. Georges Boyer, who at that time was a young journalist, came to call on me at the hospital, and I told him about the terrifying splendors of the night. Oh, how much I should like to see all that, he said. Come this evening, toward nine or ten o'clock, and you will see, I replied. We spent several hours at the little round window of my dressing room, which looked out toward Chardillon. It was from there that the Germans fired the most. We listened in the silence of the night to the muffled sounds coming from there, right over yonder. Then there would be a light, a formidable noise in the distance, and the bomb arrived. 
fogging in front of us or behind, bursting either in the air or on reaching its goal. Once we had only just time to draw back quickly, and even then the disturbance in the atmosphere affected us so violently that for a second we were under the impression we had been struck. The shell had fallen just underneath my dressing room, grazing the cornice, which it dragged down in its fall to the ground, and bursting there feebly. But what was our amazement to see a little crowd of children swoop down on the burning pieces, just like a lot of sparrows on French manure, when the carriage has passed. The little vagabonds were quarrelling over the debris of these engines of warfare. I wondered what they could possibly do with them. Oh, there is not much mystery about that, said Boyer. These little starving merchants will sell them. This proved to be true. One of the men attendants, whom I sent to find out, brought back with him a child of about ten years old. What are you going to do with that, my little man? I asked him, picking up the piece of shell, which was warm and still dangerous by the edge where it had burst. I'm going to sell it, he replied. What for? To buy my turn in the queue when the meat is being distributed. But you risk your life, my poor child. Sometimes the shell come quickly, one after the other. Where were you when this one fell? Lying down on the stone of the wall that supports the iron railings. He pointed across to the Luxembourg gardens, opposite the artist's entrance to the Orion. We bought up all the debris that the child had, without attempting to give him advice, which might have sounded wise, what was the use of preaching wisdom to this poor little creature, who heard of nothing but massacres, fire, revenge, retaliation, and all the rest of it, for the sake of honor, for the sake of religion, for the sake of right? And then, too, how was it possible to keep out of the way all the people living in the Faubourg Saint-Germain were liable to be blown to pieces, as the enemy, very likely, could only bombard Paris on that side, and now they were even there. No, we were certainly in the most dangerous neighborhood. One day, Baron Larre came to see Franz Meyer, who was very ill. He wrote a prescription, which a young errand boy was told to wait for and bring back very, very quickly. As the boy was rather given to loitering, I went to the window. His name was Victor, but we called him Toto. The druggist lived at the corner of the Place Medicis. It was then six o'clock in the evening. Toto looked up and on seeing me, he began to laugh and jump as he hurried to the druggist. He had only five or six more yards to go, and as he turned round to look up at my window, I clapped my hands and called out, Good, be back soon. Alas, before the poor boy could open his mouth to reply, he was cut in two by a shell which had just fallen. He did not burst, but bounced a yard high, and then struck poor Toto right in the middle of the chest. I uttered such a shriek that everyone came rushing to me. I couldn't speak, but pushed everyone aside and rushed downstairs, begging for someone to come with me. A litter, the boy, the druggist, I managed to articulate. Ah, oh, what a horror, was an awful horror. When we reached the poor child, his intestines were all over the ground. His chest and his poor little red chubby face had the flesh entirely taken off. He had neither eyes, nose, or mouth, nothing. Nothing but some hair at the end of a shapeless bleeding mass a yard away from his body. And it was as though a tiger's two claws had opened the body and emptied it with fury and a refinement of cruelty, leaving nothing but a poor little skeleton. Baron Larré, who was the best of men, turned slightly pale at this sight, he saw many such sights, certainly, but this poor little fellow was a holocaust which had been terribly mutilated. Had injustice, the infamy of war, will the much dreamed of time never come, when wars are no longer possible, and the monarch who wants war will be dethroned and imprisoned as a malefactor? Will the time never come when there will be a cosmopolitan council, where the wise man of every country will represent his nation, and where the rights of humanity will be discussed and respected. So many men think as I do, so many women talk as I do, and yet nothing is done. A man, who I liked very much, was engaged in certain inventions for balloons. To find out how to steer balloons means, for me, finding out how to realize my dream, namely, to fly in the air, to approach the sky, and have under one's feet the moist down like clouds. 
and how interested I was in my friend's researches. One day, though, he came to me very much excited with a new discovery. I have discovered something about which I am wild with delight, he said. He then began to explain to me that his balloon would be able to cover inflammable matter without the least danger, thanks to these and thanks to that. But what for? I asked, bewildered by his explanations, and half crazy with so many technical words. What for? he repeated. Why, for war, he replied. We shall be able to fire and to throw terrible bombs to a distance of a thousand, twelve hundred, and even 1,500 yards, and it would be impossible for us to be harmed at such a distance. My balloon, thanks to a substance, which is my invention, with which the covering would be coated, would have nothing to fear from fire, nor yet from gas. I do not want to know anything more about you or your invention, I said, interrupting him brusquely. I thought you were a humane servant, and you are a wild beast. Your researches were in connection with the most beautiful manifestation of human genius, with those fed of the skies which I loved so dearly. You want to transform these now into cowardly attacks turned against the earth. You horrify me. Do go! With this, I left my friend to himself and his cool invention, ashamed for a moment. His efforts have not succeeded, though, according to his wishes. The remains of the poor lad were put into a small coffin, and Madame Gerard and I followed the pauper's hairs to the grave. The morning was so cold that the driver had to stop and take a glass of hot wine, as otherwise he might have died of congestion. We were alone in the carriage, for the boy had been brought up by his grandmother, who could not walk at all, and who needed vests and stockings. It was by going to order some vests and socks for my men that I had made the acquaintance of Mère de Coutin, as she was called. At her request, I had engaged her grandson, Victor Durier, as an errand boy, and the poor old woman had been so grateful that I did not dare go now to tell her of his death. Mathilde Dame went for me to the Rue de Vauridard, where the old woman lived. As soon as Madame Gerard arrived, the poor grandmother could see by her sad face that something had happened. Bon Dieu, my dear lady, is the poor little Magrot dead? This was her name for me. Madame Gerard then told her, as gently as possible, the sad news. The old woman took off her spectacles, looked at Madame Gerard, wiped them, and put them on her nose again. She then began to grumble violently about her son, the father of the dead boy, he had taken up with some low girl by whom he had had this child, and she had always foreseen that misfortune would come upon them through it. She continued in this train, not sorrowing for the poor boy, but abusing her son, who was a soldier in the army of the Loire. Although the grandmother seemed to feel so little grief, I went to see her after the funeral. It is all over, Madame Durier, I said, but I have secured the grave for a period of five years for the poor boy. She turned toward me, quite comic in her vexation. What madness, she exclaimed, now that he's with the bon dieu, he won't want for anything. It would have been better to have taken a bit of land that would have brought something in, that folks don't make vegetables grow. This outburst was so terribly logical that in spite of the odious brutality of it, I yielded to Mertricotin's desire and gave her the same present I had given to the boy. They should each have their bit of land. The child who had had a right to a longer life should sleep his eternal sleep in his, while the old woman could press from hers what fruits she might. I returned to the ambulance sad and unnerved. A joyful surprise was awaiting me. A friend of mine was there, holding in his hand a very small piece of tissue paper, on which were the following two lines in my mother's handwriting. We are all very well and at Homburg. I was furious on reading this. At Homburg? All my family at Homburg is settling down tranquilly in the enemy's country. I racked my brains to think by what extraordinary combination my mother had gone to Homburg. I knew that my pretty aunt Rosine had a friend there, with whom she stayed every year, for she always went for two months to Homburg, two months to Baden-Baden, and a month to Spa, as she was the greatest gambler that the bon dieu ever created. Anyhow, those who were so dear to me were all well, and that was the principal thing. But I was nevertheless annoyed with my mother for going to Homburg. 
I heartily thanked the friend who had brought me the little slip of paper. It was sent to me by the American minister, who had put himself to no end of trouble in order to give help and consolation to the Parisians. I then gave him a few lines for my mother, in case he should be able to send them to her. The bombardment of Paris continued. One night, the brothers from the École Chrétienne came to ask us for conveyances and help in order to collect the dead on the Châtillon Plateau. I let them have my two conveyances, and I went with them to the battlefield. Ah, oh, what a horrible remembrance. It was like a scene from Dante. It was an icy cold night, and we could scarcely get along. Finally, by the light of torches and lanterns, we saw that we had arrived. I got out of the vehicle with an infirmary attendant and his assistant. We had to move slowly, as at every step we trod upon the dying or the dead. We passed along murmuring, ambulance, ambulance. When we heard a groan, we turned our steps in the direction whence it came. Ah, the first man that I found in this way. He was half lying down, his body supported by a heap of dead. I raised my lantern to look at his face and found that his ear and part of his jaw had been blown off. Great clots of blood, coagulated by the cold, hung from his lower jaw. There was a wild look in his eyes. I took a wisp of straw, dipped it in my flask, drew up a few drops of brandy, and blew them into the poor fellow's mouth between his teeth. I repeated this three or four times. A little life then came back to him, and we took him away in one of the vehicles. The same thing was done for the others. Some of them could drink from the flask, which made our work shorter. One of these unfortunate men was frightful to look at. A shell had taken all the clothes from the upper part of his body, with the exception of two ragged sleeves, which hung from the arms at the shoulders. There was no trace of a wound, but his poor body was marked all over with great black patches, and the blood was oozing slowly from the corners of his mouth. I went nearer to him, for it seemed to me that he was breathing. I had a few drops of the vivifying cordial given to him, and he then half opened his eyes and said, Thank you. He was lifted into the conveyance, but the poor fellow died from hemorrhage, covering all the other wounded men with a stream of dark blood. Daylight gradually began to appear amidst the dull dawn. The lanterns had burned out, but we could now distinguish each other. There were about a hundred persons there, sisters of charity, military and civil men nurses, the brothers from the École Chrétienne, other priests, and a few ladies who, like myself, had given themselves up, heart and soul, to the service of the wounded. The sight was still more dismal by daylight, for all the night had hidden in its shadows, appeared then in the tardy one light of that January morning. There were so many wounded that it was impossible to transport them all, and I sobbed at the thought of my helplessness. Other vehicles kept arriving, but there were so many wounded, so very many. Many of those who had only slight wounds had died of cold. On returning to the hospital, I met one of my friends at the door. He was a naval officer, and he had brought me a sailor who had been wounded at the Fort of Ivry. He had been shot below the right eye. He was entered as Desiree Blois, boatswain's mate, aged 27. He was a magnificent fellow, very frank-looking, and a man of few words. As soon as he was in bed, Dr. Duchesne sent for a barber to shave him, as his bushy whiskers had been ravaged by a bullet that had lodged itself in the salivary gland, carrying with it hair and flesh into the wound. The surgeon took up his pincers to extract the pieces of flesh which had stopped up the opening of the wound. He then had to take some very fine pincers to extract the hairs which were mixed up inextricably in the torn mass of flesh. When the barber laid his razor very gently near the wound, the unfortunate man took leave it, and an oath escaped his lips. He immediately glanced at me and muttered, Pardon, mademoiselle. I was very young, but I appeared much younger than my age. I looked like a very young girl, in fact. 
I was holding the poor fellow's hand in mine and trying to comfort him with the hundreds of consoling words that spring from a woman's heart to her lips when she has to soothe moral or physical suffering. Ah, mademoiselle, said Bourbois, when the wound was finally dressed, you gave me courage. When he was more easy, I asked him if he would like something to eat. Yes, he replied. Well, my boy, would you like cheese, soup, or sweets? asked Madame Blanquin. Sweets, replied the strong, powerful looking fellow, smiling. Desire Blois often talked to me about his mother, who lived near Brest. He had a veritable adoration for this mother, but he seemed to have a terrible grudge against his father. For one day, when I asked him whether his father was still living, he looked up with his fearless eyes and appeared to fix them on a being visible only to himself, as though challenging him with an expression of the most pitiful contempt. At last, the brave fellow was destined to a cruel end, but I will return to that later on. The sufferings endured through the siege began to have their effect on the morale of the Parisians. Bread had just been rationed out. There were to be 300 grams for adults and 150 grams for children. A silent fury took possession of the people at these news. Women were the most courageous, the men were excited. Quarrels grew bitter, for some wanted war to the very death, and others wanted peace. One day, when I entered Franz Meyer's room to take him his meal, he went into the most ridiculous rage, he threw his piece of fowl down on the ground and declared that he would not eat anything, nothing more at all, for they had deceived him by telling him that the Parisians had not enough food to last two days before surrendering, and he had been in the ambulance seventeen days now, and was having fowl. What the poor fellow did not know was that I had bought about forty fowls and six geese at the beginning of the siege, and I was feeding them up in my dressing room in the Rue de Rome. Oh, my dressing room was very pretty just then, and I let Franz believe that all Paris was full of fowls, ducks, geese, and other domestic bipeds. The bombardment continued, and one night I had to have all my patients transported to the Odeon cellars, for when Madame Gerard was helping one of the sick men to get back into bed, a shell fell on the bed itself between her and the officer. It makes me shudder even now to think that three minutes previously the unfortunate man would have been killed as he lay in bed, although the shell did not burst. We could not stay long in the cellars. The water was getting deeper in them and rats tormented us. I therefore decided that the ambulance must be moved, and I had the worst of the patients taken to the Val de Grasse hospital. I kept about twenty men who were on the way to convalescence. I rented an immense empty flat for them in the Rue de Provence, and it was there that we awaited the armistice. I was half dead with anxiety, as I had had no news from my own family for so long. I could not sleep, and had become the very shadow of my former self. Jules Favre was entrusted with the negotiations with Bismarck. Oh, those two days of preliminaries. They were the most unnerving days of any for the besieged. False reports were spread. We were told of the maddest and most exorbitant demands on the part of the Germans, who certainly were not tender to the vanquished. There was a moment of stupor when we heard that we had to pay 200 million francs down, for our finances were in such a pitiful state that we shuddered at the idea that we might not be able to make up the sum of 200 millions immediately. Baron Alphonse de Rothschild, who was shut up in Paris with his wife and brothers, gave his signature for the 200 millions. This fine deed was soon forgotten, and there are even people who can say it. When we heard in Paris that the armistice was signed for 20 days, a frightful sadness took possession of us all, even of those who most ardently wished for peace. Every Parisian felt on his cheek the hand of the conqueror. It was the brand of shame, the blow given by the abominable Treaty of Peace. Oh, that 31st of January, 1871. I was anemic from the siege, undermined by grief, tortured with anxiety about my family, and I went out with Madame Gerard and two friends toward the Parc Monceau. Suddenly one of my friends, Monsieur de Blancy, turned pale as death. I looked to see what was the matter. 
and noticed a soldier passing by. He had no weapons. Two others passed by, and they also had no weapons. And they were so pale too, these poor, disarmed soldiers, these humble heroes. There was such evident grief and hopelessness in their very gait, and their eyes, as they looked at us women, seemed to say, it is not our fault. It was all so pitiful, so touching. I burst out, open, and went back home at once, for I did not want to meet any more disarmed French soldiers. End of section 13 Read by Claudia Galdi Section 14 of Memories of My Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memories of My Life by Sarah Bernhardt A Wartime Journey I decided to set off now as quickly as possible in search of my family. I asked Paul de Ramassa to get me an audience with Monsieur Thiers in order to obtain from him a passport for leaving Paris. I trusted Mademoiselle Garade and Mademoiselle Lanquin with disbanding my ambulance. Monsieur Thiers gave me the passport, and I was ready to go, but I could not start alone. I felt that the journey I was about to undertake was a very dangerous one, and Monsieur Thiers and Paul de Ramassat had also warned me of this. I could see, therefore, that I should be very dependent on my traveling companion all the time, and on this account I decided not to take a servant with me, but a friend. I very naturally went at once to Mademoiselle Garade. Her husband, gentle though he was, refused absolutely to let her go with me, as he considered this expedition mad and dangerous. Mad, it certainly was, and dangerous, too. I did not insist, but I sent for my son's governess, Mademoiselle Soubris. I asked her whether she would go with me, and did not attempt to conceal from her any of the dangers of the journey. She jumped with joy, and said she would be ready within twelve hours. This girl is, at present, the wife of Commandant Monfil Chesnot. And how strange life is, for she is now teaching the two daughters of my son, her former pupil. Mademoiselle Soubris was then very young, and she looked like a creole. She had very beautiful dark eyes, with a gentle, timid expression, and the voice of a child. Her head, however, was full of adventure, romance, and daydreams. In appearance, we might both have been taken for quite young girls, for, although I was older than she was, my slenderness and my face made me look younger. It would have been absurd to try to take a trunk with us, so I took a bag for us both. We had only a change of linen and some stockings. I had my revolver, and I offered one to Mademoiselle Sobrise, but she refused it with horror, and showed me an enormous pair of scissors in an enormous case. "'But what are you going to do with them?' I asked. "'I shall kill myself if we are attacked,' she replied. I was surprised at the difference in our characters. I was taking a revolver, determined to protect myself by killing others. She was determined to protect herself by killing herself. On the 24th of February, we started on this journey, which was to have lasted three days, and lasted eleven. At the first gate at which I presented myself in leaving Paris, I was sent back in the most brutal fashion. Permissions to go outside the city had to be submitted for signature at the German outposts. I went to another gate, but it was only at the postern gate of Postniers that I could get my passport signed. We were taken into a little shed, which had been transformed into an office. A Prussian general was seated there. He looked me up and down, and then said, Are you Sarah Bernhardt? Yes, I answered. And this young lady is with you? Yes. And you think you are going to cross easily? I hope so. Well, then, you are mistaken, and you had better stay inside Paris. No, I want to leave. I see myself what may happen, but I want to leave. He shrugged his shoulders, called an officer, said something I did not understand in German, and then went out, leaving us alone without our passports. We had been there about a quarter of an hour when I suddenly heard a voice I knew. It was one of my friends, René Griffon, who had heard of my departure and had come after me to try to dissuade me. The trouble he had taken was all in vain, though, as I was determined to leave. 
The general returned soon after, and Griffon was anxious to know what might happen to us. Everything, answered the officer, and worse than everything. Griffon spoke German, and had a short colloquy with the officer about us. This rather annoyed me, for as I did not understand, I imagined that he was urging the general to prevent our starting. I nevertheless resisted all persuasions, supplications, and even threats. A few minutes later, a well-appointed vehicle drew up at the door of the shed. "'There you are,' said the German officer roughly. "'I am sending you to Gonis, where you will find the provision train which starts in an hour. I am recommending you to the care of the stationmaster, the commandant. After that, may God take care of you.' I stepped into the general's carriage and said farewell to my friend, who was in despair. We arrived at Gonis and got out of the station, where we saw a little group of people talking in low voices. The coachman made me a military salute, refused what I wished to give him, and drove away at full speed. I advanced toward the group, wondering to whom I ought to speak, when a friendly voice exclaimed, "'What, you here? Where have you come from? Where are you going?' It was Villare, the tenor in vogue at the opera. He was going to his young wife, I believe, of whom he had had no news for five months. He introduced one of his friends, who was traveling with him, and whose name I do not remember. General Pelliser's son, and a very old man, so pale and so sad-looking and woebegone that I feel sorry for him. It was Monsieur Gasson, and he was going to Belgium to take his grandson to his godmothers. His two sons had been killed during this pitiful war. One of the sons was married, and his wife had died of sorrow and despair. He was taking the orphan boy to his godmother, and he hoped to die himself as soon as possible afterwards. Ah, the poor fellow! His wish must have been accomplished very quickly, for he was only fifty-nine then, and he was so cruelly ravaged by his grief that I took him for seventy. Besides these five persons, there was an unbearable chatterer, named Theodore Jose, a wine-dealer. He did not require any introduction. "'How do you do, madam?' he began. "'How lucky we are that you are going to travel with us. Ah, the journey will be a difficult one. Where are you going?' Two women alone. It is not at all prudent, especially as all the routes are crowded with German and French sharpshooters, marauders, and thieves. Oh, haven't I demolished some of these German sharpshooters? <sighs> we must be quietly, though. These sly fellows are very quick of hearing. He then pointed to the German officers who were walking up and down. Ah, the rascals, he went on. If I had my military costume and my gun, they would not walk so boldly in front of Theodore Jose. I have no less than six helmets at home. The man got on my nerves, and I turned my back on him and looked to see which of the men before me could be the station master. A tall young man with his arm in a sling came toward me with an open letter. It was the one which the general's coachman had handed to him, recommending me to his care. He held out his well arm to me, but I refused it. He bowed and led the way, and I followed him, accompanied by Mademoiselle Sobris. On arriving in his office, he gave us seats at a little table, upon which knives and forks were placed for two persons. It was then three o'clock in the afternoon, and we had had nothing, not even a drop of water, since the evening before. I was very much touched by this thoughtfulness, and we did honor to the very simple but refreshing meal prepared for us by the young officer. While we lunched, I looked at him when he was not noticing. He was very young, and his face bore traces of recent suffering. I felt a compassionate tenderness for this unfortunate man who was crippled for life, and my hatred for war increased still more. He suddenly said to me, in rather bad French, I think I can give you news of one of your friends. What is his name? I asked. Emmanuel Bocher. Oh, yes, he is certainly a great friend of mine. How is he? He is still a prisoner, but he is very well. But I thought he had been released, I said. Some of those who were taken with him were released, on giving their word never to take up arms against us again but he refused to give his word. "'Oh, the brave soldier!' I exclaimed, in spite of myself. The young German looked at me with his clear, sad eyes. "'Yes,' he said simply, "'the brave soldier.' When we had finished our luncheon, I rose to return to the other travellers. "'The compartment reserved for you will not be here for two hours,' said the young officer. "'If you would like to rest, ladies, I will come for you at the right time.' He went away and before long I was sound asleep. I was nearly dead with fatigue. Mademoiselle Zupris touched me on the shoulder to rouse me. The train was ready to start, and the young officer walked with me to it. 
I was a little amazed when I saw the carriage in which I was to travel. It had no roof and was filled with coal. The officer had several sacks put in it, one on top of the other, to make our seats less hard. He sent for his officer's cloak, begging me to take it with us and send it back, but I refused this odious disguise most energetically. It was a deadly cold day, but I preferred dying of cold to muffling up in a cloak belonging to the enemy. The whistle was blown. The wounded officer saluted, and the train started. There were Prussian soldiers in the carriages. The subordinates, the employees, and the soldiers were just as brutish and rude as the German officers were polite and courteous. The train stopped without any plausible reason. It started again, to stop again, and then it stood still for an hour on this icy cold night. On arriving at Creel, the stoker, the engine driver, the soldiers, and everyone else got out. I watched all these men, whistling, bawling at each other, spitting and bursting with laughter as they pointed to us. Were they not the conquerors, and we the conquered? At Creel, we stayed more than two hours. We could hear the distant sound of foreign music, and the hurrahs of Germans who were making merry. All this hubbub came from a white house about five hundred yards away. We could distinguish the outlines of human beings locked in each other's arms, waltzing, and turning round and round in a giddy revel. It began to get on my nerves, for it seemed likely to continue until daylight. I got out with Villarette, intending at any rate to stretch my limbs. We went toward the white house, and then, as I did not want to tell him my plan, I asked him to wait there for me. Very fortunately, though, for me, I had not time to cross the threshold of this vile lodging house, for an officer, smoking a cigarette, was just coming out of a small door. He spoke to me in German. I am French, I replied and then he came up to me, speaking my language, for they could all talk French. He asked me what I was doing there, and my nerves were so overstrung that I burst out sobbing, and told him, through my sobs, of our lamentable odyssey since our departure from Gonis, and finally of our waiting two hours in the icy cold carriage, while the stokers, engine drivers, and conductors were all dancing in his house. But I had no idea there were passengers in those carriages, and it was I who gave permission to these men to dance and drink. The guard of the train told me that he was taking cattle and goods, and that he did not need to arrive before eight in the morning, and I believed him. Well, monsieur, I said, the only cattle in the train will be the eight French passengers, and I should be very much obliged if you would get orders the journey should be continued. Make your mind easy about that, madam, he replied. Will you come in and rest? I am here just now on a round of inspection, and am staying for a few days in this inn. You shall have a cup of tea, and that will refresh you. I told him that I had a friend waiting for me in the road, and a lady in the railway carriage. But that makes no difference, he said. Let us go and fetch them. A few minutes later we found poor Villaret seated on a milestone. His head was on his knees, and he was asleep. I asked him to fetch Mademoiselle Soubris. And if your other travelling companions will come and take a cup of tea, they will be welcome, said the officer. I went back with him and we entered by the little door through which I had seen him come out. It was a fairly large room which we entered, on a level with the meadow. There were some mats on the floor, a very low bed, and an enormous table, on which were two large maps of France. One of these was studded over with pins and small flags. There was also a portrait of the Emperor William, mounted and fastened up with four pins, and all this belonged to the officer. On the chimney-piece, under an enormous glass shade, were a bride's wreath, a military medal, and a plate of white hair. On each side of the glass shade was a china vase, containing a branch of box. All this, together with the table and the bed, belonged to the landlady, who had given up her room to the officer. There were five cane chairs round the table, a velvet armchair, and a wooden bench covered with books against the wall. A sword and belt were lying on the table, and two horse pistols. I was philosophizing to myself on all these heterogeneous objects, when the others arrived. Mademoiselle Sabris, Villarette, young garrison, and that unbearable Theodore José. I hope he will forgive me if he is living now, poor man, but the thought of him still irritates me. The officer had some boiling hot tea brought in for us, and it was a veritable treat, as we were exhausted with hunger and cold. When the door was opened for the tea to come in, Theodore José caught a glimpse of the throng of girls, soldiers, and other people. "'Ah, oh, my friends!' he exclaimed with a burst of laughter. "'We are at His Majesty Williams. There is a reception on, and it's chic, I can tell you that. 
With this, he smacked his tongue twice. Philavret reminded him that we were the guests of a German, and that it was preferable to be quiet. Oh, that's enough, that's enough, he replied, lighting a cigarette. A frightful uproar of oaths and shouts now took the place of the deafening sound of the orchestra, and the incorrigible southerner half opened the door. I could see the officer giving orders to two sub-officers, who, in their turn, separated the groups, seizing the stoker, the engine driver, and the other men belonging to the train, so roughly that I was sorry for them. They were kicked in the back, they received blows with the flat of the sword on the shoulder, and a blow with the butt-end of a gun knocked the guard of the train down. He was the ugliest brute, though, that I have ever seen. All these people were sobered in a few seconds, and went back towards our carriage, with a hangdog look and a threatening mien. We followed them, but I did not feel any too satisfied as to what might happen to us on the way with this queer lot. The officer evidently had a similar idea, for he ordered one of the sub-officers to accompany us as far as our means. This sub-officer got into our carriage, and we set off again. We arrived at our means at six in the morning. Daylight had not yet succeeded in piercing through the night clouds. A fine rain was falling, which was hardened by the cold. There was no carriage to be had, and not even a porter. I wanted to go to the Hotel de Cheval Blanc, but a man who happened to be there said to me, "'It's no use, my little young lady. There's no way of putting up even a laugh like you. Go to the house over there with a the balcony. They can put some people up.' With these words, he turned his back on me. Villarette had gone off without saying a word. Monsieur Gasson and his grandson had been stowed away silently in a covered country cart, hermetically closed. A stout, ruddy, thick-set, matronly woman was waiting for them, but the coachman looked as though he belonged to nice people. General Pelissier's son, who had not uttered a word since we had left Gonis, had disappeared like a ball from the hands of a conjurer. Theodore José politely offered to accompany us, and I was so weary that I accepted his offer. He picked up our bag and began to walk at full speed, so that we had difficulty in keeping up with him. He was so breathless with the walk that he could not talk which was a great relief to me. Finally, we arrived at the house and entered. But my horror was great on seeing that the hall of the hotel had been transformed into a dormitory. We could scarcely walk between the mattresses laid on the ground, and the grumbling of the people was by no means promising. When once we were in the office, a young girl in mourning told us that there was not a corner vacant. I sank down on a chair and Mademoiselle Sobrice leaned against the wall, with her arms hanging down, looking most dejected. The odious José then yelled out that they could not let two women, as young as we were, be out on the street all night. He went to the proprietors of the hotel, and said something quietly about me. I do not know what it was, but I heard my name distinctly. The young woman in mourning then looked at me with misty eyes. "'My brother was a poet,' she said. He wrote a very pretty sonnet about you after seeing you play La Poisson more than ten times. He took me, too, to see you, and I enjoyed myself so much that night. It is all over, though. She lifted her hands toward her head and sobbed, trying to stifle her cries. It's all over, she repeated. He is dead. They have killed him. It is all over, all over. I got up, moved to the depths of my being by this horrific grief. I put my arms round her and kissed her, crying myself and whispering to her words that soothe and hopes that comfort. Lulled by my words and touched by my sisterliness, she wiped her eyes, and taking my hand led me gently away. Soubris followed. I signed to Josso in an authoritative way to stay where he was, and we went up the two flights of stairs to the hotel in silence. At the end of a narrow corridor she opened a door, we found ourselves in rather a large room, reeking with the smell of tobacco. A small night lamp, placed on a little table by the bed, was all the light in this large room. The wheezing respiration of a human breast disturbed the silence. We looked toward the bed, and by the faint light from the little lamp, I saw a man half-seated, propped up by a heap of pillows. The man was aged-looking, rather than really old. His beard and hair were white, and his face bore traces of suffering. Two large furrows were formed from the eyes to the corners of the mouth. What tears must have rolled down that poor, emaciated face! The girl went quietly toward the bed, signed to us to come inside the room, and then shut the door. We walked across on tiptoes to the far end of the room, our arms stretched out to maintain our equilibrium. 
I sat down with precaution on a large empire couch, and Subris took a seat beside me. The man in bed half opened his eyes. "'What is it, my child?' he asked. "'Nothing, father, nothing serious,' she replied. "'I wanted to tell you so that you should not be surprised when you woke up. I have just given hospitality in our room to two ladies who are here.' He turned his head in an annoyed way and tried to look at us at the end of the room. "'The lady with fair hair,' continued the girl, "'is Sarah Bernhardt, whom Lucian liked so much, you remember?' The man sat up, and shading his eyes with his hand, peered at us. I went near to him. He gazed at me silently, and then made a gesture with his hand. His daughter understood the gesture, and brought him an envelope from a small bureau. The unhappy father's hands trembled as he took it. He drew three sheets of paper out, slowly, and a photograph. He fixed his gaze on me, and then on the portrait. Yes, yes, as certainly is you. It certainly is you, he murmured. I recognized my photograph, taken in La Passant, smelling a rose. You see, said the poor man, his eyes veiled by tears, you were this child's idol. These are the lines he wrote about you. He then read me, in his quavering voice, with a slight Picardian accent, a very pretty sonnet. He then unfolded a second paper, on which some verses to Sarah Bernhardt were scrawled. The third paper was a sort of triumphant chant, celebrating all our victories over the enemy. The poor fellow still hoped, until he was killed, said the father, and yet he has only been dead five weeks. He had three shots in his head. The first shattered his jaw, but he did not fall. He continued firing on the scoundrels like a man possessed. The second took his ear off and the third struck him in his right eye. He fell then, never to rise again. His comrades told us all this. He was twenty-two years old, and now it's all over. The unhappy man's head fell back on the heap of pillows. His two inert hands had let the papers fall, and great tears rolled down his pale cheeks in the furrows formed by grief. A stifled groan burst from his lips. The girl had fallen on her knees and buried her head in the bedclothes to deaden the sound of her sobs. Subris and I were completely upset. Ah, those stifled sobs! Those deadened groans seemed to buzz in my ears, and I felt everything giving way under me. I stretched my hands out into space and closed my eyes. Soon there was a distant rumbling noise, which increased and came nearer. Then yells of pain, bones knocking against each other, Horses' feet making human brains gush out with a dull, flabby sound. Men barbed with iron passed by like a destructive whirlwind, shouting, Viva la war! And women on their knees, with outstretched arms, crying out, War is infamous! In the name of our wombs which bore you, of our breasts which suckled you, in the name of our pain in childbirth, in the name of our anguish over your cradles, let this cease! But the savage whirlwind passed by riding over the women. I stretched my arms out in a supreme effort, which woke me suddenly. I was lying in the girl's bed. Mademoiselle Sobrise, who was near me, was holding my hand. A man, whom I did not know, but whom someone called a doctor, laid me gently down again on the bed. I had some difficulty in collecting my thoughts. "'How long have I been here?' I asked. "'Since last night,' replied the gentle voice of Sobrise. "'You fainted.' and the doctor told us that you'd had an attack of fever. Oh, I have been very frightened. I turned my face to the doctor. Yes, dear lady, he said. You must be very prudent still for the next forty-eight hours, and then you can set off again. But you have had a great many shocks for one with such delicate health. You must be careful. I took the draft which he was holding out to me, apologizing to the owner of the house, who had just come in, and then turned round with my face to the wall. I needed rest so very, very much. Two days later I left our sad but congenial host. My travelling companions had all disappeared. When I went downstairs I kept meeting Prussians, for the unfortunate proprietor had been invaded compulsorily by the German army. He looked at each soldier and at each officer, trying to find out whether he were not the one who killed his poor boy. He did not tell me this, but it was my idea. 
it seemed to me that such was his thought and such the meaning of his gaze. In the vehicle in which I drove to the station, the kind man had put a basket of food. He also gave me a copy of the sonnet and a tracing of his son's photograph. I left the desolate couple with the deepest emotion, and I kissed the girl on taking our departure. Subris and I did not exchange a word on our journey to the station. We were both preoccupied with the same distressing thoughts. End of section 14 Recording by Todd Section 15 of Memories of My Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker Memories of My Life by Sarah Bernhardt Holmberg and Return at the station we found that the Germans were masters there, too. I asked for a first-class compartment to ourselves, or for a coupé, whatever they liked, provided we were alone. I could not make myself understood. I saw a man oiling the wheels of the carriages, who looked to me like a Frenchman. I was not mistaken. He was an old man, who had been kept on, partly out of charity, and partly because he knew every nook and corner, and being Alsatian, spoke German. This good man took me to the booking office and explained my wish to have a first-class compartment to myself. The man who had charge of the ticket office burst out laughing. There was neither first nor second class, he said. It was a German train." and I should have to travel like everyone else. The wheel oiler turned purple with rage, which he quickly suppressed. He had to keep his place. His consumptive wife was nursing their son, who had just been sent home from the hospital with his leg cut off, and the wound had not yet healed up. There were so many in the hospital. All this he told me as he took me to the station master. The latter spoke French very well, but he was not at all like the German officers I had met. He scarcely saluted me, and when I expressed my desire, he replied curtly, It is impossible. Two places shall be reserved for you in the officer's carriage. But that is what I want to avoid, I exclaimed. I do not want to travel with German officers. Well, then, you shall be put with German soldiers. He growled angrily, and putting on his hat, he went out, slamming the door. I remained there, amazed and confused by his insolence. I turned so pale, it appears, that the blue of my eyes became so clear that Soupice, who was acquainted with my fits of anger, was very much alarmed. "'Do be calm, madame, I implore,' she said. "'We are two women alone among these people.' If they liked to harm us, they could, but we must accomplish the aim and object of our journey. We must see little Maurice again. She was very clever, this charming Mademoiselle Soubise, and her little speech had the desired effect. To see the child again was my aim and object. I calmed down and vowed that I would not allow myself to get angry during this journey, which promised to be fertile in incidents and I almost kept my word. I left the station master's office and found the poor Alsatian waiting at the door. I gave him a couple of louis, which he hid away quickly, and then shook my hand as though he would break it off. You ought not to have that so visible, madame, he said, pointing to the little bag I had hanging at my side. It is very dangerous. I thanked him, but did not pay any attention to his advice. Just as the train was about to start, we entered the only first-class compartment. There were two young German officers in it. They saluted, and I took this as a good omen. The train whistled, and I thought what good luck we had had, as no one else would get in. Well, the wheels had not turned round ten times when the door opened violently and five German officers leaped into our carriage. We were nine then, and I thought, what torture! The station master waved a farewell to one of the officers, and both of them burst out laughing as they looked at us. I glanced at the station master's friend. 
He was a surgeon major and was wearing the ambulance badge on his sleeve. His wide face was congested, and a ring of sandy, bushy beard surrounded the lower part of it. Two little bright, light-colored eyes in perpetual movement lit up this ruddy face and gave him a sly look. He was broad-shouldered and thick-set, and gave one the idea of having strength without nerves. The horrid man was still laughing when the station and its station master were far away from us, but what the other one had said was evidently very droll. I was in a corner seat with Soubise opposite me, and the two young German officers on the other side of each of us. They were very gentle and polite, and one of them was quite delightful in his youthful charm. The surgeon major took off his helmet. He was very bald and had a very small stubborn-looking forehead began to talk in a loud voice to the other officers. Our two young bodyguards took very little part in the conversation. Among the others was a tall, affected young man whom they addressed as Baron. He was slender, very elegant, and very strong. When he saw that we did not understand German, he spoke to us in English, but Subis was too timid to answer, and I speak English very badly. He therefore resigned himself regretfully to talking French. He was agreeable, too agreeable. He certainly had not bad manners, but he was deficient in tact. I made him understand this by turning my face toward the scenery we were passing. We were very much absorbed in our thoughts and had been traveling for a long time when I suddenly felt suffocated by smoke which was filling the carriage. I looked round and saw that the surgeon major had lighted his pipe and, with his eyes half-closed, was sending up puffs of smoke to the ceiling. My throat was smarting with it, and I was choking with indignation, so that I was seized with a fit of coughing, which I exaggerated in order to track the attention of the impolite man. The baron, however, slapped him on the knee and endeavored to make him comprehend that smoke annoyed me. He answered by an insult which I did not understand, shrugged his shoulders, and continued to smoke. Exasperated by this, I lowered the window on my side. The intense cold made itself felt in the carriage, but I preferred that to the nauseous smoke of the pipe. Suddenly the surgeon major got up, putting his hand to his ear. I then saw that his ear was filled with cotton wool. He swore like an ox driver, and pushing past everyone and stepping on my loot, and on Subises, he shut the window violently, cursing and swearing all the time, quite uselessly, for I did not understand him. He went back to his seat, continued his pipe, and sent out enormous clouds of smoke in the most insolent way. The Baron and two Germans, who had been the first in the carriage, appeared to ask him something, and then to remonstrate with him, but he evidently told them to mind their own business and began to abuse them. Very much calmer myself on seeing the increasing anger of the disagreeable man, and very much amused by his earache, I again opened the window. He got up again, furious, showed me his ear and his swollen cheek, and I comprehended the word periostitis in the explanation he gave me on shutting the window again. I then made him understand that I had a weak chest, and that the smoke made me cough. The baron acted as my interpreter and explained this to him, but it was easy to see that he did not care a bit about that and he once more took up his favorite attitude with it and his pipe. I left him in peace for five minutes, during which time he was able to imagine himself triumphant, until, with a sudden jerk of my elbow, I broke the pane of glass. Stupefaction was then depicted on the major's face, and he became livid. He got straight up, but the two young men rose at the same time while the baron burst out laughing in the most brutal manner. The surgeon moved a step in our direction, but he found a rampart before him. 
Another officer had joined the two young men, and he was a strong, hardy-looking fellow, just cut out for an obstacle. I do not know what he said to the surgeon major, but it was something clear and decisive. The latter, not knowing how to expend his anger, turned on the baron, who was still laughing and abused him so violently that the latter calmed down suddenly and answered in a way that I quite understood the two men were calling each other out. That affected me but little. They might very well kill each other, these two men, for they were equally ill-mannered. The carriage was now quiet and icy cold, for the wind blew in and wildly through the broken pane. The sun had set, the sky was getting cloudy, it was about half-past five, and we were approaching Terrenier. The major had changed seats with his friend in order to shelter his ear as much as possible. He kept moaning like a half-dead cow. Suddenly, the repeated whistling of a distant locomotive made us listen attentively. We then heard two, three, and four petards bursting under our wheels. We could perfectly well feel the efforts the engine driver was making to slacken speed, but before he could succeed we were thrown against each other by a frightful shock. There were cracks and creaks, the hiccups of the locomotive spitting out its smoke in irregular fits, desperate cries, shouts, oaths, sudden downfalls, a lull, then a thick smoke, broken by the flames of a fire. Our carriage was standing up like a horse, kicking up its hind legs. It was impossible to get our balance again. Who was wounded and who was not wounded? We were nine in the compartment. For my part, I fancied that all my bones were broken. I moved one leg, and then I tried the other. Then, delighted at finding them without any broken places, I tried my arms in the same way. I had nothing broken, and neither had Mademoiselle Soubise. She had bitten her tongue, and it was bleeding, and this had frightened me. She did not seem to understand anything. The tremendous shaking up had made her dizzy, and she lost her memory for some days. I had a rather deep scratch between my eyes. I had not had time to stretch out my arms, and my forehead had knocked against the hilt of the sword which the officer seated by Soubise had been holding upright. Assistance arrived from all sides. For some time the door of our compartment could not be opened. The darkness had come on when it finally yielded and a lantern shone feebly on our poor broken-up carriage. I looked round for our one bag, but on finding it I let it go immediately, for my hand was red with blood. Whose blood was it? Three men did not move, and one of them was the major. His face looked to me livid. I closed my eyes in order not to know and I let the man who had come to our aid pull me out of the compartment. One of the young officers got out after me. He took Soubise, who was almost in a fainting condition, from his friend. The imbecile Baron then got out. His shoulder was out of joint. A doctor came forward among the rescuers. The Baron held his arm out to him and told him to pull it, which he did at once. The French doctor took off the officer's cloak, told two of the railway men to hold him, and then, pushing against him himself, pulled at the poor arm. The baron was very pale and gave a low whistle. When the arm was back in its place, the doctor shook the baron's other hand. Christi, he said, I must have hurt you very much. You have a precious lot of courage. The German saluted, and I helped him on again with his cloak. The doctor was then fetched away, and I saw that he was taken back to our compartment. I shuddered in spite of myself. We were now able to find out what had been the cause of our accident. A locomotive attached to two vans of coal had been shunting in order to get on to the siding and let us pass, when one of the vans got off the rails and the locomotive tired its lungs with whistling the alarm, while men ran to meet us scattering petards. 
Everything had been in vain, and we had run against the overturned van. What were we to do? The soft roads were all broken up by the cannon. We were about four miles from Tergnier, and a fine penetrating rain was making our clothes stick to our bodies. There were four carriages, but the wounded had to be conveyed. Other carriages would come, but there were the dead to be carried away. An improvised litter was just being borne along by two workmen. The major was lying on it so livid that I clenched my hands until my nails entered the flesh. One of the officers wanted to question the doctor who was following. Oh, no, I explained. Please, please do not. I do not want to know. The poor fellow. I stopped my ears as though someone was about to shout out something horrible to me, and I never knew his fate. We were obliged to resign ourselves to setting out on foot. We went about two kilometers as bravely as possible, and then I stopped quite exhausted. The mud which clung to our shoes made them very heavy. The effort we had to make at every step to get each foot out of the dirt tired us out. I sat down on a milestone and declared that I would not go any further. My companion wept, and the two young German officers, who had acted as bodyguards, made a seat for me by crossing their hands, and we went nearly another mile like that. My companion could not walk any farther. I offered her my place, but she refused it. Well, then, let us wait here, I said, and quite at the end of our strength, we rested against a little broken tree. It was now night, and such a cold night. Huddled close to Soubise, trying to keep warm, I began to fall asleep, seeing before my eyes the wounded men of Chatillon, who had died seated against the little shrubs. I did not want to move again, and the torpor seemed to me thoroughly delicious. A cart passed by, however, on its way to Tergnier. One of the young men hailed it, and when the terms were made, I felt myself picked up from the ground, lifted into the vehicle, and carried along by the jerky rolling movement of two loose wheels, which climbed the hills, sank into the mire, and jumped over the heaps of stones, while the driver whipped up his beasts and urged them on with his voice. He had a don't-care-let-what-will-happen way of driving, which was quite the note of the times. I was aware of all this in my semi-sleep, for I was not really asleep, but I did not want to answer any questions. I gave myself up to this prostration of my whole being with a certain enjoyment. A rough jerk, however, indicated that we had arrived at Tergnier. The cart had drawn up at the hotel, and we had to get out. I pretended to still be asleep, but it was no use. I had to wake up. The two young men helped me up to my room. I asked Soubise to arrange about the payment of the cart before the departure of our excellent young companions, who were very sorry to leave us. I signed for each of them a voucher on a sheet of the hotel paper for a photograph. Only one of them ever claimed it. This was six years later, and I sent it to him. The Tergnier Hotel could only give us one room between us, so I let Soubise go to bed, and I slept in an armchair dressed as I was. The following morning I asked about a train for Cateau, but I was told that there was no train. We had to work marvels to get a vehicle, but finally Dr. Meunier, or Ms. Nier, agreed to lend us a two-wheeled conveyance. That was something— but there was no horse. The poor doctor's horse had been requisitioned by the enemy. A wheelwright for an exorbitant price let me hire a colt that had never been in the shafts and which went wild when the harness was put on. The poor little beast calmed down after being well lashed, but his wildness then changed into stubbornness. He stood still on his four legs, which were trembling with fury, and refused to move. With his neck stretched forward toward the ground, his eye fixed and his nostrils dilating, he would not budge any more than a stake in the earth. 
Two men then held the light carriage back. The halter was taken off the colt's neck. He shook his head for an instant, and thinking himself free and without any impediments, he began to step out. The men were scarcely holding the vehicle. He gave two little kicks and then began to trot. It was only a very short trot. A boy then stopped him. Some carrots were given to him. His mane was stroked, and the halter was put on again. He stopped suddenly, but the boy, jumping into the gig and holding the reins lightly, spoke to him and encouraged him to move on. The colt tried timidly, and not feeling any resistance, began to trot along for about a quarter of an hour, and then came back to us at the door of the hotel. I had to leave a deposit of four hundred francs with the notary of the place in case the colt should die. Ah, what a journey it was with the boy! Subisa and I sitting close together in that little gig, the wheels of which creaked at every jolt. The unhappy colt was steaming like a peau de feu when the lid is raised. We started at eleven in the morning, and when we had to stop because of the poor beast who could not go any farther, it was five in the afternoon, and we had not gone five miles. Oh, that poor colt! He was certainly to be pitied. We were not very heavy, all three of us together, but we were too much for him. We were just a few yards away from a sordid-looking house. I knocked, and an enormous old woman opened the door. "'What do you want?' she asked. "'Hospitality for an hour and shelter for our horse.' She looked out on the road and saw our turnout. "'Hey, father,' she called in a husky voice. "'Come and look here.' A fat man, quite as fat but older than she was, came hobbling heavily along. She pointed to the gig so oddly equipped, and he burst out laughing and said to me in an insolent way, Well, what do you want? I repeated my phrase, Hospitality for an hour, etc., etc. Perhaps we can do it, but it'll want paying for. I showed him twenty francs. The old woman gave him a nudge. Oh, but in these times, you know, it is well worth forty francs. Very good, I said. Agreed. Forty francs. He then let me go inside the house with Mademoiselle Soubise and sent his son forward to the boy, who was coming along holding the colt by his mane. He had taken off the halter very considerately and thrown my rug over its steaming sides. On reaching the house, the poor beast was quickly unharnessed and taken into a little enclosure, at the far end of which a few badly joined planks served as a stable for an old mule, which was aroused by the fat woman with kicks, and turned out into the enclosure. The colt took its place, and when I asked for some oats for it, she replied, Perhaps we could get it some, but it isn't in the price of the forty francs. Very well, I said, and I gave our boy five francs to fetch the oats, but the old shrew took the money from him and handed it to her lad, saying, You go, you know where to find them, and come back quick. Our boy stayed with the colt, drying it and rubbing it down as well as he could. I went back to the house where I found my charming soubise with her sleeves turned up and her delicate hands washing two glasses and two plates for us. I asked if it would be possible to have some eggs. Yes, but, I interrupted our monstrous hostess. Don't tire yourself, madame, I beg, I said. It is understood that the forty francs are your tip, and that I am to pay for everything else. She was confused for a moment, shaking her head and trying to find words, but I asked her to give me the eggs. She brought me five eggs, and I began to prepare my omelette as my culinary glory is an omelette. The water was nauseous, so we drank cider. I sent for the boy and let him have something to eat in our presence, for I was afraid that the ogress would give him too economical a meal. When I paid the fabulous bill of seventy-five francs, inclusive, of course, of the twenty francs, the matron put on her spectacles and, taking one of the gold pieces, looked at it on one side, then on the other, made it ring on a plate, and then on the ground. She did this with 
each of the three gold pieces. I could not help laughing. Oh, there's nothing to laugh at, she grunted. For the last six months, we've had nothing but thieves here. And you know something about theft, I said. She looked at me, trying to make out what I meant, but the laughing expression in my eyes took away her suspicions. This was very fortunate, as they were people capable of doing us harm. I had taken the precaution, when sitting down to table, of putting my revolver near me. You know how to fire that? asked the lame man. Oh, yes, I shoot very well, I answered, but this was not true. Our steed was then put in again in a few seconds, and we proceeded on our way. The colt appeared to be quite joyful. He stamped, kicked a little, and began to go at a pretty steady pace. Our disagreeable host had told us the way to St. Quentin, and we set off after our poor colt had made attempts to stand still. I was dead tired and fell asleep. But after about an hour, the vehicle stopped abruptly, and the wretched beast began to snort and put his back up, supporting himself on his four stiff, trembling legs. It had been a gloomy day, and a lowering sky seemed to be shedding tears slowly over the earth. We had stopped in the middle of a field, which had been plowed up all over by the heavy wheels of cannon. The rest of the ground had been trampled by horses' feet, and the cold had hardened the little ridges of earth, leaving icicles here and there which glittered dismally in the thick atmosphere. We got down from the vehicle to try to discover what was making our little animal tremble in this way. I gave a cry of horror, for only about five yards away some dogs were pulling wildly at a dead body half of which was still underground. It was a soldier, and fortunately one of the enemy. I took the whip from our young driver and lashed the horrid animals as hard as I could. They moved away for a second, showing their teeth, and then returned to their voracious and abominable work, growling sullenly at us. Our boy got down and led the snorting pony by the bridle. We went on with some difficulty trying to find the road in these devastated plains. Darkness came over us, and it was icy cold. The moon feebly pushed aside her veils and shone over the landscape with a wan, sad light. I was half dead with fright. It seemed to me that the silence was broken by cries from underground, and every little mound of earth appeared to me to be a head. Subice was crying, with her face hidden in her hands. After going along for half an hour, we saw, in the distance, a little group of people coming along carrying lanterns. I went toward them, as I wanted to find out which way to go. I was embarrassed on getting nearer to them, for I could hear sobs. I saw a poor woman, who was very corpulent, being helped along by a young priest. The whole of her body was shaken by her fits of grief. She was followed by two sub-officers and by three other persons. I let her pass by and then questioned those who were following her. I was told that she was looking for the bodies of her husband and son. Both had been killed a few days before on the St. Quentin Plains. She came each day at dusk in order to avoid inquisitive people, and she had not yet met with any success. It was hoped that she would find them this time, as one of these sub-officers, who had just left the hospital, was taking them to the spot where he had seen the poor creature's husband fall mortally wounded. He had fallen there himself and had been picked up by the ambulance people. I thanked these persons who told me the wretched road we must take. The best one there was lay through this cemetery. We could now distinguish groups of people searching about, and it was all so horrible that it made me want to scream out. Suddenly, the boy who was driving us pulled my coat sleeve. Oh, madame, he said, look at that scoundrel stealing. I looked and saw a man lying down full length with a large bag near him. He had a dark lantern, which he had held toward the ground. He then got up, looked around him, 
for his outline could be seen distinctly on the horizon and began his work again. When he caught sight of us, he put out his lamp and crouched down on the ground. We walked on in silence straight toward him. I took the colt by the bridle on the other side of me. I walked straight toward the man, pretending not to know he was there. The colt backed, but we pulled hard and made it advance. We were so near to him that I shuddered at the thought that the wretch would perhaps allow himself to be trampled over by the animal and the light vehicle rather than reveal his presence. Fortunately, though, I was mistaken. A stifled voice murmured, Take care there, I am wounded. You will run over me. I took the gig lantern down. We had covered it with a jacket, as the moon lighted us better, and I turned it now on the face of this wretch. I was stupefied to see a man of from sixty-five to seventy years of age, with a hollow-looking face, framed with long, dirty white whiskers. He had a muffler around his neck, and was wearing a peasant's cloak of a dark color. Around him, shown up by the moon, were sword belts, brass buttons, sword hilts, and other objects that the infamous old man had torn from the poor dead men. You are not wounded. You are a thief and a violator of tombs. I shall call out and you will be killed. Do you hear that, you miserable wretch? I exclaimed and went so near to him that I could feel his breath sully mine. He crouched down on his knees, and clasping his criminal hands, implored me in a trembling, tearful voice. Leave your bag there, then, I said, and all those things. Empty your pockets, leave everything, and go. Run, for as soon as you are out of sight, I shall call one of those soldiers who are searching, and I shall give them your plunder. I know I am doing wrong, though, in letting you off, and not giving you up. He emptied his pockets, groaning all the time, and was just going away when the lad whispers, He's hiding some boots under his cloak. I was furious with rage with this vile thief, and I pulled his big cloak off. Leave everything, you wretched man, I exclaimed, or I will call out. Six pairs of boots taken from the corpses fell noisily onto the hard ground. The man stooped down for his revolver, which he had taken out of his pocket at the same time as the stolen objects. "'Will you leave that and get away quickly?' I said. "'My patience is at an end. "'But if I am caught, I shan't be able to defend myself,' he explained in a fit of desperate rage. "'It will be because God willed it so,' I answered. "'Go at once or I will call.' The man then made off, abusing me as he went. Our little driver then fetched a soldier to whom I related the adventure, showing him the objects. Which way did the rascal go? asked a sergeant who had come with the soldier. I can't say, I replied. Oh, well, I don't care to run after him, he said. There are enough dead men here. We continued our way until we came to a place where several roads met and it was then possible for us to take a road a little more suitable for vehicles. After going through Boussigny and a wood where there were bogs in which we only just escaped being swallowed up, our painful journey came to an end, and we arrived at Cateau in the night, half dead with fatigue, fright, and despair. I was obliged to take a day's rest there, for I was prostrate with feverishness. We had two little rooms, roughly whitewashed, but quite clean. The floor was of red, shiny bricks, and there was a polished wood bed and curtains of white sateen. I sent for a doctor for my nice little Mademoiselle Soubise, who, it seemed to me, was worse than I was. He thought we were both in a very bad state, though. A nervous feverishness had taken all the use out of my limbs and made my head burn. Soubise could not keep still, but kept seeing specters and fires, hearing shouts and turning round quickly, imagining that someone had touched her on the shoulder. The good man gave us a soothing draught to overcome our fatigue, and the next day a very hot bath brought back the suppleness to our limbs. 
It was then six days since we had left Paris, and it would take about 20 more hours to reach Hamburg, for in those days trains went much less quickly than at present. I took the train for Brussels, where I was counting on buying a trunk and a few necessary things. From Cateau to Brussels, there was no hindrance to our journey, and we were able to take the train again the same evening. We had replenished our wardrobe, which certainly needed it, and we continued our journey without much difficulty as far as Cologne. Although on passing through Strasbourg, I had a nervous attack from sorrow and despair. On arriving at Cologne, we had a cruel disappointment. The train had only just entered the station when a railway official, passing quickly in front of the carriages, shouted something in German, which I did not catch. Everyone seemed to be in a hurry, and men and women pushed each other without any courtesy. I addressed another official and showed him our tickets. He took up my bag very obligingly and hurried after the crowd. We followed, but I did not understand the excitement until the man flung my bag into a compartment and signed to me to get in as quickly as possible. Mademoiselle Soubise was already on the step when she was pushed aside violently by a railway porter, who slammed the door, and before I was fully aware of what had happened, the train had disappeared. My bag had gone in the carriage, and my trunk was with all the other trunks, in a luggage van that had been unhooked from the train which had arrived and fastened on to the express which had left. I began to cry with rage. An official took pity on us and led us to the station master. He was a very superior sort of man, who spoke French fairly well. I sank down in his great leather armchair and told him my misadventure, sobbing nervously. He looked kind and sympathetic. He immediately telegraphed for my bag and trunk to be given into the care of the station master at the first station. You will have them again tomorrow toward midday, he said. Then I cannot start this evening? I asked. Oh, no, that is impossible, he replied. There is no train, for the express that will take you to Hamburg does not start before tomorrow morning. Oh, God, oh, God, I exclaimed, and I was seized with veritable despair, which soon affected Mademoiselle Soubise, too. The poor station master was rather embarrassed and tried to soothe me. Do you know anyone here? he asked. No, no one. I have only been to Baden-Baden. That was three years ago, and I do not know anyone in Cologne. Well, then, I will have you driven to the Hotel de Nord. My sister-in-law has been there for two days, and she will look after you. Half an hour later, his carriage arrived, and he took us to the Hotel de Nord, after driving a long way around to show us the city. But at that time, I did not admire anything belonging to the Germans. On arriving at the Hotel du Nord, he introduced us to his sister-in-law, a fair-haired young woman, pretty but too tall and too big for my taste. I must say, though, that she was very sweet and affable. She engaged two bedrooms for us near her own rooms. She had a flat on the ground floor, and she invited us to dinner, which was served in her drawing-room. Her brother-in-law joined us in the evening. The charming woman was very musical. She played to us from Berlioz, Gounod, and even Auber. I thoroughly appreciated the delicacy of this woman in letting us hear only French composers. I asked her to play something from Mozart and Wagner. At that name, she turned to me and explained, Do you like Wagner? I like his music, I replied, but I detest the man. Mademoiselle Soubise whispered to me, Ask her to play least. She overheard and complied with infinite graciousness. I must own that I spent a delicious evening there. At ten o'clock the station master, whose name I have very stupidly forgotten, and I cannot find it in any of my notes, told me he would call for us at eight the following morning, and then took leave of us. I fell asleep, lulled by Mozart, Gunad, etc. At eight o'clock the next morning, a servant came to tell me that the carriage was waiting for us. 
There was a gentle knock at my door, and our pretty hostess of the previous evening said sweetly, Come, you must start. I was really very much touched by the delicacy of this pretty German woman. It was such a fine day that I asked her if we should have time to walk, and on her reply in the affirmative, we all three started for the station, which is not far from the hotel. An engaged carriage had been reserved for us, and we installed ourselves in it as comfortably as possible. The brother and sister shook hands with us and wished us a pleasant journey. When the train had started, I discovered in one of the corners a bouquet of forget-me-nots with the sister's card and a box of chocolates from the station master. I was at last about to arrive at my goal and was in a state of wild excitement at the idea of seeing once more all my beloved ones. My eyes, which had grown larger with anxiety, traveled more rapidly than the train. I fumed each time it stopped and envied the birds I saw flying along. I laughed with delight as I thought of the surprised faces of those I was going to see again, and then I began to tremble with anxiety. What had happened to them, and should I find them at all? I should if... Ah, those ifs, those becauses, and those buts. My mind became full of them. They bristled with illnesses and accidents, and I began to weep. My poor little traveling companion began to weep, too. Finally, we came within sight of Homburg. Twenty more minutes of this turning of wheels, and we entered the station. But just as though all the sprites and devils from the infernal regions had concerted to torture my patience, we stopped short. All heads were out of the windows. What is it? What's the matter? Why are we not going on? There was a train in front of us at a standstill with a broken brake, and the line had to be cleared. I fell back on my seat, clenching my teeth and hands and looking up in the air to distinguish the evil spirits which were so bent on tormenting me, and then I resolutely closed my eyes. I muttered some invectives against the invisible sprites and declared that as I would not suffer any more, I was now going to rest. I then fell fast asleep. For the power of sleeping when I wished is a precious gift which God has bestowed on me. In the most frightful circumstances and the most cruel moments of life, when I have felt that my reason was giving way under shocks that have been too great or too painful, my will has laid hold of my reason, just as one holds a bad-tempered little dog that wants to bite, and subjugating it, my will has said to my reason, Enough! You can take up again tomorrow your suffering and your plans, your anxiety, your sorrow, and your anguish. You have had enough for today. You would give way altogether under the weight of so many troubles, and you would drag me along with you. I will not have it. We will forget everything for a while and go to sleep together. And I have gone to sleep. This is absolutely true. Mademoiselle Soubise roused me as soon as the train had really arrived. I was refreshed and calmer. A minute later we were in a carriage and had given the address Seven Aubert Strasser. We were soon there, and I found all my adored ones, big and little, and they were all very well. Oh, what happiness it was! The blood pulsed in all my arteries. I had suffered so much that I burst out into delicious sobs. Who can ever describe the infinite pleasure of tears of joy? During the next two days, the maddest things occurred, which I will not relate, so incredible would they sound. Among others, fire broke out in the house. We had to escape in our night clothes, camp out for six hours in five feet of snow, etc., etc., but everyone was safe and sound. We then set out for Paris, but on arriving at St. Denis, there were no more trains. It was four o'clock in the morning. The Germans were masters of all the suburbs of Paris, and the trains ran only for their service. 
After an hour spent in running about, in discussions and rebuffs, I found an officer of higher rank, who was better educated and more agreeable. He had a locomotive prepared to take me to the Gare de Havre. The journey was very amusing. My mother, my aunt, my sister Regina, Mademoiselle Soubise, the two maids, the children, and I all squeezed into a little square space in which there was a very small narrow bench, which I think was the place for the signalmen in those days. The engine went very slowly, as the rails were frequently obstructed by carts or railway carriages. We left at five in the morning and reached the Gare de Havre at seven. At a place which I cannot locate, our German conductors were exchanged for French. I questioned them and learned that Paris was just then disturbed by revolutionary movements. The stoker with whom I was talking was a very intelligent and very advanced individual. You would do better to go somewhere else and not to Paris, he said, for before long they will come to blows there. We had arrived by this time, but at this hour, as no train was expected in, it was impossible to find a carriage. I got down with my tribe from the locomotive to the great amazement of the station officials. I was no longer very rich, but I offered twenty francs to one of the men if he would see to our six bags. We were to send for my trunk and those belonging to my family later on. There was not a single carriage outside the station. What was to be done? I was then living at number four, Rue de Rome, and this was not far away, but my mother scarcely ever walked, for she was delicate and had a weak heart. The children, too, were very, very tired. Their eyes were puffed up and scarcely opened, and their little limbs benumbed by the cold and the sitting still. I began to get desperate, but a milk cart was just passing by, and I sent the porter to hail it. I offered twenty francs if the man would drive my mother and the two children to four Rue de Rome. And you too, if you like, young lady, said the milkman, you are thinner than a grasshopper. You won't make it any heavier. I did not want inviting twice, although rather annoyed by the man's speech. And once my mother was installed, in spite of her hesitation, by the side of the milkman, and the children and I were among the full and empty milk pails, I said to the man, Would it be all the same to you to come back and fetch the others? I pointed to the remaining group and added, You shall have twenty francs more. Right you are, said the worthy fellow, a good day's work. Don't you tire your legs, you others, I'll be back for you directly. He then whipped up his horse and took us off at a wild rate. The children rolled about and I held on. My mother set her teeth and did not utter a word, but from under her long lashes she glanced at me with a displeased look. On arriving at my door, the milkman drew up his horse so short that I thought my mother would fall out onto the animal's back. We had arrived, though, and we got out. The cart started off again at full speed. My mother would not speak to me for about an hour. Poor, pretty mother. It was not my fault after all. End. Section 16 of Memories of My Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kristen Hand. Memories of My Life by Sarah Bernhardt. The Commune and Victor Hugo. I had gone away from Paris eleven days before and had then left a sad city. The sadness had been painful, the result of a great misfortune which had been unexpected. No one had dared to look up, fearing to be blown upon by the same wind which was blowing the German flag floating over yonder beyond the Arc de Triomphe. I found Paris now effervescent and grumbling. The walls were placarded with many-colored posters, and all these posters contained the wildest harangues. Fine, noble ideas were side by side with absurd threats. Workmen, on their way to their daily toil, stopped in front of these bills, one would read aloud, and the gathering crowd would begin the reading over again. 
and all these human beings who had just been suffering so much through this abominable war now echoed these appeals for vengeance they were very much to be excused this war alas had hollowed out under their very feet a gulf of ruin and of mourning poverty had brought the women to rags the privations of the siege had lowered the vitality of the children and the shame of the defeat had discouraged the men well these appeals to rebellion these anarchist shouts these yells from the crowd shrieking down with thrones down with the republic down with the rich down with the priests down with the jews down with the army down with the masters down with those who work down with everything all these cries roused the benumbed hearers the germans who fomented all these riots rendered us a real service without intending it those who had given themselves up to resignation were stirred out of their torpor others who were asking for revenge found an ailment for their inactive forces none of them agreed there were ten or twenty different parties devouring each other and threatening each other it was terrible but it was the awakening it was life after death i had among my friends about ten of the leaders of different opinions and all of them interested me the maddest and the wisest of them i often saw gambetta at girardin's and it was a joy to me to listen to this admirable man what he said was so wise so well balanced and so captivating this man with his heavy stomach his short arms and huge head had a halo of beauty round him when he spoke and he was never common never ordinary he took snuff and the gesture of his hand when he brushed away the stray grains was full of grace he smoked huge cigars but could smoke them without annoying anyone when he was tired of politics and talked to literature it was a rare charm for he knew everything and quoted poetry admirably one evening after dinner at girardin's we played together the whole of the scene in the first act between ernani and dona sol he was not handsome like monet soule but he was just as admirable in it another time he recited the whole of ruth and boaz but i preferred his political discussions to all that especially when he criticized the speech of someone whose opinion was opposed to his own the eminent qualities of this politician's talent were logic and balance and his seductive force was chauvinism the obscure death of so great a thinker is a disconcerting challenge flung at human pride i sometimes saw rochefort whose wit delighted me i was not at ease with him though for he was the cause of the fall of the empire and although i am very republican i liked the emperor napoleon the third he had been too trustful but very unfortunate and it seemed to me that rochefort insulted him too much after his misfortune i also frequently saw paul de remusat the favorite of thiers he had great refinement of mind broad ideas and fascinating manners some people accused him of orleanism he was a republican and a much more advanced republican than thiers any one must have known him very little to believe him anything else but what he said he was paul de remusat had a horror of untruth he was sensitive and had a very straightforward strong character he took no active part in politics except in private circles and his advice always prevailed even in the chamber and in the senate he would never speak except in the office the ministry of fine arts was offered to him a hundred times but he repeatedly refused it finally after my repeated entreaties he almost allowed himself to be appointed minister of fine arts but at the last moment he declined and wrote me a delicious letter from which i quote a few passages as the letter was not written for publication i do not consider that i have a right to give the whole of it but there seems to be no harm in publishing these few lines allow me my charming friend to remain in the shade i can see better there than in the dazzling brilliancy of men you are grateful to me sometimes for being attentive to the miseries you point out to me let me keep my independence it is more agreeable to me to have the right to relieve everyone than to be obliged to relieve no matter whom in matters of art i have made for myself an ideal of beauty which would naturally seem too partial it is a great pity that the scruples of this delicate-minded man did not allow him to accept this office the reforms that he pointed out to me were and still are very necessary ones however that cannot be helped i also knew and frequently saw a great foolish fellow full of dreams and utopian follies 
His name was Florenz, and he was tall and nice-looking. He wanted everyone to be happy and everyone to have money, and he shot down the soldiers without reflecting that he was commencing by making one or more of them unhappy. Reasoning with him was impossible, but he was charming and brave. I saw him two days before his death. He came to see me with a very young girl who wanted to devote herself to dramatic art. I promised him to help her. Two days later, the poor child came to tell me of the heroic death of Florenz. He had refused to surrender and stretching out his arms and shouted to the hesitating soldiers, shoot, shoot, I would not have spared you. And he had then fallen under the bullets. Another man, not so interesting, whom I looked upon as a dangerous madman, was a certain Raoul Rigault. For a short time, he was prefect of police. He was very young and very daring, wildly ambitious, determined to do anything to succeed, and it seemed to him more easy to do harm than good. That man was a real danger. He belonged to that band of students who used to send me verses every day. I came across them everywhere, enthusiastic and mad. They had been nicknamed in Paris the Drivelers. One day he brought me a little one-act play. This piece was so stupid and the verses so insipid that I sent it back to him with a few words which he no doubt considered unkind, for he bore me malice for them and attempted to avenge himself in the following way. He called on me one day. Madame Gerard was there when he was shown in. "'Do you know that I am all-powerful at present?' he said." "'In these days there is nothing surprising in that,' I replied. "'I have come to see you, either to make peace or declare war,' he continued. "'This way of talking did not suit me, and I sprang up. "'As I can foresee that your conditions of peace would not suit me, cher monsieur, "'I will not give you time to declare war. "'You are one of the men one would prefer, no matter how spiteful they might be, "'to have for enemies rather than friends.' With these words, I rang for my footman to show the prefect of police to the door. Madame Gerard was in a despair. That man will do us some harm, my dear Sarah, I assure you, she said. She was not mistaken in her presentiment, except that she was thinking of me and not of herself, for his first vengeance was taken on her by sending away one of her relatives, who was a police commissioner, to an inferior and dangerous post. He then began to invent a hundred miseries for me. One day I received an order to go at once to the prefecture of police on urgent business. I took no notice. The following day a mounted courier brought me a note from Sire Raoul Rigault, threatening to send a prison van for me. I took no notice whatever of the threats of this wretch, who was shot shortly after and died without showing any courage. Life, however, was no longer possible in Paris, and I decided to go to Saint-Germain-en-Laye. I asked my mother to go with me, but she went to Switzerland with my youngest sister. The departure from Paris was not as easy as I had hoped. Communists with gun on shoulder stopped the trains and searched in all our bags and pockets, and even under the cushions of the railway carriages. They were afraid that the passengers were taking newspapers to Versailles. This was monstrously stupid. The installation at Saint-Germain was not easy. Nearly all Paris had taken refuge in this little place, which is as pretty as it is dull. From the height of the terrace where the crowd remained morning and night, we could see the alarming progress of the commune. On all sides of Paris the flame rose, proud and destructive. The wind often brought us burnt papers, which we took to the council house. The Seine brought quantities along with it, and the boatmen collected these in sacks. Some days, and these were the most distressing of them, an opaque veil of smoke enveloped Paris. There was no breeze to allow the flames to pierce through. The city then burned stealthily, without our anxious eyes being able to discover what fresh homes these furious madmen had set alight. I went for a ride every day in the forest. Sometimes I would go as far as Versailles, but this was not without danger. We often came across poor, starving wretches in the forest, whom we joyfully helped, but often, too, there were prisoners who had escaped from Poisset, or communist sharpshooters trying to shoot a Versailles soldier. On the way back from Triel, where Captain O'Connor and I had been for a gallop over all the hills, we entered the forest rather late in the evening, as it was a shorter way. A shot wits fired from a neighboring thicket, which made my horse bound so sharply toward the left that I was thrown. Fortunately, my horse was quiet. O'Connor hurried to me, but I was already up and ready to mount again. 
Just a second, he said. I want to search that thicket. With a short gallop, he was soon at the spot, and then I heard a shot, some branches breaking under flying feet, then another shot, not at all like the two former ones, and my friend appeared again with a pistol in his hand. It has not touched you? I asked. Yes, the first shot touched my leg, but the fellow aimed too low. The second he fired haphazard. I fancy, though, that he has a bullet from my revolver in his body. But I heard someone running away, I said. Oh, replied the elegant captain, chuckling, he will not go far. Poor wretch, I murmured. Oh, no, exclaimed O'Connor. Do not pity them, I beg. They kill numbers of our men every day. Only yesterday, five soldiers from my regiment were found on the Versailles Road, not only killed, but mutilated. And gnashing his teeth, he finished his sentence with an oath. I turned toward him rather surprised, but he took no notice. We continued our way, riding as quickly as the obstacles in the forest would allow us. All at once, our horses stopped short, snorting and sniffing. O'Connor took his revolver in his hand, got off, and led his horse. A few yards from us, there was a man lying on the ground. "'That must be my wretch of just now,' said my companion, and bending down over the man, he spoke to him. A moan was the only reply. O'Connor had not seen his man, so he could not have recognized him. He lighted a match, and we saw that this one had no gun. I had dismounted and was trying to raise the unfortunate man's head, but I withdrew my hand covered with blood. He had opened his eyes and fixed them on O'Connor. "'Ah, it's you, Versailles dog,' he said. "'It was you who shot me. I missed you, but—' He tried to pull out the revolver from his belt, but the effort was too great, and his hand fell down inert. O'Connor, on his side, had cocked his revolver, but I placed myself in front of the man and besought him to leave the poor fellow in peace. I could scarcely recognize my friend, for this nice-looking fair-haired man, so correct, rather a snob, but very charming, seemed to have turned into a brute. Leaning forward toward the unfortunate man, his underjaw advancing, he was muttering under his teeth some inarticulate words. His clenched hand seemed to be grasping his anger, just as one does an anonymous letter, before flinging it away in disgust. "'O'Connor, let this man alone, please,' I said. He was as gallant a man as he was a good soldier. He gave way and seemed to become aware of the situation again. "'Good,' he said, helping me to mount once more. "'When I have taken you back to your hotel, I will come back with some men to pick up this wretch.' Half an hour later, we were back home without having exchanged another word during our ride. I kept up my friendship with O'Connor, but I could never see him again without thinking of that scene. Suddenly, when he was talking to me, the brute-like mask under which I had seen him for a second would fix itself again over his laughing face. Quite recently, in March 1905, General O'Connor, who was commanding in Algeria, came to see me one evening in my dressing room at the theater. He told me about his difficulties with some of the great Arab chiefs. I fancy, he said laughing, that we shall have to have a brush together. The captain's mask for me then fixed itself on the general's face. I never saw him again, for he died six months afterwards. We were at last able to go back to Paris. The abominable and shameful peace had been signed, the wretched commune crushed. Everything was supposed to be in order again, but what blood and ashes, what women in mourning, what ruins. The bitter odor of smoke was what we inhaled in Paris. All that I touched at home left on my fingers a somewhat greasy and almost imperceptible color. A general uneasiness beset France, and more especially Paris. The theaters, however, opened their doors once more, and that was a general relief. One morning, I received from the Odeon a notice of rehearsal. I shook out my hair, stamped my feet, and sniffed the air like a young horse snorting. The race ground was to be opened for us again. We should be able to gallop afresh through our dreams. The lists were open. The contest was beginning. Life was commencing again. It is truly strange that a man's mind should have made of life a perpetual strife. When there is no longer war, there is battle, for there are a hundred thousand of us for the same object. God has created the earth and man for each other. The earth is vast. What ground there is uncultivated. Miles upon miles, acre upon acre of new land, waiting for arms that will take from its bosom the treasures of inexhaustible nature. And we remained grouped round each other, 
crowds of famishing people watching other groups, which are also lying in wait. The Odeon opened its doors to the public, offering them its repertory. Some new pieces were given us to study. One of these, more particularly, had great success. It was André Thierry's Jean-Marie, and was given in October 1871. This little one-act play is a veritable masterpiece, and it took its author straight to the Academy. Porel, who played the part of Jean-Marie, had huge success. He was at that time slender, nimble, and full of youthful ardor. He needed a little more poetry, but the joyous laughter of his thirty-two teeth made up in ardor for what was wanting in poetic desire. It was very good anyhow. My role of the young Breton girl, submissive to the elderly husband forced upon her, and living eternally with the memory of the fiancé who was absent, perhaps dead, was pretty, poetical, and touching through the final sacrifice. There was even a certain grandeur in the end of the piece. It had, I must repeat, an immense success and increased my growing reputation. I was, however, awaiting the event which was to consecrate me a star. I did not quite know what I was expecting, but I knew that my Messiah had to come, and it was the greatest poet of the last century who was to place on my head the crown of the elect. At the end of that year, 1871, we were told in a rather mysterious and solemn way that we were going to play a piece of Victor Hugo's. My mind at that time of my life was still closed to great ideas. What, with my somewhat cosmopolitan family, their rather snobbish acquaintances and friends, and the acquaintances and friends I had chosen in my independent life as an artiste, I was living in a rather bourgeois atmosphere. I had heard Victor Hugo spoken of ever since my childhood, as a rebel and a renegade, and his works, which I had read with passion, did not prevent my judging him with very great severity. And I blush today with anger and shame when I think of all my absurd prejudices, nourished by the imbecile or insincere little court which flattered me. I had a great wish, nevertheless, to play in Rui Bla. The role of the queen seemed so charming to me. I mentioned my wish to Duke Nell, who said he had already thought of it. Jane Essler, an artiste then in vogue, but a trifle vulgar, had great chances, though, against me. She was on very friendly terms with Paul Maurice, Victor Hugo's intimate friend and adviser. A friend brought Auguste Vacquerie to my house. He was the other friend and even a relative of the illustrious master. Auguste Vacquerie promised to speak for me to Victor Hugo, and two days later he came again, assuring me that I had every chance in my favor. Paul Maurice himself, a very straightforward man with a delightful mind, had proposed me to the author. Then, too, Geoffrey, the admirable artiste taken from the Comédie Française to play Don Salust, had said, it appears, that he could see only one little queen of Spain worthy to wear the crown, and I was that one. I did not know Geoffrey, I did not know Paul Maurice, and was rather astonished that they should know me. The reading was to be at Victor Hugo's the next day at two o'clock. I was very much spoiled and very much praised and flattered, so that I felt hurt at the unceremoniousness of a man who did not condescend to disturb himself, but asked women to go to his house, when there was neutral ground, the theatre, for the reading of plays. I told this unheard-of thing at five o'clock to my little court, and men and women alike exclaimed, What? That man who was only the other day an outlaw? That man who has only just been pardoned? that nobody dares to ask the little idol, the queen of hearts, the fairy of fairies, to inconvenience herself. All my little sanctuary was in a tumult. Men and women alike could not keep still. She must not go, they said. Write him this. Write him that. And they were composing impertinent, disdainful letters when Marshal Canrobet was announced. He belonged to that time to my little five o'clock court, and he was soon posted by my turbulent visitors. He was furiously angry at the imbecilities uttered against the great poet. "'You must not go to Victor Hugo's,' he said to me, "'for it seems to me that he has no reason to deviate from the regular customs. But make an excuse of sudden illness. Follow my advice and show the respect for him that we owe to genius.' I followed my great friend's counsel and sent the following letter to the poet. Monsieur, 
The queen has taken a chill, and her camarera mayor forbids her to go out. You know better than anyone else the etiquette of this Spanish court. Pity your queen, monsieur. I sent the letter, and the following is the poet's reply. I am your valet, madame. Victor Hugo. The next day, the play was read on the stage to the artistes. I believe that the reading did not take place, or at least not entirely, at the master's house. I then made the acquaintance of the monster. Ah, what a grudge I had for a long time against all those silly people who had prejudiced me. The monster was charming, so witty and refined, and so gallant, with a gallantry that was an homage and not an insult. He was so good, too, to the humble, and always so gay. He was not certainly the ideal of elegance, but there was a moderation in his gestures, a gentleness in his way of speaking, which savored the old French peer. He was quick at repartee, and his observations were gentle but persistent. He recited poetry badly, but adored hearing it well recited. He often spoke in verse when he wanted to reprimand an artiste. One day, during rehearsal, he was trying to convince poor Tallien about his bad elocution. I was bored by the length of the colloquy and sat down on the table swinging my legs. He understood my impatience, and to getting up from the middle of the orchestra exclaimed, Un reine d'Espagne honnête et respectable ne devrait point ainsi se soit son table. I sprang from the table, slightly embarrassed, and wanted to answer him in a rather piquant or witty way, but I could not find anything to say, and remained there, confused and in a bad temper. One day, when the rehearsal was over an hour earlier than usual, I was waiting, my forehead pressed against the window pane for the arrival of Madame Gerard, who was coming to fetch me. I was gazing idly at the footpath opposite, which is bounded by the Luxembourg railings. Victor Hugo had just crossed the road and was about to walk on. An old woman attracted his attention. She had just put a heavy bundle of linen down on the ground and was wiping her forehead, on which were great beads of perspiration. In spite of the cold, her toothless mouth was half open as she was panting, and her eyes had an expression of distressing anxiety as she looked at the wide road she had to cross, with carriages and omnibuses passing each other. Victor Hugo approached her, and after a short conversation, he drew a piece of money from his pocket, handed it to her, then taking off his hat, he confided it to her, and with a quick movement and a laughing face, lifted the bundle to his shoulder and crossed the road, followed by the bewildered woman. I rushed downstairs to embrace him for it, but by the time I had reached the passage, jostled against de Chilet, who wanted to stop me, and descended the staircase, Victor Hugo had disappeared. I could see only the old woman's back, but it seemed to me that she hobbled along now more briskly. The next day I told the poet that I had witnessed his delicate good deed. Oh, said Paul Maurice, his eyes wet with emotion. Every day that dawns is a day of kindness for him. I embraced Victor Hugo, and we went to the rehearsal. Oh, those rehearsals of Rue Bla! I shall never forget them, for there was such good grace and charm about everything. When Victor Hugo arrived, everything brightened up. His two satellites, Auguste Vacquery and Paul Maurice, scarcely ever left him. And when the master was absent, they kept up the divine fire. Geoffrey, severe, sad, and distinguished, often gave me advice. Then, during the intervals of rest, I posed for him in various attitudes, for he was a painter. In the foyer of the Comédie Française, there are two pictures representing the members of both sexes for two generations. The pictures are not of very original composition, neither are they of beautiful coloring, but they are faithful likenesses, it appears, and rather happily grouped. La Fontaine, who was playing Rue Bla, often had long discussions with the master in which Victor Hugo never yielded. And I must confess that he was always right. La Fontaine had conviction and self-assurance, but his elocution was very bad for poetry. He had lost his teeth, and they were replaced by a set of false ones. This gave a certain slowness to his delivery, and there was a little odd clacking sound between his real palate and his artificial rubber palate, which often distracted the ear listening attentively to catch the beauty of the poetry. 
as to that poor Tayen, who was playing Don Giratan, he made a hash of it every minute. He had understood his role quite wrongly. Victor Hugo explained it to him clearly and intelligently. Tayen was a well-intentioned comedian, a hard worker, always conscientious, but as stupid as a goose. What he did not understand at first, he never understood. It was finished for life. But, as he was straightforward and loyal, he put himself into the hands of the author and gave himself up then in complete self-abnegation. That is not as I understood it, he would say, but I will do as you tell me. He would then rehearse word by word and gesture by gesture with the inflections and movements required. This got on my nerves in the most painful way and was a cruel blow dealt at the solidarity of my artistic pride. I often took this poor Tyan aside and tried to urge him on to rebellion, but it was all in vain. He was tall and his arms were too long and his eyes tired. His nose was weary with having grown too long and it sank over his lips with heart-rending dejection. His forehead was covered with thick hair and his chin seemed to be running away in a hurry from this ill-built face. A great kindliness was diffused all over his being and this kindliness was just himself. Everyone was therefore infinitely fond of him. The 26th of January, 1872, was an artistic fete for the Odeon. The two Paris of First Nights and All Youthful Paris were to meet in the large, solemn, dusty theater. Ah, what a splendid, stirring performance it was. What a triumph for Geoffrey, pale, sinister, and severe-looking in his black costume as Don Sayust. Melenge rather disappointed the public as Don César de Bazan, and the public was in the wrong. The role of Don César de Bazan is a treacherously good role, which always tempts artists by the brilliancy of the first act. But the fourth act, which belongs entirely to him, is distressingly heavy and useless. It might be taken out of the piece, just like a periwinkle out of its shell, and the piece would be none the less clear and complete. This 26th of January rent asunder, though, for me, the thin veil which still made my future hazy, and I felt that I was destined for celebrity. Until that day, I had remained the student's little fairy. I became then the elect of the public. Breathless, dazed, and yet delighted by my success, I did not know to whom to reply in the ever-changing stream of men and women admirers. All at once, I saw the crowd separating and forming two lines, and I caught a glimpse of Victor Hugo and Girardin coming toward me. In a second, all the stupid ideas I had had about this immense genius flashed across me. I remembered my first interview when I had been stiff and barely polite to this kind, indulgent man. At that moment, when all my life was opening its wings, I should have liked to cry out to him my repentance and to tell him of my devout gratitude. Before I could speak, though, he was down on his knee, and raising my two hands to his lips, he murmured, Thank you, thank you. And so it was he who said thank you. He, the great Victor Hugo, whose mind was so fine, whose universal genius filled the world. He, whose generous hands flung pardons like gems to all his insulters. Ah, how small I felt, how ashamed and yet how happy. He then rose, shook the hands that were held out to him, finding for everyone the right word. He was so handsome that night, with his wide forehead which seemed to retain the light, his thick silvery fleece of hair and his laughing luminous eyes. Not daring to fling myself in Victor Hugo's arms, I fell into Girardin's, the sure friend of my first steps, and burst into tears. He took me aside in my dressing room. You must not let yourself be intoxicated with this great success now, he said. There must be no more risky jumps, now that you are crowned with laurels. You will have to be more yielding, more docile, more sociable. I feel that I shall never be yielding nor docile, my friend, I answered, looking at him. I will try to be more sociable, but that is all I can promise. As to my crown, I assure you that in spite of my risky jumps, and I feel that I shall always be making jumps, the crown will not shake off. Paul Maurice, who had come up to me, overheard this conversation and reminded me of it on the evening of the first performance of Angelo at the Sarah Bernhardt Theatre on the 7th of February, 1905. End of section 16.
sex 